Section One of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Philosophy of Furniture by Edgar Allan Poe. In the internal decoration, if not in the external architecture of their residences, the English are supreme. The Italians have but little sentiment beyond marbles and colors. In France, meliora probant de tiriora secuntur, the people are too much a race of gadabouts to maintain those household priorities of which, indeed, they have a delicate appreciation, or at least the elements of a proper sense. The Chinese and most of the Eastern races have a warm but inappropriate fancy. The Scotch are poor decorists. The Dutch have, perhaps, an indeterminate idea that a curtain is not a cabbage. In Spain they are all curtains, a nation of hangmen. The Russians do not furnish. The Hottentots and Kickapoos are very well, in their way. The Yankees alone are preposterous. How this happens it is not difficult to see. We have no aristocracy of blood, and having therefore as a natural and indeed as an inevitable thing fashioned for ourselves an aristocracy of dollars, the display of wealth has here to take the place and perform the office of the heraldic display in monarchical countries, by a transition readily understood, and which might have been as readily foreseen we have been brought to merge in simple show our notions of taste itself to speak less abstractly in england for example no mere parade of costly appurtenances would be so likely as with us to create an impression of the beautiful in respect to the appurtenances themselves or of taste as regards the proprietor this for the reason first that wealth is not in england the loftiest object of ambition as constituting a nobility and secondly that there the true nobility of blood confining itself within the strict limits of legitimate taste rather avoids than affects that mere costliness in which a parvenu rivalry may at any time be successfully attempted the people will imitate the nobles and the result is a thorough diffusion of the proper feeling but in america the coins current being the sole arms of the aristocracy their display may be said in general to be the sole means of the aristocratic distinction and the populace looking always upward for models are insensibly led to confound the two entirely separate ideas of magnificence and beauty in short the cost of an article of furniture has at length come to be with us nearly the sole test of its merit in a decorative point of view and this test once established has led the way to many analogous errors readily traceable to the one primitive folly there could be nothing more directly offensive to the eye of an artist than the interior of what is termed in the united states that is to say in appalachia a well-furnished apartment its most usual defect is a want of keeping we speak of the keeping of a room as we would of the keeping of a picture, for both the picture and the room are amenable to those undeviating principles which regulate all varieties of art, and very nearly the same laws by which we decide on the higher merits of a painting suffice for decision on the adjustment of a chamber. A want of keeping is observable sometimes in the character of the several pieces of furniture but generally in their colors or modes of adaptation to use very often the eye is offended by their inartistic arrangement straight lines are too prevalent too uninterruptedly continued or clumsily interrupted at right angles if curved lines occur they are repeated into unpleasant uniformity by undue precision the appearance of many a fine apartment is utterly spoiled curtains are rarely well disposed or well chosen in respect to other decorations with formal furniture curtains are out of place and an extensive volume of drapery of any kind is under any circumstance irreconcilable with good taste 
the proper quantum as well as the proper adjustment depending upon the character of the general effect carpets are better understood of late than of ancient days but we still very frequently err in their patterns and colors the soul of the apartment is the carpet from it are deduced not only the hues but the forms of all objects incumbent a judge at common law may be an ordinary man a good judge of a carpet must be a genius yet we have heard discussing of carpets with the air d'un mouton qui rêve fellows who should not and who could not be entrusted with the management of their own moustaches every one knows that a large floor may have a covering of large figures and that a small one must have a covering of small yet this is not all the knowledge in the world as regards texture the saxony is alone admissible brussels is the preter pluperfect tense of fashion and turkey is taste in its dying agonies touching pattern the carpet should not be bedizened out like a ricari indian all red chalk yellow ochre and cock's feathers in brief distinct grounds and vivid circular or cycloid figures of no meaning are here median laws the abomination of flowers or representations of well-known objects of any kind should not be endured within the limits of christendom indeed whether on carpets or curtains or tapestry or ottoman coverings all upholstery of this nature should be rigidly arabesque as for those antique floor-cloths still occasionally seen in the dwellings of the rabble cloths of huge sprawling and radiating devices stripe interspersed and glorious with all hues among which no ground is intelligible these are but the wicked invention of a race of time-servers and money-lovers children of baal and worshippers of mammon bentham's who to spare thought and economize fancy first cruelly invented the kaleidoscope and then established joint stock companies to twirl it by steam glare is a leading error in the philosophy of american household decoration an error easily recognized as deduced from the perversion of taste just specified we are violently enamoured of gas and of glass the former is totally inadmissible within doors its harsh and unsteady light offends no one having both brains and eyes will use it a mild or what artists term a cool light with its consequent warm shadows will do wonders for even an ill-furnished apartment never was a more lovely thought than that of the astral lamp we mean of course the astral lamp proper the lamp of argon with its original plain ground-glass shade and its tempered and uniform moonlight rays the cut glass shade is a weak invention of the enemy the eagerness with which we have adopted it partly on account of its flashiness but principally on account of its greater rest is a good commentary on the proposition with which we began it is not too much to say that the deliberate employer of a cut glass shade is either radically deficient in taste or blindly subservient to the caprices of fashion the light proceeding from one of these gaudy abominations is unequal broken and painful it alone is sufficient to mar a world of good effect in the furniture subjected to its influence female loveliness in especial is more than one half disenchanted beneath its evil eye in the matter of glass generally we proceed upon false principles its leading feature is glitter and in that one word how much of all that is detestable do we express flickering unquiet lights are sometimes pleasing to children and idiots always so but in the establishment of a room they should be scrupulously avoided in truth even strong steady lights are inadmissible the huge and unmeaning glass chandeliers prism cut glass lighted and without shade which dangle on our most fashionable drawing-rooms may be cited as the quintessence of all that is false in taste or preposterous in folly the rage for glitter because its idea has become as we before observed confounded with that of magnificence in the abstract has led us also to the exaggerated employment of mirrors 
we line our dwellings with great British plates, and then imagine we have done a fine thing. Now, the slightest thought will be sufficient to convince any one who has an eye at all of the ill effect of numerous looking-glasses, and especially of large ones. Regarded apart from its reflection, the mirror represents a continuous, flat, colourless, unrelieved surface, a thing always and obviously unpleasant. Considered as a reflector, it is potent in producing a monstrous and odious uniformity, and the evil is here aggravated, not in a merely direct proportion with the augmentation of its sources, but in a ratio constantly increasing. In fact, a room with four or five mirrors arranged at random is, for all purposes of artistic show, a room of no shape at all. If we add to this evil the attendant glitter upon glitter, we have a perfect farrago of discordant and displeasing effects. The veriest bumpkin, on entering an apartment so bedizened, would be instantly aware of something wrong, although he might be altogether unable to assign a cause for his dissatisfaction. But let the same person be led into a room tastefully furnished, and he would be startled into an exclamation of pleasure and surprise. It is an evil growing out of our republican institutions that here a man of large purse has usually a very little soul which he keeps in it. The corruption of taste is a portion or a pendant of the dollar manufacture. As we grow rich, our ideas grow rusty. It is, therefore, not among our aristocracy that we must look, if at all in Appalachia, for the spirituality of a British boudoir. But we have seen apartments in the tenure of Americans of modern, possibly modest or moderate, means, which in negative merit at least, might vie with any of the ormolude cabinets of our friends across the water. Even now there is present to our mind's eye a small and not ostentatious chamber with whose decorations no fault can be found. The proprietor lies asleep on a sofa, the weather is cool, the time is near midnight. We will make a sketch of the room during his slumber. It is oblong, some thirty feet in length and twenty-five in breadth, a shape affording the best ordinary opportunities for the adjustment of furniture. It has but one door, by no means a wide one, which is at one end of the parallelogram, and but two windows, which are at the other. These latter are large, reaching down to the floor, have deep recesses, and open on an Italian veranda. Their panes are of a crimson-tinted glass, set in rosewood framings, more massive than usual. They are curtained within the recess by a thick silver tissue adapted to the shape of the window and hanging loosely in small volumes. Without the recess are curtains of an exceedingly rich crimson silk, fringed with a deep network of gold and lined with silver tissue, which is the material of the exterior blind. There are no cornices, but the folds of the whole fabric, which are sharp rather than massive and have an airy appearance, issue from beneath a broad entablature of rich gilt-work, which encircles the room at the junction of the ceiling and walls. The drapery is thrown open, also, or closed, by means of a thick rope of gold loosely enveloping it, and resolving itself readily into a knot. No pins or other such devices are apparent. The colours of the curtains and their fringe, the tints of crimson and gold, appear everywhere in profusion and determine the character of the room. The carpet, of Saxony material, is quite half an inch thick and is of the same crimson ground, relieved simply by the appearance of a gold cord, like that festooning the curtains, slightly relieved above the surface of the ground, and thrown upon it in such a manner as to form a succession of short irregular curves, one occasionally overlaying the other. The walls are prepared with a glossy paper of a silver-gray tint, spotted with small arabesque devices of a fainter hue of the prevalent crimson. Many paintings relieve the expanse of paper. These are chiefly landscapes of an imaginative cast, such as the fairy grottoes of Stanfield or the lake of the dismal swamp of Chapman. 
there are nevertheless three or four female heads of an ethereal beauty portraits in the manner of sully the tone of each picture is warm but dark there are no brilliant effects repose speaks in all not one is of a small size diminutive paintings give that spotty look to a room which is the blemish of so many a fine work of art overtouched the frames are broad but not deep and richly carved without being dulled or filigreed they have the whole lustre of burnished gold they lie flat on the walls and do not hang off the cords the designs themselves are often seen to better advantage in this latter position but the general appearance of the chamber is injured but one mirror and this not a very large one is visible in shape it is nearly circular and it is hung so that a reflection of the person can be obtained from it in none of the ordinary sitting places of the room two large low sofas of rosewood and crimson silk gold flowered form the only seats with the exception of two light conversation chairs also of rosewood there is a pianoforte rosewood also without cover and thrown open an octagonal table formed altogether of the richest gold-threaded marble is placed near one of the sofas this is also without cover the drapery of the curtains have been thought sufficient four large and gorgeous sevres vases in which bloom a profusion of sweet and vivid flowers occupy the slightly rounded angles of the room a tall candelabrum bearing a small antique lamp with highly perfumed oil is standing near the head of my sleeping friend some light and graceful hanging shelves with golden edges and crimson silk cords with gold tassels sustain two or three hundred magnificently bound books beyond these things there is no furniture if we except an argon lamp with a plain crimson-tinted ground-glass shade which hangs from the lofty vaulted ceiling by a single slender gold chain and throws a tranquil but magical radiance over all end of section one section two of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson A Tale of Jerusalem by Edgar Allan Poe Intensos rigidarn in frontern ascendere canos passus erat. Lucan de Catone Abrisly bore. Let us hurry to the walls, said Abel Pittam to Buzzy Ben Levy and Simeon the Pharisee, on the tenth day of the month Tammuz, in the year of the world three thousand nine hundred and forty one. Let us hasten to the ramparts adjoining the gate of Benjamin, which is the city of David and overlooking the camp of the uncircumcised for it is the last hour of the fourth watch being sunrise and the idolaters in fulfilment of the promise of pompey should be awaiting us with the lambs for the sacrifices simeon abel pittam and Duzzy ben levy were the gizbarim or sub-collectors of the offering in the holy city of jerusalem verily replied the pharisee let us hasten for this generosity in the heathen is unwanted and fickle-mindedness has ever been an attribute of the worshippers of baal that they are fickle-minded and treacherous is as true as the pentateuch said buzzy ben levy but that is only toward the people of adonai when was it ever known that the ammonites proved wanting in their own interests methinks it is no great stretch of generosity to allow us lambs for the altar of the lord receiving in lieu thereof thirty silver shekels per head thou forgettest however ben levy replied abel pittam 
that the roman pompey who is now impiously besieging the city of the most high has no assurity that we apply not the lambs thus purchased for the altar to the sustenance of the body rather than of the spirit now by the five corners of my beard shouted the pharisee who belonged to the sect called the dashers that little knot of saints whose manner of dashing and lacerating the feet against the pavement was long a thorn and a reproach to less zealous devotees a stumbling block to less gifted perambulators by the five corners of that beard which as a priest i am forbidden to shave have we lived to see the day when a blaspheming and idolatrous upstart of rome shall accuse us of appropriating to the appetites of the flesh the most holy and consecrated elements who have we lived to see the day when let us not question the motives of the philistine interrupted abel pittam for to-day we profit for the first time by his avarice or by his generosity but rather let us hurry to the ramparts lest offerings should be wanting for that altar whose fire the rains of heaven can not extinguish and whose pillars of smoke no tempest can turn aside that part of the city to which our worthy gizbarum now hastened and which bore the name of its architect king david was esteemed the most strongly fortified district of jerusalem being situated upon the steep and lofty hill of zion here a broad deep circumvallatory trench hewn from the solid rock was defended by a wall of great strength erected upon its inner edge this wall was adorned at regular interspaces by square towers of white marble the lowest sixty and the highest one hundred and twenty cubits in height but in the vicinity of the gate of benjamin the wall arose by no means from the margin of the fossa on the contrary between the level of the ditch and the basement of the rampart sprang up a perpendicular cliff of two hundred and fifty cubits forming part of the precipitous mount moriah so that when simeon and his associates arrived on the summit of the tower called adonai bezek the loftiest of all the turrets round about jerusalem and the usual place of conference with the besieging army they looked down upon the camp of the enemy from an eminence excelling by many feet that of the pyramid of cheops and by several that of the temple of belus verily sighed the pharisee as he peered dizzily over the precipice the uncircumcised are as the sands of the seashore as the locusts in the wilderness the valley of the king hath become the valley of adamon and yet added ben levy thou canst not point me out a philistine no not one from aleph to tau from the wilderness to the battlements who seemeth any bigger than the letter jot lower away the basket with the shekels of silver here shouted a roman soldier in a hoarse rough voice which appeared to issue from the regions of pluto lower away the basket with the accursed coin which it has broken the jaw of a noble roman to pronounce it is thus you evince your gratitude to our master pompeius who in his condescension has thought fit to listen to your idolatrous importunities the god phoebus who is a true god has been charioted for an hour and were you not to be on the ramparts by sunrise Adepo, do you think that we the conquerors of the world have nothing better to do than stand waiting by the walls of every kennel to traffic with the dogs of the earth lower away i say and see that your trumpery be bright in color and just in weight elohim ejaculated the pharisee as the discordant tones of the centurion rattled up the crags of the precipice and fainted away against the temple elohim who is the god phoebus whom doth the blasphemer invoke thou buzz ben levy who art read in the laws of the gentiles and hast sojourned among them who babble with the teraphim is it negro of whom the idolater speaketh or ashima or nibhaz or tartak or adramalek 
or Anamalek, or Sekathmineth, or Dagon, or Belial, or Baal Perith, or Baal Peor, or Beelzebub. Verily it is neither, but beware how thou lettest the rope slip too rapidly through thy fingers, for should the wicker work chance to hang on the projections of yonder crag, there will be a woeful outpouring of the holy things of the sanctuary. By the assistance of some rudely constructed machinery, the heavily laden basket was now carefully lowered down among the multitude, and from the giddy pinnacle the Romans were seen gathering confusedly round it. But owing to the vast height and the prevalence of a fog, no distinct view of their operations could be obtained. Half an hour had already elapsed. "'We shall be too late,' sighed the Pharisee, as at the expiration of this period he looked over into the abyss. "'We shall be too late. We shall be turned off by the office of Catolum.' "'No more,' responded Abel Pittam. "'No more shall we feast upon the fat of the land. No longer shall our beards be odorous with frankincense.' our loins girded up with the fine linen from the temple. Rascal! swore Ben Levy. Rascal, do they mean to defraud us of the purchase money? Or, holy Moses, are they weighing the shekels of the tabernacle? They have given the signal at last, cried the Pharisee. They have given the signal at last. Pull away, Babel Pittam, and thou, buzzy Ben Levy, pull away! For verily the Philistines have either still hold upon the basket, or the Lord hath softened their hearts to place therein a beast of good weight. And the Gizbarim pulled away, while their burden swung heavily upward through the still increasing mist. Whoosho he! As at the conclusion of an hour some object at the extremity of the rope became indistinctly visible. Whoosho he! was the exclamation which burst from the lips of Ben Levy. Busho hey, for shame! It is a ram from the thickets of Engedi, and as rugged as the valley of Jehoshaphat. It is a firstling of the flock, said Abel Pittam. I know him by the bleating of his lips and the innocent folding of his limbs. His eyes are more beautiful than the jewels of pectoral, and his flesh is like the honey of Hebron. It is a fatted calf from the pastures of Bashan, said the Pharisee. The heathen have dealt wonderfully with us. Let us raise up our voices in a psalm. Let us give thanks on the shawn and on the psaltery, on the harp and on the hugab and the cithern and the sackbut. It was not until the basket had arrived within a few feet of the gizbarim that a low grunt betrayed to their perception a hog of no common size. Now, El Imanu, slowly and with upturned eyes ejaculated the trio, as letting go their hold, the emancipated porker tumbled headlong among the Philistines. El Imanu, God be with us, it is the unutterable flesh. End of section two. Section 3 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. The Sphinx by Edgar Allan Poe. During the dread reign of the cholera in New York, I had accepted the invitation of a relative to spend a fortnight with him in the retirement of his cottage orne on the banks of the Hudson. We had here around us all the ordinary means of summer amusement, and what with rambling in the woods, sketching, boating, fishing, bathing, music, and books, we should have passed the time pleasantly enough, but for the fearful intelligence which reached us every morning from the populous city. Not a day elapsed which did not bring us news of the decease of some acquaintance. 
then as the fatality increased we learned to expect daily the loss of some friend at length we trembled at the approach of every messenger the very air from the south seemed to us redolent of death that palsying thought indeed took entire possession of my soul i could neither speak think nor dream of anything else my host was of a less excitable temperament and although greatly depressed in spirits exerted himself to sustain my own his richly philosophical intellect was not at any time affected by unrealities to the substances of terror he was sufficiently alive but of its shadows he had no apprehension his endeavours to arouse me from the condition of abnormal gloom into which i had fallen were frustrated in great measure by certain volumes which i found in his library these were of a character to force into germination whatever seeds of hereditary superstition lay latent in my bosom i had been reading these books without his knowledge and thus he was often at a loss to account for the forcible impressions which had been made upon my fancy a favourite topic with me was the popular belief in omens a belief which at this one epoch of my life i was almost seriously disposed to defend on this subject we had long and animated discussions he maintaining the utter groundlessness of faith in such matters i contending that a popular sentiment arising with absolute spontaneity that is to say without apparent traces of suggestion had in itself the unmistakable elements of truth and was entitled to as much respect as that intuition which is the idiosyncrasy of the individual man of genius the fact is that soon after my arrival at the cottage there had occurred to myself an incident so entirely inexplicable and which had in it so much of the portentous character that i might well have been excused for regarding it as an omen it appalled and at the same time so confounded and bewildered me that many days elapsed before i could make up my mind to communicate the circumstances to my friend near the close of an exceedingly warm day i was sitting book in hand at an open window commanding through a long vista of the river banks a view of a distant hill the face of which nearest my position had been denuded by what is termed a landslide of the principal portion of its trees my thoughts had been long wandering from the volume before me to the gloom and desolation of the neighbouring city uplifting my eyes from the page they fell upon the naked face of the hill and upon an object upon some living monster of hideous conformation which very rapidly made its way from the summit to the bottom disappearing finally in the dense forest below as this creature first came in sight i doubted my own sanity or at least the evidence of my own eyes and many minutes passed before i succeeded in convincing myself that i was neither mad nor in a dream yet when i described the monster which i distinctly saw and calmly surveyed through the whole period of its progress my readers i fear will feel more difficulty in being convinced of these points than even i did myself estimating the size of the creature by comparison with the diameter of the large trees near which it passed the few giants of the forest which had escaped the fury of the landslide i concluded it to be far larger than any ship of the line in existence i say ship of the line because the shape of the monster suggested the idea the hull of one of our seventy-four might convey a very tolerable conception of the general outline the mouth of the animal was situated at the extremity of a proboscis and about as thick as the body of an ordinary elephant near the root of this trunk was an immense quantity of black shaggy hair more than could have been supplied by the coats of a score of buffaloes and projecting from this hair downwardly and laterally sprang two gleaming tusks not unlike those of the wild boar but of infinitely greater dimensions extending forward parallel with the proboscis and on each side of it was a gigantic staff thirty or forty feet in length formed seemingly of pure crystal and in shape of a perfect prism it reflected in the most gorgeous manner the rays of the declining sun 
the trunk was fashioned like a wedge with the apex to the earth from it there were outspread two pairs of wings each wing nearly one hundred yards in length one pair being placed above the other and all thickly covered with metal scales each scale apparently some ten or twelve feet in diameter i observed that the upper and lower tiers of wings were connected by a strong chain but the chief peculiarity of this horrible thing was the representation of a death's head which covered nearly the whole surface of its breast and which was as accurately traced in glaring white upon the dark ground of the body as if it had been there carefully designed by an artist while i regarded the terrific animal and more especially the appearance on its breast with a feeling of horror and awe with a sentiment of forthcoming evil which i found it impossible to quell by any effort of the reason i perceived the huge jaws at the extremity of the proboscis suddenly expand themselves and from there proceeded a sound so loud and so expressive of woe that it struck upon my nerves like a knell and as the monster disappeared at the foot of the hill i fell at once fainting to the floor upon recovering my first impulse of course was to inform my friend of what i had seen and heard and i can scarcely explain what feeling of repugnance it was which in the end operated to prevent me at length one evening some three or four days after the occurrence we were sitting together in the room in which i had seen the apparition i occupying the same seat at the same window and he lounging on a sofa near at hand the association of the place and time impelled me to give him an account of the phenomenon he heard me to the end at first laughed heartily and then lapsed into an excessively grave demeanour as if my insanity was a thing beyond suspicion at this instant i again had a distinct view of the monster to which with a shout of absolute terror i now directed his attention he looked eagerly but maintained that he saw nothing although i designated minutely the course of the creature as it made its way down the naked face of the hill i was now immeasurably alarmed for i considered the vision either as an omen of my death or worse as the forerunner of an attack of mania i threw myself passionately back in my chair and for some moments buried my face in my hands when i uncovered my eyes the apparition was no longer apparent my host however had in some degree resumed the calmness of his demeanour and questioned me very vigorously in respect to the conformation of the visionary creature when i had fully satisfied him on this head he sighed deeply as if relieved of some intolerable burden and went on to talk with what i thought a cruel calmness of various points of speculative philosophy which had heretofore formed subject of discussion between us i remember his insisting very especially among other things upon the idea that the principal source of error in all human investigations lay in the liability of the understanding to underrate or to overrate the importance of an object through mere misadmeasurement of its propinquity to estimate properly for example he said the influence to be exercised on mankind at large by the thorough diffusion of democracy the distance of the epoch at which such diffusion may possibly be accomplished should not fail to form an item in the estimate yet can you tell me one writer on the subject of government who has ever thought this particular branch of the subject worthy of discussion at all he here paused for a moment stepped to a bookcase and brought forth one of the ordinary synopses of natural history requesting me then to exchange seats with him that he might the better distinguish the fine print of the volume he took my armchair at the window and opening the book resumed his discourse very much in the same tone as before but for exceeding minuteness he said in describing the monster i might never have had it in my power to demonstrate to you what it was in the first place let me read to you a schoolboy account of the genus sphinx of the family of the crepuscularia of the order of lepidoptera 
of the class of insecta or insects the account runs thus four membranous wings covered with little coloured scales of metallic appearance mouth forming a rolled proboscis produced by an elongation of the jaws upon the sides of which are found the rudiments of mandibles and downy palpi the inferior wings retained to the superior by a stiff hair antennae in the form of an elongated club prismatic abdomen pointed abdomen pointed the death's headed sphinx has occasioned much terror among the vulgar at times by the melancholy kind of cry which it utters and the insignia of death which it wears upon its corslet here he closed the book and leaned forward in the chair placing himself accurately in the position which i had occupied at the moment of beholding the monster ah here it is he presently exclaimed it is reascending the face of the hill and a very remarkable-looking creature i admit it to be still it is by no means so large or so distant as you imagined it for the fact is that as it wriggles its way up this thread which some spider has wrought along the window sash i find it to be about the sixteenth of an inch in its extreme length and also about sixteenth of an inch distant from the pupil of my eye end of section three section four of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Hop Frog by Edgar Allan Poe I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking. To tell a good story of the joke kind, and to tell it well, was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, too, in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking, or whether there is something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine. But certain it is that a lean joker is a rara avis in terrace about the refinements or as he called them the ghost of wit the king troubled himself very little he had an especial admiration for breadth in a jest and would often put up with length for the sake of it over niceties wearied him he would have preferred rabelais gargantua to the zadig of voltaire and upon the whole practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones at the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools, who wore motley with caps and bells, and who were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice, in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool, the fact is, he required something in the way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, uh, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact that his being also a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarfs were as common in court in those days as fools, and Many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days, days are rather longer at court than elsewhere, without both a jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But, as I have already observed, your jesters, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, are fat, round, and unwieldy, so that it was no small source of self-congratulation with our king that in Hop Frog, this was the fool's name, he possessed a triplicate treasure in one person. I believe the name Hopfrog was not given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, 
but it was conferred upon him by general consent of the several ministers on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hop Frog could only get along by a sort of interjectional gait, something between a leap and a wriggle, a movement that afforded illimitable amusement and, of course, consolation to the king, for, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and a constitutional swelling of the head, the king by his whole court was accounted a capital figure. But although Hop Frog, through the distortion of his legs, could move only with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, the prodigious muscular power which nature seems to have bestowed upon his arms, by way of compensation for deficiency in the lower limbs, enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterity where trees or ropes were in question, or anything else to climb. At such exercises he certainly much more resembled a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. I am not able to say with precision from what country Hop Frog originally came. It was from some barbarous region, however, that no person ever heard of, a vast distance from the court of our king. Hop Frog and a young girl, very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvelous dancer, had been forcibly carried off from their respective homes in adjoining provinces and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever-victorious generals. Under these circumstances, it is not to be wondered at that a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon become sworn friends, and Hop Frog, who, although he made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, had it not in his power to render Trippetta many services. But she, on account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted. So she possessed much influence and never failed to use it whenever she could for the benefit of Hop Frog. On some grand state occasion, I forgot what, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever a masquerade or anything of that kind occurred at our court, then the talents both of Hop Frog and Trippetta were sure to be called into play. Hop Frog, in special, was so inventive in the way of getting up pageants, suggesting novel characters, and arranging costumes for masked balls, that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed for the fete had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trippetta's eye with every kind of device which could possibly give Eclat to a masquerade. The whole court was in a fever of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might well be supposed that everybody had come to a decision on such points. Many had made up their minds, as to what roles they should assume, a week or even a month in advance. And in fact, there was not a particle of indecision anywhere except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. Why they hesitated, I never could tell, unless they did it by way of a joke. More probably, they found it difficult, on account of being so fat, to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and as a last resort, they sent for Trippetta and Hop Frog. When the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven members of his cabinet council. But the monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hop Frog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness. And madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes and took pleasure in forcing Hop Frog to drink and, as the king called it, to be merry. Come here, Hop Frog, he said as the jester and his friend entered the room. Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends. Here Hop Frog sighed, and then let us have the benefit of your invention. We want characters. Characters, man. Something novel out of the way. We are wearied with this everlasting sameness. Come drink. The wine will brighten your wits. Hop Frog endeavored, as usual, to get up a jest in reply to these advances from the king, but oh, the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, 
and the command to drink to his absent friends forced the tears to his eyes. Many large bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it humbly from the hand of the tyrant. Ah, ha, 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 roared the latter as the dwarfs reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do. Why, your eyes are shining already. Poor fellow, his large eyes gleamed rather than shone, for the effect of wine on his excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked round upon the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. "'And now to business,' said the prime minister, a very fat man. "'Yes,' said the king. "'Come, lend us your assistance. Characters, my fine fellow, we stand in need of characters.' All of us. <laughs> and as this was seriously meant for a joke, his laugh was chorused by the seven. Hopfrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. Come, come, said the king impatiently. Have you nothing to suggest? I am endeavoring to think of something novel replied the dwarf abstractedly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine. Endeavoring, cried the tyrant fiercely. What do you mean by that? Ah, I perceive you are sulky and want more wine. Here, drink this. And he poured out another goblet full and offered it to the cripple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, shouted the monster, or by the fiends. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtier smirked. Trippetta, pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat, and falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments, in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss what to do or say, how most becomingly to express his indignation. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up the best she could and, not daring even to sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. There was a dead silence for about half a minute, during which the falling of a leaf or of a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted grating sound which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. What? What? What are you making that noise for? demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered in a great measure from his intoxication and looked fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, I, I, how could it have been me? The sound appeared to come from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was the parrot at the window whetting his bill upon his cage wires. "'True,' replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestion. "'But on the honor of a knight, I could have sworn that it was the gritting of this vagabond's teeth.' Hereupon the dwarf laughed. The king was too confirmed a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no very perceptible ill effect, Hopfrog entered at once, and with spirit into the plans for the masquerade. I cannot tell what was the association of idea, observed he very tranquilly, 
as if he had never tasted wine in his life. But just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion, one of my own country frolics often enacted among us at our masquerades. But here it will be new altogether. Unfortunately, however, it requires a company of eight persons and... Here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight chained orangutans, and it really is excellent sport if well enacted. We will enact it, remarked the king, drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids. The beauty of the game, continued Hop Frog, lies in the fright it occasions among the women. Ha <laughs> ha! Capital! roared in course the monarch and his ministry. I will equip you as orangutans, proceeded the dwarf. Leave all that to me. The resemblance shall be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts, and of course they will be as much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite, exclaimed the king. Hop frog, I will make a man of you. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. You are supposed to have escaped en masse from your keepers. Your majesty cannot conceive the effect produced at a masquerade by eight chained orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in execution the scheme of Hop Frog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world and as the imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stockinette shirts and drawers. They were then saturated with tar. At this stage of the process, some of the party suggested feathers. <laughs> But the suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the eight by ocular demonstration that the hair of such a brute as the orangutan was much more efficiently represented by flu. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First it was passed about the waist of the king and tied, then about another of the party, and also tied then about all, successively, in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete and the party stood as far apart from each other as possible, they formed a circle. And to make all things appear natural, Hop Frog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters at right angles across the circle, after the fashion adopted at the present day by those who capture chimpanzees or other large apes in Borneo. The grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty and receiving the light of the sun only through a single window at top. At night, the season for which the apartment was especially designed, it was illuminated principally by a large chandelier, depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered or elevated by means of a counterbalance as usual, 
but in order not to look unsightly this ladder passed outside the cupola and over the roof the arrangements of the room had been left to trippetta's superintendence but in some particulars it seems she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf and his suggestion it was that on this occasion the chandelier was removed its waxen drippings which in weather so warm it was quite impossible to prevent would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses of the guests who on account of the crowded state of the saloon could not all be expected to keep from out its centre that is to say from under the chandelier additional sconces were set in various parts of the hall out of the way and a flambeau emitting sweet odour was placed in the right hand of each of the carides that stood against the wall some fifty or sixty altogether the eight orangutans taking hop frogs advice waited patiently until midnight when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders before making their appearance no sooner had the clock ceased striking however than they rushed or rather rolled in altogether for the impediments of their change caused most of the party to fall and all to stumble as they entered the excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious and filled the heart of the king with glee as had been anticipated there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts of some kind in reality if not precisely orangutans many of the women swooned with affright and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon his party might soon have expiated their frolic in their blood as it was a general rush was made for the doors but the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon his entrance and at the dwarf's suggestion the keys had been deposited with him while the tumult was at its height and each masquerader attentive only to his own safety for in fact there was much real danger from the pressure of the excited crowd the chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung and which had been drawn up on its removal might have been seen very gradually to descend until its hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor soon after this the king and his seven friends having reeled about the hall in all directions found themselves at length in its centre and of course in immediate contact with the chain while they were thus situated the dwarf who had followed noiselessly at their heels inciting them to keep up the commotion took hold of their own chain at the intersection of the two portions which crossed the circle diametrically and at right angles here with the rapidity of thought he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend and in an instant by some unseen agency the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach and as an inevitable consequence to drag the orangutans together in close connection and face to face the masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm and beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry set up a loud shout of laughter at the predicament of the apes leave them to me now screamed hop frog his shrill voice making itself easily heard through all the din leave them to me i fancy i know them if i can only get a good look at them i can tell who they are here scrambling over the heads of the crowd he managed to get to the wall when seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides he returned as he went to the centre of the room leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head and thence clambered a few feet up the chain holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans and still screaming i shall soon find out who they are and now while the whole assembly the apes included were convulsed with laughter the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle when the chain flew violently up for about thirty feet dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans and leaving them suspended in mid-air between the skylight and the floor hop frog clinging to the chain as it rose still maintained his relative position 
in respect to the eight maskers and still as if nothing were the matter continued to thrust his torch down toward them as though endeavoring to discover who they were so thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent that a dead silence of about a minute's duration ensued it was broken by just such a low harsh grating sound as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counsellors when the former threw the wine in the face of trippetta but on the present occasion there could be no question as to whence the sound issued it came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf who ground them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth and glared with an expression of maniacal rage into the upturned countenance of the king and his seven companions aha said at length the infuriated jester aha i begin to see who these people are now here pretending to scrutinize the king more closely he held the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame in less than half a minute the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below horror-stricken and without the power to render them the slightest assistance at length the flame suddenly increasing in virulence forced the jester to climb higher up the chain to be out of their reach and as he made this movement the crowd again sank for a brief instant into silence the dwarf seized the opportunity and once more spoke i see distinctly he said what manner of people these maskers are they are a great king and his seven privy counsellors a king who does not scruple to strike a defenceless girl and his seven counsellors who abet him in the outrage as for myself i am simply hop frog the jester and this is my last jest owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which it adhered the dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete the eight corpses swung in their chains a fetid blackened hideous an indistinguishable mass the cripple hurled his torch at them clambered leisurely to the ceiling and disappeared through the skylight it is supposed that trippetta stationed on the roof of the saloon had been the accomplice of her friend in his fiery revenge and that together they effected their escape to their own country for neither was seen again End of section 4section five of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dylan posa the man in the crowd by edgar allan poe ce grand malheur de ne pouvoir être seul la bruyere it was well said of a certain german book that a last sick lesson it does not permit itself to be read there are some secrets which do not permit themselves to be told men die nightly in their beds wringing the hands of ghostly confessors and looking them piteously in the eyes die with despair of heart and convulsion of throat on account of the hideousness of mysteries which will not suffer themselves to be revealed now and then alas the conscience of man takes up a burthen so heavy in horror that it can be thrown down only into the grave and thus the essence of all crime is undivulged not long ago about the closing in of an evening in autumn i sat at the large bow window of the d coffee house in london for some months I had been ill in health, but was now convalescent and, with returning strength, 
found myself in one of those happy moods which are so precisely the converse of ennui. Moods of the keenest appetency, when the film from the mental vision departs, and the intellect, electrified, surpasses as greatly its everyday condition, as does the vivid yet candid reason of Leibniz, the mad and flimsy rhetoric of Gorgias. Merely to breathe was enjoyment, and I derived positive pleasure even from many of the legitimate sources of pain. I felt a calm but inquisitive interest in every thing. With a cigar in my mouth and a newspaper in my lap, I had been amusing myself for the greater part of the afternoon, now in poring over advertisements, now in observing the promiscuous company in the room, and now in peering through the smoky panes into the street. This latter is one of the principal thoroughfares of the city, and had been very much crowded during the whole day. But, as the darkness came on, the throng momently increased, and by the time the lamps were well lighted, two dense and continuous tides of population were rushing past the door. At this particular period of the evening, I had never before been in a similar situation, and the tumultuous sea of human heads filled me, therefore, with a delicious novelty of emotion. I gave up at length all care of things within the hotel, and became absorbed in contemplation of the scene without. At first, my observations took an abstract and generalizing turn. I looked at the passengers in masses, and thought of them in their aggregate relations. Soon, however, I descended to details, and regarded with minute interest the innumerable varieties of figure, dress, air, gait, visage, and expression of countenance. By far the greater number of those who went by had a satisfied business-like demeanor, and seemed to be thinking only of making their way through the press. Their brows were knit, and their eyes rolled quickly. When pushed against by fellow wayfarers, they evinced no symptom of impatience, but adjusted their clothes and hurried on. Others, still a numerous class, were restless in their movements, had flushed faces, and talked and gesticulated to themselves, as if feeling in solitude on account of the very denseness of the company around. When impeded in their progress, these people suddenly ceased muttering, but redoubled their gesticulations, and awaited, with an absent and overdone smile upon the lips, the course of the persons impeding them. If jostled, they bowed profusely to the jostlers, and appeared overwhelmed with confusion. There was nothing very distinctive about these two large classes beyond what I have noted. Their habiliments belonged to that order which is pointedly termed the decent. They were undoubtedly noblemen, merchants, attorneys, tradesmen, stock jobbers, the eupatrids and the commonplaces of society, men of leisure and men actively engaged in affairs of their own, conducting business upon their own responsibility. They did not greatly excite my attention. The tribe of clerks was an obvious one, and here I discerned two remarkable divisions. There were the junior clerks of flash houses, young gentlemen with tight coats, bright boots, well-oiled hair, and supercilious lips. Setting aside a certain dapperness of carriage, which may be termed deskism for want of a better word, the manner of these persons seemed to me an exact facsimile of what had been the perfection of Bon Ton about twelve or eighteen months before. They wore the cast-off graces of the gentry, and this, I believe, involves the best definition of the class. The division of the upper clerks of staunch firms, or of the steady old fellows, it was not possible to mistake. These were known by their coats and pantaloons of black or brown, made to sit comfortably, with white cravats and waistcoats, broad, solid-looking shoes, and thick hose or gaiters. They had all slightly bald heads, from which the right ears, long used to pen-holding, had an odd habit of standing off on end. I observed that they always removed or settled their hats with both hands, and wore watches with short gold chains of a substantial and ancient pattern. Theirs was the affectation of respectability, if indeed there be an affectation so honorable. There were many individuals of dashing appearance, whom I easily understood as belonging to the race of swell pickpockets, with which all great cities are infested. I watched these gentry with much inquisitiveness, and found it difficult to imagine how they should ever be mistaken for gentlemen by gentlemen themselves. Their voluminousness of wristband, with an air of excessive frankness, should betray them at once. The gamblers, of whom I descried not a few, were still more easily recognizable. They wore every variety of dress, from that of the desperate thimble-rig bully, 
with velvet waistcoat, fancy neckerchief, gilt chains, and filigreed buttons, to that of the scrupulously inornate clergyman, than which nothing could be less liable to suspicion. Still all were distinguished by a certain sodden swarthiness of complexion, a filmy dimness of eye, and pallor and compression of lip. There were two other traits, moreover, by which I could always detect them, a guarded lowness of tone in conversation, and a more than ordinary extension of the thumb in a direction at right angles with the fingers. Very often, in company with these sharpers, I observed an order of men somewhat different in habits, but still birds of a kindred feather. They may be defined as the gentlemen who live by their wits. They seem to prey upon the public in two battalions, that of the dandies and that of the military men. Of the first grade, the leading features are long locks and smiles. Of the second, frogged coats and frowns. Descending in the scale of what is termed gentility, I found darker and deeper themes for speculation. I saw Jew peddlars with hawk eyes flashing from countenances whose every other feature wore only an expression of abject humility. Sturdy professional street beggars scowling upon mendicants of a better stamp whom despair alone had driven forth into the night for charity. Feeble and ghastly invalids upon whom death had placed a sure hand and who sidled and tottered through the mob looking everyone beseechingly in the face, as if in search of some chance consolation, some lost hope. Modest young girls returning from long and late labor to a cheerless home, and shrinking more tearfully than indignantly from the glances of ruffians, whose direct contact even could not be avoided. Women of the town of all kinds and of all ages, the unequivocal beauty in their prime of her womanhood, putting one in mind of the statue in Lucian, with the surface of Parian marble, and the interior filled with filth, the loathsome and utterly lost leper in rags, the wrinkled, bejeweled, and paint-begrimed beldam, making a last effort at youth, the mere child of immature form, yet from long association, an adept in the dreadful coquetries of her trade, and burning with a rabid ambition to be ranked the equal of her elders in vice, drunkards innumerable and indescribable, some in shreds and patches reeling inarticulate with bruised visage and lackluster eyes, some in whole although filthy garments with a slightly unsteady swagger, thick sensual lips and hearty-looking rubicund faces, others clothed in materials which had once been good and which even now were scrupulously well-brushed, men who walked with a more than naturally firm and springy step but whose countenances were fearfully pale, whose eyes hideously wild and red, and who clutched with quivering fingers as they strode through the crowd at every object which came within their reach, Beside these, pie-men, porters, coal, heavers, sweeps, organ-grinders, monkey-exhibitors, and ballad-mongers, those who vended with those who sang, ragged artisans, and exhausted laborers of every description, and all full of a noisy and inordinate vivacity which jarred discordantly upon the ear and gave an aching sensation to the eye. As the night deepened, so deepened to me the interest of the scene, for not only did the general character of the crowd materially alter, its gentler features retiring in the gradual withdrawal of the more orderly portion of the people, and its harsher ones coming out into bolder relief as the late hour brought forth every species of infamy from its den, but the rays of the gas lamps, feeble at first in their struggle with the dying day, had now at length gained ascendancy and threw over every thing a fitful and garish luster. All was dark yet splendid, as that ebony to which has been likened the style of Tertullian. The wild effects of the light enchained me to an examination of individual faces, and although the rapidity with which the world of light flitted before the window prevented me from casting more than a glance upon each visage, still it seemed that in my then peculiar mental state I could frequently read, even in that brief interval of a glance, the history of long years. With my brow to the glass, I was thus occupied in scrutinizing the mob, when suddenly there came into view a countenance, that of a decrepit old man, some sixty-five or seventy years of age, a countenance which at once arrested and absorbed my whole attention on account of the absolute idiosyncrasy of its expression. Anything even remotely resembling that expression I had never seen before. I well remember that my first thought, upon beholding it, was that Retzk, had he viewed it, would have greatly preferred it to his own pictorial incarnations of the fiend. As I endeavored, during the brief minute of my original survey, to form some analysis of the meaning conveyed, 
there arose confusedly and paradoxically within my mind the ideas of vast mental power, of caution, of penuriousness, of avarice, of coolness, of malice, of bloodthirstiness, of triumph, of merriment, of excessive terror, of intense, of supreme despair. I felt singularly aroused, startled, fascinated. How wild a history, I said to myself, is written within that bosom. Then came a craving desire to keep the man in view, to know more of him. Hurriedly putting on an overcoat and seizing my hat and cane, I made my way into the street and pushed through the crowd in the direction which I had seen him take, for he had already disappeared. With some little difficulty, I at length came within sight of him, approached and followed him closely, yet cautiously, so as not to attract his attention. I had now a good opportunity of examining his person. He was short in stature, very thin, and apparently very feeble. His clothes generally were filthy and ragged, but as he came, now and then within the strong glare of a lamp, I perceived that his linen, although dirty, was of beautiful texture, and my vision deceived me, or, through a rent in a closely buttoned and evidently second-handed roquelaire which enveloped him, I caught a glimpse both of a diamond and of a dagger. These observations heightened my curiosity, and I resolved to follow the stranger whithersoever he should go. It was now fully nightfall, and a thick, humid fog hung over the city, soon ending in a settled and heavy rain. This change of weather had an odd effect upon the crowd, the whole of which was at once put into new commotion and overshadowed by a world of umbrellas. The waver, the jostle, and the hum increased in a tenfold degree. For my own part, I did not much regard the rain, the lurking of an old fever in my system rendering the moisture somewhat too dangerously pleasant. Tying a handkerchief around my mouth, I kept on. For half an hour the old man held his way with difficulty along the great thoroughfare, and I here walked close at his elbow through fear of losing sight of him. Never once turning his head to look back, he did not observe me. By and by he passed into a cross street which, although densely filled with people, was not quite so much thronged as the main one he had quitted. Here a change in his demeanor became evident. He walked more slowly and with less object than before, more hesitatingly. He crossed and recrossed the way repeatedly, without apparent aim, and the press was still so thick that at every such moment I was obliged to follow him closely. The street was a narrow and long one, and his course lay within it for nearly an hour, during which the passengers had gradually diminished to about that number which is ordinarily seen at noon in Broadway near the park. So vast a difference is there between a London populace and that of the most frequented American city. A second turn brought us into a square brilliantly lighted and overflowing with life. The old manner of the stranger reappeared. His chin fell upon his breast, while his eyes rolled wildly from under his knit brows in every direction upon those who hemmed him in. He urged his way steadily and perseveringly, I was surprised, however, to find upon his having made the circuit of the square that he turned and retraced his steps. Still more was I astonished to see him repeat the same walk several times, once nearly detecting me as he came round with a sudden movement. In this exercise he spent another hour, at the end of which we met with far less interruption from passengers than at first. The rain fell fast, the air grew cool, and the people were retiring to their homes. With a gesture of impatience, the wanderer passed into a by-street comparatively deserted. Down this, some quarter of a mile long, he rushed with an activity I could not have dreamed of seeing in one so aged, and which put me to much trouble in pursuit. A few minutes brought us to a large and busy bazaar, with the localities of which the stranger appeared well acquainted, and where his original demeanor again became apparent, as he forced his way to and fro without aim among the host of buyers and sellers. During the hour and a half, or thereabouts, which we passed in this place, it required much caution on my part to keep him within reach without attracting his observation. Luckily, I wore a pair of couchock overshoes and could move about in perfect silence. At no moment did he see that I watched him. He entered shop after shop, priced nothing, spoke no word, and looked at all objects with a wild and vacant stare. I was now utterly amazed at his behavior, and firmly resolved that we should not part until I had satisfied myself in some measure respecting him. A loud-toned clock struck eleven, and the company were fast deserting the bazaar. A shopkeeper, in putting up a shutter, jostled the old man, 
and at the instant I saw a strong shudder come over his frame. He hurried into the street, looked anxiously around him for an instant, and then ran with incredible swiftness through many crooked and peopleless lanes, until we emerged once more upon the great thoroughfare whence we had started, the street of the D Hotel. It no longer wore, however, the same aspect. It was still brilliant with gas, but the rain fell fiercely, and there were few persons to be seen. The stranger grew pale. He walked moodily some paces up the once populous avenue, then, with a heavy sigh, turned in the direction of the river, and, plunging through a great variety of devious ways, came out at length in view of one of the principal theaters. It was about being closed, and the audience were thronging from the doors. I saw the old man gasp as if for breath while he threw himself amid the crowd, but I thought that the intense agony of his countenance had in some measure abated. His head again fell upon his breast. He appeared as I had seen him at first. I observed that he now took the course in which had gone the greater number of the audience, but upon the whole I was at a loss to comprehend the waywardness of his actions. As he proceeded, the company grew more scattered, and his old uneasiness and vacillation were resumed. For some time he followed closely a party of some ten or twelve roisterers, but from this number one by one dropped off until three only remained together, in a narrow and gloomy lane little frequented. The stranger paused and for a moment seemed lost in thought, then with every mark of agitation pursued rapidly a route which brought us to the verge of the city, amid regions very different from those we had hitherto traversed. It was the most noisome quarter of London, where everything wore the worst impress of the most deplorable poverty and of the most desperate crime. By the dim light of an accidental lamp, tall, antique, worm-eaten, wooden tenements were seen tottering to their fall, in directions so many and capricious that scarce the semblance of a passage was discernible between them. The paving stones lay at random, displaced from their beds by the rankly growing grass. Horrible filth festered in the dammed-up gutters. The whole atmosphere teemed with desolation. Yet as we proceeded, the sounds of human life revived by sure degrees, and at length large bands of the most abandoned of a London populace were seen reeling to and fro. The spirits of the old man again flickered up, as a lamp which is near its death hour. Once more he strode onward with elastic tread. Suddenly a corner was turned, a blaze of light burst upon our sight, and we stood before one of the huge suburban temples of intemperance, one of the palaces of the fiend, Jinn. It was now nearly daybreak, but a number of wretched inebriates still pressed in and out of the flaunting entrance. With a half-shriek of joy, the old man forced a passage within, resumed at once his original bearing, and stalked backward and forward, without apparent object, among the throng. He had not been thus long occupied, however, before a rush to the doors gave token that the host was closing them for the night. It was something even more intense than despair that I then observed upon the countenance of the singular being whom I had watched so pertinaciously. Yet he did not hesitate in his career, but with a mad energy retraced his steps at once to the heart of the mighty London. Long and swiftly he fled, while I followed him in the wildest amazement, resolute not to abandon a scrutiny in which I now felt an interest all-absorbing. The sun arose while we proceeded, and, when we had once again reached that most thronged mart of the populous town, the street of the D Hotel, it presented an appearance of human bustle and activity scarcely inferior to what I had seen on the evening before. And here, long, amid the momently increasing confusion, did I persist in my pursuit of the stranger. But as usual, he walked to and fro, and during the day did not pass from out the turmoil of that street and as the shades of the second evening came on, I grew wearied unto death, and, stopping fully in front of the wanderer, gazed at him steadfastly in the face. He noticed me not, but resumed his solemn walk, while I, ceasing to follow, remained absorbed in contemplation. This old man, I said at length, is the type and the genius of deep crime. He refuses to be alone. He is the man of the crowd." It will be in vain to follow, for I shall learn no more of him nor of his deeds. The worst heart of the world is a grosser book than the Hortilus Anima, and perhaps it is but one of the great mercies of God that er lacht sich nicht lessen. End of section 5
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Never Bet the Devil Your Head, A Tale with a Moral by Edgar Allan Poe Con tal que las costumbres de un autor, says Don Thomas de las Torres, in the preface to his amatory poems, se impuras y castas importo muy poco que no sean igualmente severas sus obras, meaning, in plain English, that provided the morals of an author are pure personally, it signifies nothing what are the morals of his books. We presume that Don Thomas is now in purgatory for the assertion. It would be a clever thing, too, in the way of poetical justice, to keep him there until his amatory poems get out of print, or are laid definitely upon the shelf through lack of readers. Every fiction should have a moral. And what is more to the purpose, the critics have discovered that every fiction has. Philip Melanchthon, some time ago, wrote a commentary upon the Petrochomyomachia, and proved that the poet's object was to excite a distaste for sedition. Pierre Lassen, going a step further, shows that the intention was to recommend to young men temperance in eating and drinking. Just so, too, Jacobus Hugo has satisfied him that, by Eunice, Homer meant to insinuate John Calvin, by Antonius, Martin Luther, by the Lothophagi, Protestants in general, and by the Harpies, the Dutch. Our more modern scholiasts are equally acute. These fellows demonstrate a hidden meaning in the Antidiluvians, a parable in Powhatan, new views in Cock Robin, and transcendentalism in Hop o' My Thumb. In short, it has been shown that no man can sit down to write without a very profound design. Thus, to authors in general, much trouble is spared. A novelist, for example, need have no care of his moral. It is there, that is to say, it is somewhere, and the moral and the critics can take care of themselves. When the proper time arrives, all that the gentleman intended, and all that he did not intend, will be brought to light in the dial, or the down-easter, together with all that he ought to have intended, and the rest that he clearly meant to intend, so that it will all come very straight in the end. There is no just ground, therefore, for the charge brought against me by certain ignoramuses, that I have never written a moral tale, or, in more precise words, a tale with a moral. They are not the critics predestined to bring me out and develop my morals. That is the secret. By and by, the North American quarterly humdrum will make them ashamed of their stupidity. In the meantime, by way of staying execution, by way of mitigating the accusations against me, I offer the sad history appended, a history about whose obvious moral there can be no question whatever, since he who runs may read it in the large capitals which form the title of the tale. I should have credit for this arrangement, a far wiser one than that of La Fontaine and others, who reserve the impression to be conveyed until the last moment, and thus sneak it in at the fag end of their fables. Defuncti injuria ne aficionator was the law of the twelve tables, and de mortius nil nisi bonum is an excellent injunction, even if the dead in question be nothing but dead small beer. It is not my design, therefore, to vituperate my deceased friend Toby Dammit. He was a sad dog, it is true, and a dog's death it was that he died. But he himself was not to blame for his vices. They grew out of a personal defect in his mother. She did her best in the way of flogging him while an infant, for duties to her well-regulated mind were always pleasures, and babies like tough steaks or the modern Greek olive trees are invariably the better for beating. But, poor woman! She had the misfortune to be left-handed, and a child flogged left-handedly had better be left unflogged. The world revolves from right to left. It will not do to whip a baby from left to right. If each blow in the proper direction drives an evil propensity out, it follows that every thump in an opposite one knocks its quota of wickedness in. 
I was often present at Toby's chastisements, and even by the way in which he kicked, I could perceive that he was getting worse and worse every day. At last I saw through the tears in my eyes that there was no hope of the villain at all, and one day, when he had been cuffed until he grew so black in the face that one might have mistaken him for a little African, and no effect had been produced beyond that of making him wriggle himself into a fit, I could stand it no longer, but went down upon my knees forthwith, and uplifting my voice made prophecy of his ruin. The fact is that his precocity in vice was awful. At five months of age he used to get into such passions that he was unable to articulate. At six months I caught him gnawing a pack of cards. At seven months he was in the constant habit of catching and kissing the female babies. At eight months he preemptorily refused to put his signature to the temperance pledge. Thus he went on increasing in iniquity month after month, until at the close of the first year he not only insisted upon wearing mustaches, but had contracted a propensity for cursing and swearing, and for backing his assertions by bets. Through this latter most ungentlemanly practice, the ruin which I had predicted to Toby Dammit, overtook him at last. The fashion had grown with his growth, and strengthened him with strength, so that when he came to be a man, he could scarcely utter a sentence without interlarding it with a proposition to gamble. Not that he actually laid wagers, and no. I will do my friend the justice to say that he would as soon have laid eggs. With him the thing was a mere formula, nothing more. His expressions on this head had no meaning attached to them whatever. They were simple, if not altogether innocent, expletives, imaginative phrases wherewith to round off a sentence. When he said, I'll bet you so-and-so, nobody ever thought of taking him up, but still I could not help thinking it my duty to put him down. The habit was an immoral one, and so I told him. It was a vulgar one. This I begged him to believe. It was discountenanced by society. Here I said nothing but the truth. It was forbidden by act of Congress. Here I had not the slightest intention of telling a lie. I remonstrated, but to no purpose. I demonstrated, in vain. I entreated, he smiled. I implored, he laughed. I preached, he sneered. I threatened, he swore. I kicked him, he called for the police. I pulled his nose, he blew it and offered to bet the devil his head that I would not venture to try that experiment again. Poverty was another vice which the peculiar physical deficiency of Dammit's mother had entailed upon her son. He was detestably poor, and this was the reason, no doubt, that his expletive expressions about betting seldom took a pecuniary turn. I will not be bound to say that I ever heard him make use of such a figure of speech as, I'll bet you a dollar. It was usually, I'll bet you what you please, or, I'll bet you what you dare, or, I'll bet you a trifle, or else, most significantly still, I'll bet the devil my head. This latter form seemed to please him best, perhaps because it involved the least risk, for Dammit had become excessively parsimonious. Had any one taken him up, his head was small, and thus his loss would have been small, too. But these are my own reflections, and I am by no means sure that I am right in attributing them to him. At all events, the phrase in question grew daily in favor, notwithstanding the gross impropriety of a man betting his brains like banknotes. But this was a point which my friend's perversity of disposition would not permit him to comprehend. In the end, he abandoned all other forms of wager and gave himself up to I'll bet the devil my head, with a pertinacity and exclusiveness of devotion that displeased not less than it surprised me. I am always displeased by circumstances for which I cannot account. Mysteries force a man to think, and so injure his health. The truth is, there was something in the air with which Mr. Dammit was wont to give utterance to his offensive expression, something in his manner of enunciation, 
which at first interested and afterwards made me very uneasy, something which, for want of a more definite term at present, I must be permitted to call queer, but which Mr. Coleridge would have called mystical, Mr. Kant pantheistical, Mr. Carlyle twistical, and Mr. Emerson hyperquisitistical. I began not to like it at all. Mr. Dammit's soul was in a perilous state. I resolved to bring all my eloquence into play to save it. I vowed to serve him as St. Patrick in the Irish Chronicle is said to have served the toad, that is to say, awaking him to a sense of his situation. I addressed myself to the task forthwith. Once more I betook myself to remonstrance. Again I collected my energies for a final attempt at expostulation. When I had made an end of my lecture, Mr. Dammit indulged himself in some very equivocal behavior. For some moments he remained silent, merely looking me inquisitively in the face. But presently he threw his head to one side and elevated his eyebrows to a great extent. Then he spread out the palms of his hands and shrugged up his shoulders. Then he winked with the right eye. Then he repeated the operation with the left. Then he shut them both up very tight. Then he opened them both so very wide that I became seriously alarmed for the consequences. Then, applying his thumb to his nose, he thought proper to make an indescribable movement with the rest of his fingers. Finally, setting his arms akimbo, he condescended to reply. I can call to mind only the beads of his discourse, he would be obliged to me if I would hold my tongue. He wished none of my advice. He despised all my insinuations. He was old enough to take care of himself. Did I still think him baby, damn it? Did I mean to say anything against his character? Did I intend to insult him? Was I a fool? Was my maternal parent aware, in a word, of my absence from the domiciliary residence? He would put this latter question to me as a man of veracity, and he would bind himself to abide by my reply. Once more he would demand explicitly if my mother knew that I was out. My confusion, he said, betrayed me, and he would be willing to bet the devil his head that she did not. Mr. Dammit did not pause for my rejoinder. Turning upon his heel, he left my presence with undignified precipitation. It was well for him that he did so. My feelings had been wounded. Even my anger had been aroused. For once I would have taken him up upon his insulting wager. I would have won for the arch-enemy of Mr. Dammit's little head. For the fact is, my mamma was very well aware of my merely temporary absence from home. But Kodashefa met ahead. Heaven gives relief, as the Muslims say when you tread upon their toes. It was in pursuance of my duty that I had been insulted, and I bore the insult like a man. It now seemed to me, however, that I had done all that could be required of me in the case of this miserable individual, and I resolved to trouble him no longer with my counsel, but to leave him to his conscience and himself. But although I forbore to intrude with my advice, I could not bring myself to give up his society altogether. I even went so far as to humor some of his less reprehensible propensities, and there were times when I found myself lauding his wicked jokes, as epicures do mustard, with tears in my eyes. So profoundly did it grieve me to hear his evil talk. One fine day, having strolled out together, arm in arm, our route held us in the direction of a river. There was a bridge, and we resolved to cross it. It was roofed over by the way of protection from the weather, and the archway, having but few windows, was thus very uncomfortably dark. As we entered the passage, the contrast between the external glare and the interior gloom struck heavily upon my spirits. Not so upon those of the unhappy Dammit, who offered to bet the devil his head that I was hipped. He seemed to be in an unusually good humor. He was excessively lively, so much so that I entertained to know not what of uneasy suspicion. It is not impossible that he was affected with the transcendentals. 
I am not well enough versed, however, in the diagnosis of this disease to speak with decision upon the point, and unhappily there were none of my friends of the dial present. I suggest the idea, nevertheless, because of a certain species of austere Mary Andrewism which seemed to beset my poor friend, and caused him to make quite a tom fool of himself. Nothing would serve him but wriggling and skipping about under and over everything that came in his way, now shouting out and now lisping out, all manner of odd little and big words, yet preserving the gravest face in the world all the time. I really could not make up my mind whether to kick or to pity him. At length, having passed nearly across the bridge, we approached the termination of the footway, when our progress was impeded by a turnstile of some height. Through this I made my way quietly, pushing it around as usual. But this turn would not serve the turn of Mr. Dammit. He insisted upon leaping the stile, and said he could cut a pigeon wing over it in the air. Now this, conscientiously speaking, I did not think he could do. The best pigeon-winger over all kinds of style was my friend Mr. Carlyle, and as I knew he could not do it, I would not believe that it could be done by Toby Dammit. I therefore told him, in so many words, that he was a braggadocio, and could not do what he said. For this I had reason to be sorry afterward, for he straightway offered to bet the devil his head that he could. I was about to reply, notwithstanding my previous resolutions, with some remonstrance against his impiety, when I heard close at my elbow a slight cough, which sounded very much like the ejaculation, ahem. I started and looked about me in surprise. My glance at length fell into a nook of the framework of the bridge, and upon the figure of a little lame old gentleman of venerable aspect. Nothing could be more reverend than his whole appearance, for he not only had on a full suit of black, but his shirt was perfectly clean, and the collar turned very neatly down over a white cravat, while his hair was parted in front like a girl's. His hands were clasped pensively together over his stomach, and his two eyes were carefully rolled up into the top of his head. Upon observing him more closely, I perceived that he wore a black silk apron over his small clothes, and this was a thing which I thought very odd. Before I had time to make any remark, however, upon so singular a circumstance, he interrupted me with a second, ahem. To this observation I was not immediately prepared to reply. The fact is, remarks of this laconic nature are nearly unanswerable. I have known a quarterly review, nonplussed by the word fudge. I am not ashamed to say, therefore, that I turned to Mr. Dammit for assistance. Dammit, said I, what are you about? Don't you hear? The gentleman says, ahem. I looked sternly at my friend while I thus addressed him, for, to say the truth, I felt particularly puzzled, and when a man is particularly puzzled, he must knit his brows and look savage, or else he is pretty sure to look like a fool. Damn it, observed I, although this sounded very much like an oath, than which nothing was further from my thoughts. Damn it, I suggested, the gentleman says, ahem. I do not attempt to defend my remark on the score of profundity. I did not think it profound myself. But I have noticed that the effect of our speeches is not always proportionate with their importance in our own eyes. And if I had shot Mr. D. through and through with the Paxion bomb, or knocked him in the head with the poets and poetry of America, he could hardly have been more discomfited than when I addressed him with those simple words. Damn it, what are you about? Don't you hear? The gentleman says, ahem. You don't say so, gasped he at length, after turning more colors than a pirate runs up, one after the other, when chased by a man of war. Are you quite sure he said that? Well, at all events, I am in for it now, and may as well put a bold face upon the matter. Here goes, then. Ahem! At this the little gentleman seemed pleased. God only knows why. He left his station at the nook of the bridge, 
limped forward with a gracious air, took Dammit by the hand, and shook it cordially, looking all the while straight up in his face with an air of the most unadulterated benignity which it is possible for the mind of man to imagine. "'I am quite sure you will win it, damn it,' said he with the frankest of all smiles. "'But we are obliged to have a trial, you know, for the sake of mere form.' "'Ahem,' replied my friend, taking off his coat with a deep sigh, tying a pocket-handkerchief around his waist, and producing an unaccountable alteration in his countenance by twisting up his eyes and bringing down the corners of his mouth. Ahem, and ahem, said he again after a pause, and not another word more than ahem did I ever know him to say after that. Aha, thought I, without expressing myself aloud, this is quite a remarkable silence on the part of Toby Dammit and is no doubt a consequence of his verbosity upon a previous occasion. One extreme induces another. I wonder if he has forgotten the many unanswerable questions which he propounded to me so fluently on the day when I gave him my last lecture. At all events, he is cured of the transcendentals. Ahem! Here replied Toby, just as if he had been reading my thoughts, and looking like a very old sheep in a reverie. The old gentleman now took him by the arm, and led him more into the shade of the bridge, a few paces back from the turnstile. "'My good fellow,' he said, "'I make it a point of conscience to allow you this much run. Wait here till I make my place by the stile, so that I may see whether you go over it handsomely and transcendentally.' and don't omit any flourishes of the pigeon-wing. A mere form, you know. I will say one, two, three, and away. Mind you, start at the word away. Here he took his position by the stile, paused a moment as in profound reflection, then looked up, and I thought smiled very slightly, then tightened the strings of his apron, then took a long look at Dammit, and finally gave the word as agreed upon. One, two, three, and away! Punctually at the word away, my poor friend set off in a strong gallop. The style was not very high like Mr. Lord's, nor yet very low like that of Mr. Lord's reviewers, but upon the whole I made sure that he would clear it. And then what if he did not? Ah, that was the question. What if he did not? What right, said I, had the old gentleman to make any other gentleman jump? The little old dot and carry one. Who is he? If he asks me to jump, I won't do it. That's flat, and I don't care who the devil he is. The bridge, as I say, was arched and covered in, in a very ridiculous manner, and there was a most uncomfortable echo about it at all times, an echo which I never before so particularly observed as when I uttered the four last words of my remark. But what I said, or what I thought, or what I heard occupied only an instant. In less than five seconds from his starting, my poor Toby had taken the leap, I saw him run nimbly, and spring grandly from the floor of the bridge, cutting the most awful flourishes with his legs as he went up. I saw him high in the air, pigeon-winging it to admiration, just over the top of the stile. And of course I thought it an unusually singular thing that he did not continue to go over. But the whole leap was the affair of a moment, and before I had a chance to make any profound reflections— down came Mr. Dammit on the flat of his back, on the same side of the stile from which he had started. At the same instant I saw the old gentleman limping off at the top of his speed, having caught and wrapped up in his apron something that fell heavily into it from the darkness of the arch, just over the turnstile. At all this I was much astonished, but I had no leisure to think for Dammit lay particularly still, and I concluded that his feelings had been hurt, and that he stood in need of my assistance. 
I hurried up to him and found that he had received what might be termed a serious injury. The truth is, he had been deprived of his head, which after a close search I could not find anywhere. So I determined to take him home and send for the homeopathists. In the meantime a thought struck me, and I threw open an adjacent window of the bridge when the sad truth flashed upon me at once. About five feet just above the top of the turnstile, and crossing the arch of the footpath so as to constitute a brace, there extended a flat iron bar, lying with its breadth horizontally, and forming one of a series that served to strengthen the structure throughout its extent. With the edge of this brace it appeared evident that the neck of my unfortunate friend had come precisely in contact. He did not long survive his terrible loss. The homeopathist did not give him little enough physic, and what little they did give him he hesitated to take. So in the end he grew worse, and at length died, a lesson to all riotous livers. I bedewed his grave with my tears, worked at a bar sinister on his family escutcheon, and for the general expenses of his funeral sent in my very moderate bill to the transcendentalists. The scoundrels refused to pay it, so I had Mr. Demmet dug up at once and sold him for dog's meat. End of section 6《ラヴィット!》ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!ラヴィット!
and never was known to take a meal in his house. Still, this did not prevent the two friends from being exceedingly intimate, as I have just observed. For old Charlie never let a day pass without stepping in three or four times to see how his neighbor came on, and very often he would stay to breakfast or tea, and almost always to dinner. And then the amount of wine that was made way with by the two cronies at a sitting, it would really be a difficult thing to ascertain. Old Charlie's favorite beverage was Chateau Margaux, and it appeared to do Mr. Shuttleworthy's heart good to see the old fellow swallow it, as he did, court after court, so that one day, when the wine was in and the wit as a natural consequence somewhat out, he said to his crony, as he slapped him upon the back, I tell you what it is, old Charlie, you are, by all odds, the hardiest old fellow I ever came across in all my born days, and since you love to guzzle the wine of that fashion, I'll be darned if I don't have to make thee a present of a big box of the Chateau Margaux. All it wrought me. Mr. Shuttleworthy had a sad habit of swearing. Although he seldom went beyond, odd rot me, or by gosh, or by the jolly golly. Odd rot me, says he, if I don't send an order to town this very afternoon for a double box of the best that can be got, and I'll make ye a present of it, I will. Ye needn't say a word now. I will, I tell ye, and there's an end of it. So look out for it. It will come to hand some of these fine days, precisely when ye are looking for it the least. I mention this little bit of liberality on the part of Mr. Shuttleworthy just by way of showing you how very intimate an understanding existed between the two friends. Well, on the Sunday morning in question, when it came to be fairly understood that Mr. Shuttleworthy had met with foul play, I never saw anyone so profoundly affected as old Charlie Goodfellow. When he first heard that the horse had come home without his master, and without his master's saddlebags, and all bloody from a pistol shot, that had gone clean through and through the poor animal's chest without quite killing him, when he heard all this, he turned as pale as if the missing man had been his own dear brother or father, and shivered and shook all over as if he had a fit of the egg. At first he was much too overpowered with grief to be able to do anything at all, or to concert upon any plan of action, so that for a long time he endeavored to dissuade Mr. Shuttleworthy's other friends from making a stir about the matter, thinking it best to wait a while, say for a week or two, or a month, or two, to see if something wouldn't turn up, or if Mr. Shuttleworthy wouldn't come in the natural way and explain his reasons for sending his horse on before. I dare say you have often observed this disposition to temporize or to procrastinate in people who are laboring under any very poignant sorrow. Their powers of mind seem to be rendered torpid, so that they have a horror of anything like action, and like nothing in the world so well as to lie quietly in bed and nurse their grief, as the old ladies express it. That is to say, ruminate over the trouble. The people of Rattleboro had indeed so high an opinion of the wisdom and discretion of old Charlie that the greater part of them felt disposed to agree with him, and not make a stir in the business until something should turn up, as the honest old gentleman worded it. And I believe that, after all, this would have been the general determination. But for the very suspicious interference of Mr. Shuttleworthy's nephew, a young man of very dissipated habits, and otherwise of rather bad character, this nephew, whose name was Pennyfeather, would listen to nothing like reason in the matter of lying quiet, but insisted upon making immediate search for the corpse of the murdered man. This was the expression he employed, and Mr. Goodfellow acutely remarked at the time that it was a singular expression to say no more. This remark of old Charlie's, too, had great effect upon the crowd, and one of the party was heard to ask, very impressively, how it happened that young Mr. Pennyfeather was so intimately cognizant of all the circumstances connected with his wealthy uncle's disappearance as to feel authorized to assert, distinctly and unequivocally, that his uncle was a murdered man. Hereupon some little squibbing and bickering occurred among various members of the crowd, and especially between old Charlie and Mr. Pennyfeather. Although this latter occurrence was, indeed, by no means a novelty, for no goodwill had subsisted between the parties for the last three or four months, and matters had gone even so far that Mr. Pennyweather had actually knocked down his uncle's friend for some alleged excess of liberty that the latter had taken in the uncle's house, of which the nephew was an inmate. Upon this occasion, old Charlie is said to have behaved with exemplary moderation and Christian charity. He rose from the blow, adjusted his clothes, and made no attempt at retaliation at all, merely muttering a few words about taking summary vengeance at the first convenient opportunity, a natural and very justifiable ebullition of anger which meant nothing, however, and beyond doubt was no sooner given vent to than forgotten. However these matters may be, which have no reference to the point now at issue, it is quite certain that the people of Rattleborough, principally through the persuasion of Mr. Pennyfeather, came at length to the determination of dispersion over the adjacent country in search of the missing Mr. Shuttleworthy. I say they came to this determination in the first instance, 
after it had been fully resolved that a search should be made, it was considered almost a matter of course that the seekers should disperse, that is to say, distribute themselves in parties, for the more thorough examination of the region round about. I forget, however, by what ingenious train of reasoning it was that old Charlie finally convinced the assembly that this was the most injudicious plan that could be pursued. Convince them, however, he did, all except Mr. Pennyfeather, and in the end it was arranged that a search should be instituted, carefully and very thoroughly, by the burghers en masse, old Charlie himself leading the way. As for the matter of that, there could have been no better pioneer than old Charlie, whom everybody knew to have the eye of a lynx, but although he led them into all manner of out-of-the-way holes and corners, by routes that nobody had ever suspected of existing in the neighborhood, and although the search was incessantly kept up day and night for nearly a week, still no trace of Mr. Shuttleworthy could be discovered. When I say no trace, however, I must not be understood to speak literally, for trace, to some extent, there certainly was. The poor gentleman had been tracked by this path coming out again into the main road and cutting off about half a mile of the regular distance. Half hidden by the brambles to the right of the lane, and opposite this pool all vestige of the track was lost sight of. It appeared, however, that a struggle of some nature had there taken place, and it seemed as if some large and heavy body, much larger and heavier than a man, had been drawn from the bypath to the pool. This ladder was carefully dragged twice, but nothing was found, and the party was upon the point of going away, in despair of coming to any result, when Providence suggested to Mr. Goodfellow the expediency of draining the water off altogether. This project was received with cheers, and many high compliments to old Charlie upon this sagacity and consideration. As many of the burghers had brought spades with them, supposing that they might possibly be called upon to disinter a corpse, the drain was easily and speedily effected, and no sooner was the bottom visible than right in the middle of the mud that remained was discovered a black silk velvet waistcoat, which nearly every one present immediately recognized as the property of Mr. Pennyfeather. This waistcoat was much torn and covered with blood, and there were several persons among the party who had a distinct remembrance of its having been worn by its owner on the very morning of Mr. Shuttleworthy's departure for the city, while there were others again ready to testify upon oath, if required, that Mr. P. did not wear the garment in question at any period during the remainder of that memorable day, nor could any one be found to say that he had seen it upon Mr. P.'s person at any period at all subsequent to Mr. Shuttleworthy's disappearance. Matters now wore a very serious aspect for Mr. Pennyfeather, and it was observed as an indubitable confirmation of the suspicions which were excited against him, that he grew exceedingly pale, and when asked what he had to say for himself, was utterly incapable of saying a word. Hereupon the few friends his riotous mode of living had left him, deserted him at once to a man, and were even more clamorous than his ancient and avowed enemies for his instantaneous arrest. But, on the other hand, the magnanimity of Mr. Goodfellow shone forth with only the more brilliant luster through contrast. He made a warm and intensely eloquent defense of Mr. Pennyfeather, in which he alluded more than once to his own sincere forgiveness of that wild young gentleman, the heir of the worthy Mr. Shuttleworthy, for the insult which he, the young gentleman, had no doubt in the heat of passion, thought proper to put upon him, Mr. Goodfellow. He forgave him for it, he said, from the very bottom of his heart, and for himself, Mr. Goodfellow, so far from pushing the suspicious circumstances to extremity, which he was sorry to say really had arisen against Mr. Pennyfeather, he, Mr. Goodfellow, would make every exertion in his power, would employ all the little eloquence in his possession to, to, to soften down, as much as he could conscientiously do so, the worst features of this really exceedingly perplexing piece of business. Mr. Goodfellow went on for some half-hour longer in this strain, very much to the credit both of his head and of his heart, but your warm-hearted people are seldom opposite in their observations. They run into all sorts of blunders, contretemps, and mal apropoisms in the hot-headedness of their zeal to serve a friend, thus often with the kindest intentions in the world, doing infinitely more to prejudice his cause than to advance it. So, in the present instance, it turned out with all the eloquence of old Charlie. For although he labored earnestly in behalf of the suspected, yet it so happened, somehow or other, that every syllable he uttered of which the direct but unwitting tendency was not to exalt the speaker in the good opinion of his audience, had the effect to deepen the suspicion already attached to the individual whose cause he pleaded, and to arouse against him the fury of the mob. One of the most unaccountable errors committed by the orator was his allusion to the suspected as the heir of the worthy old gentleman Mr. Shuttleworthy. The people had really never thought of this before. They had only remembered certain threats of disinheritance uttered a year or two previously by the uncle, who had no living relative except the nephew, and they had, therefore, 
always looked upon his disinheritance as a matter that was settled so single-minded a race of beings were the rattleburgers but the remark of old charlie brought them at once to a consideration of this point and thus gave them to see the possibility of the threats having been nothing more than a threat and straightway hereupon arose the natural question of of cui bono a question that tended even more than the waistcoat to fasten the terrible crime upon the young man and here lest i may be misunderstood permit me to digress for one moment merely to observe that the exceedingly brief and simple latin phrase which i have employed is invariably mistranslated and misconceived qui bono in all the cracked novels and elsewhere in those of mrs gore for example the author of cecil a lady who quotes all tongues from the chaldean to chicksaw and is helped to her learning as needed upon a systematic plan by mr beckford in all the cracked novels i say from those of bulwer and dickens to those of turnapenny and ainsworth the two little latin words qui bono are rendered to what purpose or as if quo bono to what good their true meaning nevertheless is for whose advantage qui to whom bono is it for a benefit it is a purely legal phrase and applicable precisely in cases such as we have now under consideration where the probability of the doer of a deed hinges upon the probability of the benefit accruing to this individual or to that from the deed's accomplishment now in the present instance the question qui bono very pointedly implicated mr pennyfeather his uncle had threatened him after making a will in his favour with disinheritance but the threat had not been actually kept the original will it appeared had not been altered had it been altered the only supposable motive for murder on the part of the suspected would have been the ordinary one of revenge and even this would have been counteracted by the hope of reinstation into the good graces of the uncle but the will being unaltered while the threat to alter remains suspended over the nephew's head there appears at once the very strongest possible inducement for the atrocity and so concluded very sagaciously the worthy citizens of the borough of rattle mr pennyfeather was accordingly arrested upon the spot and the crowd after some search proceeded homeward having him in custody on the route however another circumstance occurred tending to confirm the suspicion entertained mr goodfellow whose zeal led him to be always a little in advance of the party was seen suddenly to run forward a few paces stoop and then apparently to pick up some small object from the grass having quickly examined it he was observed too to make a sort of half attempt at concealing it in his coat pocket but this action was noticed as i say and consequently prevented when the object picked up was found to be a spanish knife which a dozen persons at once recognized as belonging to Mr. Pennyfeather. Moreover, his initials were engraved upon the handle. The blade of this knife was open and bloody. No doubt now remained of the guilt of the nephew, and immediately upon reaching Rattleboro he was taken before a magistrate for examination. Here matters again took a most unfavorable turn. The prisoner, being questioned as to his whereabouts on the morning of Mr. Shuttleworthy's disappearance, had absolutely the audacity to acknowledge that on that very morning he had been out with his rifle deer-stalking in the immediate neighborhood of the pool where the blood-stained waistcoat had been discovered through the sagacity of mr goodfellow this latter now came forward and with tears in his eyes asked permission to be examined he said that a stern sense of the duty he owed his maker not less than his fellow men would permit him no longer to remain silent hitherto the sincerest affection for the young man notwithstanding the latter's ill-treatment of himself mr goodfellow had induced him to make every hypothesis which imagination could suggest by the way of endeavouring to account for what appeared suspicious in the circumstances that told so seriously against mr pennyfeather but these circumstances were now altogether too convincing too damning he would hesitate no longer he would tell all he knew although his heart mr goodfellow's should absolutely burst asunder in the effort he then went on to state that on the afternoon of the day previous to mr shuttleworthy's departure for the city that worthy old gentleman had mentioned to his nephew in his hearing mr goodfellows that his object in going to town on the morrow was to make a deposit of an unusually large sum of money in the farmers and mechanics bank and that then and there the said mr shuttleworthy had distinctly avowed to the said nephew his irrevocable determination of rescinding the will originally made and of cutting him off with a shilling he the witness now solemnly called upon the accused to state whether what he the witness had just stated was or was not the truth in every substantial particular much to the astonishment of every one present mr pennyfeather frankly admitted that it was the magistrate now considered it his duty to send a couple of constables to search the chamber of the accused in the house of his uncle from this search they almost immediately returned with the well-known steel-bound russet leather pocket-book which the old gentleman had been in the habit of carrying for years 
its valuable contents however had been abstracted and the magistrate in vain endeavoured to extort from the prisoner the use which had been made of them or the place of their concealment indeed he obstinately denied all knowledge of the matter the constables also discovered between the bed and sacking of the unhappy man a shirt and neck handkerchief both marked with the initials of his name and both hideously besmeared with the blood of the victim at this juncture it was announced that the horse of the murdered man had just expired in the stable from the effects of the wound he had received and it was proposed by mr goodfellow that a post-mortem examination of the beast should be immediately made with the view if possible of discovering the ball this was accordingly done and as if to demonstrate beyond a question the guilt of the accused mr goodfellow after considerable searching in the cavity of the chest was enabled to detect and to pull forth a bullet of very extraordinary size which upon trial was found to be exactly adapted to the bore of mr pennyfeather's rifle while it was far too large for that of any other person in the borough or its vicinity to render the matter even sure yet however this bullet was discovered to have a flaw or seam at right angles to the usual suture and upon examination the seam corresponded precisely with an accidental ridge or elevation in a pair of moulds acknowledged by the accused himself to be his own property upon finding of this bullet the examining magistrate refused to listen to any farther testimony and immediately committed the prisoner for trial declining resolutely to take any bail in the case although against this severity mr goodfellow very warmly remonstrated and offered to become surety in whatever amount might be required this generosity on the part of old charlie was only in accordance with the whole tenor of his amiable and chivalrous conduct during the entire period of his sojourn in the borough of rattle in the present instance the worthy man was so entirely carried away by the excessive warmth of his sympathy that he seemed to have quite forgotten when he offered to go bail for his young friend that he himself mr goodfellow did not possess a single dollar's worth of property upon the face of the earth the result of the committal may be readily foreseen mr pennyfeather amid the loud execrations of all rattleborough was brought to trial at the next criminal sessions when the chain of circumstantial evidence strengthened as it was by some additional damning facts which mr goodfellow's sensitive conscientiousness forbade him to withhold from the court was considered so unbroken and so thoroughly conclusive that the jury without leaving their seats returned an immediate verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree soon afterward the unhappy wretch received sentence of death and was remanded to the county jail to await the inexorable vengeance of the law in the meantime the noble behavior of old charlie goodfellow had doubly endeared him to the honest citizens of the borough he became ten times a greater favorite than ever and as a natural result of the hospitality with which he was treated he relaxed as it were perforce the extremely parsimonious habits which his poverty had hitherto impelled him to observe and very frequently had little reunions at his own house when wit and jollity reigned supreme dampened a little of course by the occasional remembrance of the untoward and melancholy fate which impended over the nephew of the late lamented bosom friend of the generous host one fine day this magnanimous old gentleman was agreeably surprised at the receipt of the following letter charles goodfellow esq rattleborough from h f b and company chateau margot a number one six dozen bottles half gross charles goodfellow esq dear sir in conformity with an order transmitted to our firm about two months since by our esteemed correspondent mr barnabas shuttleworthy we have the honor of forwarding this morning to your address a double box of chateau margot of the antelope brand violet seal box numbered and marked as per margin we remain sir your most obedient servants hogs frogs boggs and company city of june twenty first eighteen p s the box will reach you by wagon on the day after your receipt of this letter our respects to mr shuttleworthy h f b and company the fact is that mr goodfellow had since the death of mr shuttleworthy given over all expectation of ever receiving the promised chateau margot and he therefore looked upon it now as a sort of especial dispensation of providence in his behalf he was highly delighted of course and in the exuberance of his joy invited a large party of friends to a petite supper on the morrow for the purpose of broaching the good old mr shuttleworthy's present not that he said anything about the good old mr shuttleworthy when he issued the invitations the fact is he thought much and concluded to say nothing at all he did not mention to any one if i remember aright that he received a present of chateau margot he merely asked his friends to come and help him drink some of a remarkable fine quality and rich flavor that he had ordered up from the city a couple of months ago and of which he would be in the receipt upon the morrow 
I have often puzzled myself to imagine why it was that old Charlie came to the conclusion to say nothing about having received the wine from his old friend, but I could never precisely understand his reason for the silence, although he had some excellent and very magnanimous reason, no doubt. The morrow at length arrived, and with it a very large and highly respectable company at Mr. Goodfellow's house. Indeed, half the borough was there, I myself among the number, but much to the vexation of the host, the Chateau Margaux did not arrive until a late hour, and when the sumptuous supper supplied by old Charlie had been done very ample justice by the guests. It came at length, however, a monstrously big box of it there was too, and as the whole party were in excessively good humor, it was decided nem con that it should be lifted upon the table and its contents disemboweled forthwith. No sooner said than done. I lent a helping hand, and in a trice we had the box upon the table, in the midst of all the bottles and glasses, not a few of which were demolished in the scuffle. Old Charlie, who was pretty much intoxicated and excessively red in the face, now took a seat, with an air of mock dignity, at the head of the board, and thumped furiously upon it with a decanter, calling upon the company to keep order during the ceremony of disinterring the treasure. After some vociferation, quiet was at length fully restored, and as very often happens in similar cases, a profound and remarkable silence ensued. Being then requested to force open the lid, I complied, of course, with an infinite deal of pleasure. I inserted a chisel, and giving it a slight taps with a hammer, the top of the box flew suddenly off, and at the same instant there sprang up into a sitting position, directly facing the host, the bruised, bloody, and nearly putrid corpse of the murdered Mr. Shuttleworthy himself. It gazed for a few seconds, fixedly and sorrowfully, with its decaying and lackluster eyes, full into the countenance of Mr. Goodfellow, uttered slowly, but clearly and impressively the words, Thou art the man, and then falling over the side of the chest, as if thoroughly satisfied, stretched out its limbs quiveringly upon the table. The scene that ensued is altogether beyond description. The rush for the doors and windows was terrific, and many of the most robust men in the room fainted outright through sheer horror. But after the first wild, shrieking burst of affright, all eyes were directed to Mr. Goodfellow. If I live a thousand years, I can never forget the more than mortal agony which was depicted in that ghastly face of his, so lately rubicund with triumph and wine. For several minutes he sat rigidly as a statue of marble, his eyes seeming, in the intense vacancy of their gaze, to be turned inward and absorbed in the contemplation of his own miserable, murderous soul. At length their expression turned to flash suddenly out into the external world, when with a quick leap he sprang from his chair, and falling heavily with his head and shoulders upon the table, and in contact with the corpse, poured out rapidly and vehemently a detailed confession of the hideous crime for which Mr. Pennyfeather was then imprisoned and doomed to die. What he recounted was in substance this. He followed his victim to the vicinity of the pool, there shot his horse with a pistol, dispatched its rider with the butt-end, possessed himself of the pocket-book, and, supposing the horse dead, dragged it with great labor to the brambles by the pond. Upon his own beast he slung the corpse of Mr. Shuttleworthy, and thus bore it to a secure place of concealment a long distance off through the woods. And thus bore it to a secure place of concealment a long distance off through the woods. The waistcoat, the knife, the pocket-book, and bullet had been placed by himself where found with the view of avenging himself upon Mr. Pennyfeather. He had also contrived the discovery of the stained handkerchief and shirt. Towards the end of the blood-churning recital the words of the guilty wretch faltered and grew hollow. When the record was finally exhausted he arose, staggered backward from the table, and fell, dead. The means by which this happily timed confession was extorted, although efficient, were simple indeed. Mr. Goodfellow's excess of frankness had disgusted me, and excited my suspicions from the first. I was present when Mr. Pennyfeather had struck him, and the fiendish expression which then arose upon his countenance, although momentary, assured me that this threat of vengeance would, if possible, be rigidly fulfilled. I was thus prepared to view the maneuvering of old Charlie in a very different light from that in which it was regarded by the good citizens of Rattleborough. I saw at once that all the criminating discoveries arose, either directly or indirectly, from himself. But the fact which clearly opened my eyes to the true state of the case was the affair of the bullet, found by Mr. G. in the carcass of the horse. I had not forgotten, although the Rattleburgers had, that there was a hole where the ball had entered the horse, and another where it went out. If it were found in the animal then, after having made its exit, I saw clearly that it must have been deposited by the person who found it. The bloody shirt and handkerchief confirmed the idea suggested by the bullet, 
for the blood on examination proved to be capital claret, and no more. When I came to think of these things, and also of the late increase of liberality and expenditure on the part of Mr. Goodfellow, I entertained a suspicion which was none the less strong because I kept it altogether to myself. In the meantime, I instituted a rigorous private search for the corpse of Mr. Shuttleworthy, and for good reasons searched in quarters as divergent as possible from those to which Mr. Goodfellow conducted his party. The result was that, after some days, I came across an old dry well, the mouth of which was nearly hidden by brambles, and here at the bottom I discovered what I sought. Now it so happened that I had overheard the colloquy between the two cronies, where Mr. Goodfellow had contrived to cajole his host into the promise of a box of Chateau Margaux. Upon this hint I acted. I procured a stiff piece of whalebone, thrust it down the throat of the corpse, and deposited the latter in an old wine-box, taking care so to double the body up as to double the whalebone with it. In this manner I had to press forcibly upon the lid to keep it down while I secured it with nails, and I anticipated, of course, that as soon as these latter were removed, the top would fly off and the body up. Having thus arranged the box, I marked, numbered, and addressed it as already told and then writing a letter in the name of the wine merchants with whom Mr. Shuttleworthy dealt, I gave instructions to my servant to wheel the box to Mr. Goodfellow's door, in a barrow, at a given signal for myself. For the words which I intended the corpse to speak, I confidently depended upon my ventriloquial abilities. For their effect, I counted upon the conscience of the murderous wretch. I believe there is nothing more to be explained. Mr. Pennyfeather was released upon the spot, inherited the fortune of his uncle, profited by the lessons of experience, turned over a new leaf, and led happily ever afterward a new life. End of section 7。section 8 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven edition, volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Smoke Why the Little Frenchman Wears His Hand in a Sling Part 1 by Edgar Allan Poe It's on my visiting card, sure enough, and it's them that's all a pink satin paper that any gentleman places may behold the interesting words sir patrick o grandison baronet thirty nine southampton row russell square paris o bloom spring and should you be waiting to discover who is the pink of politeness quite and the lighter of the hot tongue in the whole city of london why it's just myself and fade that same is no wonder at all at all so be pleased to stop curling your nose for every inch o oh, the six wakes that i've been a gentleman and left out with the back throwing to take up with the baronessy it's patrick that's been living like a holy impra and getting the education and the graces yeah. <laughs> and would it be a blessed thing for, for your spirits if you could lay your two papers just upon Sir Patrick O'Grandison, baronet, when he is already dressed for the opera, or stepping into the brisky for the drive into the Hyde Park? But it's the elegant big figure that I ave, for the ration of which all the ladies fall in love with me. Isn't it my own sweet self now that'll measure the six foot and the three inches more nor that in my stockings and that I'm exceedingly well proportioned all over to match? And it is really more than three foot and a bit that there is, anyhow, of the little old foreigner Frenchman that lives just over the way, and that's a ogling and a goggling the whole day and bad luck to him, and the poor dear witty Mr. Strackle, that's my own next-door neighbour. God bless her, and a most particular friend and acquaintance. You perceive the little spalpeen is summoned down in the mouth, and wears his left hand in a sling, and it's for that same thing, by your love, 
that I'm going to give you the good reason. The truth of the whole matter is just simple enough. For the very first day that I come from Connaught and showed my swayed little self in the straight to the wedding, who was looking through the window, it was a gone case altogether with the heart of the pretty Mistress Trackle. I perceived it, you see, all at once. And no mistake, and that's God's truth. First of all, it was up with the windy in a jiffy, and then she drew open her two peepers to the utmost, and then it was a little gold spy class that she clapped tight to one of them, and devil may burn me if I didn't speak to me as plain as a peeper could speak. And says it through the spy glass. Ooh, the tip of the morning to ye, sir, Patrick O'Grandison, baronet, my warning. And it's an a gentleman that ye are, sure enough, and it's meself that me Ford and gist that'll be at your service, dear, any time o' day, at all, at all, for the asking. And it's not meself ye would have to be baiting the politeness. So I made her a bow that would have broken your heart altogether to behold, and then I pulled aff me hat with a flourish, and then I winked at her heart with both eyes, as much as to say, true for you, your sweet little creature, Mrs. Trackle, me darling, and I wish I may be drowned dead in a bog, if it's not myself, Sir Patrick O'Grandison, baronet. That'll make a whole bushel o' oh, laugh to your ladyship in the twinkling o' oh, the eye of a Londonderry purity. And it was the next morning, sure, just as I was making up me mind whether it wouldn't be the perlite thing to send a bit o' oh, riding to the witty by way of a love letter, when up come the delivery servant with an elegant card, and he told me that the name on it for I never could read the copperplate printing on account of being left-handed. was all about Monsieur de Count, a goose, Lucchese, Major de Downs, and that the whole of the devilish lingo was the spalpini long name of the little old foreign Frenchman as left over the way. And just with that in come the little William himself, and then he made me a breath of a bow, and then he said he had only taken the liberty of doing me the honour of giving me a call. And then he went on to palaver at a great rate, and dibbled a bit did I comprehend what he would be after the tilling me at all at all excepting and saving that he said pully woe woolly woe and told me among a bushel o lies bad luck to him that he was mad for the love of my witty mistress trackle and that my witty mrs trackle had a punch for him at the hearing of this ye may swear though i was as mad as a grasshopper but i remembered that i was Sir Patrick O'Grandison, Baronet, and that it wasn't altogether gentle to let the anger give the upper hand o' oh, the politeness. So I made light o' oh, the matter and kept dark and got quite sociable with the little chap. And after a while, what did he do but ask me to go with him to the widdies? saying he would give me the fashionable introduction to her ladyship. Is it there ye are? said I then to myself. And it's true for you, Patrick, that ye're the fortunatest mortal in life. We'll soon see now whether it's your sweet self or whether it's little Monsieur Major de Dons, that Mistress Trackle is head and ears in the low wit. With that we went aft to the widdies next door, and ye may well say it was an elegant place. So it was. There was a carpet all over the floor, and in one corner there was a forty-penny, and a Jew's harp, and the devil knows what else, 
and in another corner was a Sophie, the beautifulest thing in all nature, and sitting on the Sophie, sure enough, there was the sweet little angel, Mistress Draco. The tip o' the morning to ye, says I, Mrs. Draco, and thin I made such an elegant obeisance that you would have quite altogether bewildered the brain o' ye. Willy woo, pully woo, plump in the mud, says the little foreigner Frenchman. And sure, Mrs. Trackle, says he, that he did. Isn't this gentleman here just his reverend Sir Patrick Grandison, baronet? And isn't he altogether and entirely the most particular friend and acquaintance that I have in the whole world? And with that, the witty. She gets up from the shelfy, and makes the sweetest curtsy nor ever was seen, and thin down she sits like an angel, and thin by the powers it was that little spalpeen, Monsieur Maitre de Dons, that plumped himself right down by the right side of her. Och! I expected the two eyes o' me would have come out of my head on the spot. I was so desperate mad. However. Bait who? says I, after a while. Is it there ye are, Monsieur Maitre de Dons? And so down I plumbed on the left side of her ladyship, to be even with the villain. Botheration! It would have done your heart good to perceive the elegant double wink that I gave her, just thin right in the face. With both eyes? But the little old Frenchman, he never began to suspect me at all, at all. And desperate hard it was, he made the love to her ladyship. Woolly woo, says he. Pully woo, says he. Plumping the mud, says he. That's all to no use, Monsieur Frog. Mavornin, thinks I, and I talked as hard as and fast as I could all the while, and thought it was myself just that devoured her ladyship completely and entirely, by reason of the elegant conversation that I keep up with her all about the dear box of Connet. And by and by she gave me such a sweet smile from one end of her mouth to the other that it made me as bold as a pig, and I just took hold of the end of her little finger in the most delicatest manner in nature, looking at her all the while out over the whites of my eyes. And then only perceived the cuteness of the sweet angel, for no sooner did she observe that I was after the squeezing of her flipper, than she up with in a jiffy, and put it away behind her back, just as much as to say, Now thin, Sir Patrick Grandison, there's a bitter chance for ye, my warning, for it's not altogether the gentle thing to be after the squeezing of my flipper, right full in the sides of that little foreign Frenchman, Monsieur Maitre Didons. With that, I give her a big wink, just to say, let Sir Patrick alone for the like so then tricks, and thin I went easy to work, and you'd have died with the diversion to behold how cleverly I slipped my right arm between the back of the Sophie and the back of her ladyship, and there, sure enough, I found a sweet little flipper all waiting to say, the tip o' the morning to ye, Sir Patrick o' Grandison, baronet. And wasn't it meself sure that just gilt in the least little bit of squeeze in the world, all in the way of a commencement, and not to be too rough with her ladyship? And oh, botheration, wasn't it the gentlest and delicatest of all the little squeezes that I got in return? Blood and thunder, Sir Patrick, my born, thinks I to myself, fate, it's just the mother's son of you, and nobody else at all, at all, that's the handsomest and the fortunatest young buck that ever come out of Connet. And with that, I give the flipper a big squeeze, and a big squeeze it was by the powers that her ladyship gave to me back. But 
it would have split the seven sides of you with the laughing to behold just then all at once the concerted behaviour of monsieur major de Dons. the likes of such a jabbering and smirking and a parley wooing as he began with her ladyship neither was known before upon art and devil may burn me if it wasn't me own very two peepers that quatched him tipping her the wink out of one eye Oh, if it wasn't me so thin that was mad as a kilkenny cat i should like to be told who it was let me inform you monsieur maitre de dons said i as pearlite as ever ye said that is not the gentle thing at all at all and not for the likes o oh, you anyhow to be after the ogling and a goggling at her ladyship in the fashion and just with that such another squeeze as it was i gave her flipper all as much as to say isn't sir patrick now my jewel that'll be able to the protecting o oh, you my darling and then there comed another squeeze back all by way of the answer through for you sir patrick it said as plain as ever a squeeze said in the world through for you sir patrick mavornin and it's a proper neat gentleman ye are that's god's truth and with that she opened her two beautiful peepers till i beloved they would have come out of her head altogether and entirely she looked first as mad as a cat at monsieur frog and then as smiling as all out outdoors at myself then uh, uh, and a woolly woo pully woo and then with that he shoved up his two shoulders till the devil the bit of his head was to be discovered and then he let down the two corners of his parity trap and then not a haphorn more of the satisfaction would i get out old spalpeen believe me my jewel it was sir patrick that was unreasonable mad thin and the more by token that the frenchman kept and wit his winking at the witty and the witty she kept and wit the squeezing of my flipper as much as to say at him against sir patrick o'grandison my morning so i just tripped out with a big oath and says i ye little spalpeeny frock of a buck throtting son of a bloody noun and just thin what do you think it was that her ladyship did trot she jumped off from the sofa as if she was bit and made off to the door while i turned my head round after her in a complete bewilderment and moderation and followed her with me two peepers you perceive i had a reason of my own for knowing that she couldn't get down the stairs altogether and entirely for i knew very well that i had hold of her hand for the devil the bit had i ever let it go and says i isn't it the last little bit of a mistake in the world that you've been after the making here ladyship come back now that's a darling and i'll give ye your flipper but aff she went down the stairs like a shot and then i turned round to the little friend's fern <sighs> if it wasn't a spalpeeny little pot that i had hold of in my own why then then it wasn't that's all and maybe it wasn't myself that just died then outright with laughing to behold the little chap when he found out that it wasn't the witty at all at all that he had had hold of all the time but only sir patrick o'grandison the old devil himself never beheld such a long face as he pet and as for sir patrick o'grandison baronet it wasn't for the likes of his reverence to be after the minding of a trifle of a mistake ye may just say though for it's got truth that afore i left hold of the flipper of the spalpeen which was not till after her ladyship's footman had kicked us both down the stairs i give it such a neat little broth of a squeeze as made it all up into raspberry jam woolly woo says he pully woo says he cut tam and that's just the truth of the reason why he wears his left hand in a sling. Bon bon, gon un bon vin, meuble mon estomac. 
Je suis plus savant que Balchac, plus sage que Pibrac. Mon bras seul fait sang l'attaque de la nation cosséaque, la métroite au sac. De Charon, je passe roi le lac, en dormant dans son bac. J'ai roi au fier et hac, sans que mon cœur fitique ni tac, pressante du tabac. French Vaudeville That Pierre Bonbon was a restaurateur of uncommon qualifications. No man who, during the reign of frequented the little café in the cul de sac, le febre at Rouen, will I imagine feel himself at liberty to dispute. That Pierre Bonbon was, in an equal degree, skilled in the philosophy of that period, is, I presume, still more especially undeniable. His but à la fois were beyond doubt immaculate, but what pen can do justice to his essay sur la nature, his thoughts sur l'âme, his observations sur l'esprit? If his armlets, if his fricando were inestimable, what littérateur of that day would not have given twice as much for an idée de bonbon as for all the trace of idée of all the rest of the savants? Bonbon had ransacked libraries which no other man had ransacked, had more than any other would have entertained a notion of reading, had understood more than any other would have conceived the possibility of understanding, and although, while he flourished, there were not wanting some authors at Rouen to assert that his dicta evinced neither the purity of the academy nor the debt of the lyceum although mark me his doctrines were by no means very generally comprehended still it did not follow that they were difficult of comprehension it was i think on account of their self-evidency that many persons were led to consider them abstruse it is to bon bon but let this go no farther. It is to Bonbon that Kant himself is mainly indebted for his metaphysics. The former was indeed not a Platonist, nor, strictly speaking, an Aristotelian, nor did he, like the modern Leibniz, waste those precious hours which might be employed in the invention of a fricassee or facili cradu, the analysis of a sensation in frivolous attempts at reconciling the obstinate oils and waters of ethical discussion not at all bonbon was ionic bonbon was equally italic he reasoned a priori he reasoned also a posteriori his ideas were innate or otherwise he believed in george of trebizond he believed in bossarion brackets Bessarion. Bonbon was emphatically a Bonbonist. I have spoken of the philosopher in his capacity of restaurateur. I would not, however, have any friend of mine imagine that in fulfilling his hereditary duties in that line, our hero wanted a proper estimation of their dignity and importance far from it it was impossible to say in which branch of his profession he took the greater pride in his opinion the powers of the intellect held intimate connection with the capabilities of the stomach i am not sure indeed that he greatly disagreed with the chinese who held that the soul lies in the abdomen the greeks at all events were right he thought who employed the same word for the mind and the diaphragm Note 1. M.D. By this I do not mean to insinuate a charge of gluttony, or indeed any other serious charge to the prejudice of the metaphysician. If Pierre Bonbon had his failings, and what great man has not a thousand, if Pierre Bonbon, I say, had his failings, they were failings of very little importance. Faults, indeed, which, in other tempers, have often been looked upon rather in the light of virtues. As regards one of these foibles, I should not even have mentioned it in this history, but for the remarkable prominency, 
the extreme alto relievo in which it jutted out from the plane of his general disposition he could never let slip an opportunity of making a bargain not that he was avaricious no it was by no means necessary to the satisfaction of the philosopher that the bargain should be to his own proper advantage provided a trade could be effected a trade of any kind upon any terms or under any circumstances a triumphant smile was seen for many days thereafter to enlighten his countenance and a knowing wink of the eye to give evidence of his sagacity at any epoch it would not be very wonderful if a humour so peculiar as the one i have just mentioned should elicit attention and remark at the epoch of our narrative had this peculiarity not attract observation there would have been room for wonder indeed it was soon reported that upon all occasions of the kind the smile of bonbon was wont to differ widely from the downright grin with which he would laugh at his own jokes or welcome an acquaintance hints were thrown out of an exciting nature stories were told of perilous bargains made in a hurry and repented of at leisure and instances were adduced of unaccountable capacities vague longings and unnatural inclinations implanted by the author of all evil for wise purposes of his own the philosopher had other weaknesses but they are scarcely worthy our serious examination for example there are few men of extraordinary profundity who are found wanting in an inclination for the bottle whether this inclination be an exciting cause or rather a valid proof of such profundity it is a nice thing to say bonbon as far as i can learn did not think the subject adapted to minute investigation nor do i yet in the indulgence of a propensity so truly classical it is not to be supposed that the restaurateur would lose sight of the intuitive discrimination which was wont to characterize at one and the same time his essays and his amulets in his seclusions the vin de bourgogne had its allotted hour and there were appropriate moments for the cote du rhone which in Sotene was to Medoc what Catillus was to Homer. He would sport with a syllogism in sipping saint Pere, but unravel an argument over Claude de Vougeot, and upset a theory in a torrent of Chabertin. Well, had it been if the same quick sense of propriety had attended him in the peddling propensity to which I have formerly alluded, but this was by no means the case indeed to say the truth that trait of mind in the philosophic bonbon did begin at length to assume a character of strange intensity and mysticism and appeared deeply tinctured with the diablerie of his favourite german studies to enter the little caf in the cul de sac le febre was at the period of our tale to enter the sanctum of a man of genius bonbon was a man of genius there was not a sous cuisinier in rouen who could not have told you that bonbon was a man of genius his very cat knew it and forbore to whisk her tail in the presence of the man of genius his large water-dog was acquainted with the fact and upon the approach of his master betrayed his sense of inferiority by a sanctity of deportment a debasement of the ears and a dropping of the lower jaw not altogether unworthy of a dog it is however true that much of this habitual respect might have been attributed to the personal appearance of the metaphysician a distinguished exterior will uh, i am constrained to say have its way even with a beast and i am willing to allow much in the outward man of the restaurateur calculated to impress the imagination of the quadruped there is a peculiar majesty about the atmosphere of the little grates if i may be permitted so equivocal an expression which mere physical bulk alone will be found at all times inefficient in creating 
If, however, Bonbon was barely three feet in height, and if his head was diminutively small, still it was impossible to behold the rotundity of his stomach without a sense of magnificence nearly bordering upon the sublime. In its size, both dogs and men must have seen a type of his acquirements. In its immensity, a fitting habitation for his immortal soul. I might here, if it so pleased me, dilate upon the matter of habiliment and other mere circumstances of the external metaphysician. I might hint that the hair of our hero was worn short, combed smoothly over his forehead, and surmounted by a conical-shaped white flannel cap and tassels, that his pea-green jerkin was not after the fashion of those worn by the common class of restaurateurs at that day, that the sleeves were something fuller than the reigning costume permitted, that the cuffs were turned up, not as usual in that barbarous period, with cloth of the same quality and colour as the garment, but faced in a more fanciful manner with the party-coloured velvet of Genoa, that his slippers were of a bright purple curiously filigreed and might have been manufactured in japan but for the exquisite pointing of the toes and the brilliant tints of the binding and embroidery that his uh, breeches were of the yellow satin-like material called aimable that his sky-blue cloak resembling in form a dressing wrapper and richly bestudded all over with crimson devices floated cavalierly upon his shoulders like a mist of the morn and that his tout ensemble gave rise to the remarkable words of Benevenuta, the improvisatrice of Florence, that it was difficult to say whether Pierre Bonbon was indeed a bird of paradise, or rather a very paradise of perfection. I might, I say, expatiate upon all these points if I pleased, but I forbear, merely personal details may be left to historical novelists. They are beneath the moral dignity of matter of fact. I have said that to enter the café in the cul de sac le fèbre was to enter the sanctum of a man of genius. But then it was only the man of genius who could duly estimate the merits of the sanction, a sign consisting of a vast folio swung before the entrance. On one side of the volume was painted a bottle, on the reverse a pate. On the back were visible in large letters, œuvre de bonbon. Thus was delicately shadowed for the twofold occupation of the proprietor. Upon stepping over the threshold, the whole interior of the building presented itself to view. A long, low-pitched room of antique construction was indeed all the accommodation afforded by the café. In a corner of the apartment stood the bed of the metaphysician, an army of curtains, together with a canopy à la craig, gave it an air at once classic and comfortable. In the corner, diagonally opposite, appeared in direct family communion the properties of the kitchen and the bibliotheque. A dish of polemix stood peacefully upon the dresser. Here lay an ovenful of the latest ethics, there a kettle of dudecimo melanges. Volumes of German morality were hand and glove with the gridiron. A toasting fork might be discovered by the side of Eusebius. Plato reclined at his ease in the frying pan, and contemporary manuscripts were filed away upon the spit. In other respects, the Café de Bonbon might be said to differ little from the usual restaurants of the period. A fireplace yawned opposite the door. On the right of the fireplace, an open cupboard displayed a formidable array of labelled bottles. It was here, about twelve o'clock one night, during the severe winter, the comments of his neighbours upon his singular propensity, that Pierre Bonbon, I say, having turned them all out of his house, locked the door upon them with an oath, and betook himself in no very pacific mood to the comfort of a letter-bottomed armchair and a fire of blazing faggots. It was one of those terrific nights which are only met with once or twice during a century. 
It snowed fiercely, and the house tottered to its centre with the floods of wind that, rushing through the crannies in the wall and pouring impetuously down the chimney, shook awfully the curtains of the philosopher's bed and disorganised the economy of his paid pans and papers. The huge folio sign that swung without, exposed to the fury of the tempest, creaked ominously and gave out a moaning sound from its stanchions of solid oak. End of section 8 Recording by Simon Smoke Section 9 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Why the Little Frenchman Wears His Hand in a Sling, Part 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. It was in no placid temper, I say, that the metaphysician drew up his chair to its customary station by the hearth. Many circumstances of a perplexing nature had occurred during the day to disturb the serenity of his meditations. In attempting des oeufs à la princesse, he had unfortunately perpetrated an omelette à la reine, the discovery of a principle in ethics had been frustrated by the overturning of a stew. At last, not least, he had been thwarted in one of those admirable bargains which he at all times took such a special delight in bringing to a successful termination. But in the chafing of his mind at these unaccountable vicissitudes, there did not fail to be mingled some degree of that nervous anxiety which the fury of a boisterous night is so well calculated to produce. Whistling to his more immediate vicinity the large black water-dog we have spoken of before, and settling himself uneasily in his chair, he could not help casting a wary and unquiet eye toward those distant recesses of the apartment, whose inexorable shadows not even the red firelight itself could more than partially succeed in overcoming. Having completed a scrutiny whose exact purpose was perhaps unintelligible to himself, he drew close to his seat a small table covered with books and papers and soon became absorbed in the task of retouching a voluminous manuscript intended for publication on the morrow. He had been thus occupied for some minutes when— "'I am in no hurry, Monsieur Bonbon,' suddenly whispered a whining voice in the apartment. "'The devil!' ejaculated our hero, starting to his feet, overturning the table at his side, and staring around him in astonishment. "'Very true,' calmly replied the voice. "'Very true? What is very true?' "'How came you here?' vociferated the metaphysician, as his eye fell upon something which lay stretched at full length upon the bed. "'I was saying,' said the intruder, without attending the interrogatives, "'I was saying that I am not at all pushed for time, that the business upon which I took the liberty of calling is of no pressing importance. In short, that I can very well wait until you have finished your exposition.' "'My exposition? There, now, how do you know? How came you to understand that I was writing an exposition? Good God!' "'Hush!' replied the figure in a shrill undertone, and arising quickly from the bed he made a single step toward our hero, while an iron lamp that depended overhead swung convulsively back from his approach. The philosopher's amazement did not prevent a narrow scrutiny of the stranger's dress and appearance. The outlines of his figure, exceedingly lean, but much above the common height, were rendered minutely distinct by means of a faded suit of black cloth which fitted tight to the skin, but was otherwise cut very much in the style of a century ago. 
These garments had evidently been intended for a much shorter person than their present owner. His ankles and wrists were left naked for several inches. In his shoes, however, a pair of very brilliant buckles gave the lie to the extreme poverty implied by the other portions of his dress. His head was bare and entirely bald, with the exception of a hinder part, from which depended a queue of considerable length. A pair of green spectacles with side-glasses protected his eyes from the influence of the light, and at the same time prevented our hero from ascertaining either their color or their conformation. About the entire person there was no evidence of a shirt, but a white cravat of filthy appearance was tied with extreme precision around the throat, and the ends hanging down formally side by side gave, although I dare say unintentionally, the idea of an ecclesiastic. Indeed, many other points, both in his appearance and demeanor, might have very well sustained a conception of that nature. Over his left ear he carried, after the fashion of a modern clerk, an instrument resembling the stylus of the ancients, in a breast pocket of his coat appeared conspicuously a small black volume, fastened with clasps of steel. This book, whether accidentally or not, was so turned outwardly from the person as to discover the words Rituel Catholique in white letters upon the back. Our physiognomy was interestingly saturnine, even cadaverously pale. The forehead was lofty and deeply furrowed with the ridges of contemplation. The corners of the mouth were drawn down into an expression of the most submissive humility. There was also a clasping of the hands. As he stepped toward our hero, a deep sigh, and altogether a look of such utter sanctity, as could not have failed to be unequivocally prepossessing. Every shadow of anger faded from the countenance of the metaphysician, as, having completed a satisfactory survey of his visitor's person, he shook him cordially by the hand and conducted him to a seat. There would, however, be a radical error in attributing this instantaneous transition of feeling in the philosopher any one of those causes which might naturally be supposed to have had an influence. Indeed, Pierre Bonbon, from what I have been able to understand of his disposition, was of all men the least likely to be imposed upon by any speciousness of exterior deportment. It was impossible that so acute an observer of men and things should have failed to discover, upon the moment, the real character of the personage who had thus intruded upon his hospitality. To say no more, the conformation of the visitor's feet was sufficiently remarkable. He maintained lightly upon his head an inordinately tall hat. There was a tremendous swelling about the hinder parts of his breeches, and the vibration of his coat-tail was a palpable fact. Judge, then, with what feelings of satisfaction our hero found himself thrown thus at once into the society of a person for whom he had at all times entertained the most unqualified respect. He was, however, too much of the diplomatist to let escape from him any intimation of his suspicions in regard to the true state of affairs. It was not his cue to appear at all conscious of the high honor he thus unexpectedly enjoyed, but by leading his guest into the conversation to elicit some important ethical ideas which might, in obtaining a place in his contemplated publication, enlighten the human race, and at the same time immortalize himself, ideas which, I should have added, his visitor's great age and well-known proficiency in the science of morals might very well have enabled him to afford. Actuated by these enlightened views, 
Our hero bade the gentleman sit down, while he himself took occasion to throw some faggots upon the fire, and place upon the now re-established table some bottles of mousseau. Having quickly completed these operations, he drew his chair vis-à-vis -vis to his companions, and waited until the latter should open the conversation. But plans, even the most skillfully matured, are often thwarted in the outset of their application, and the restaurateur found himself nonplussed by the very first words of his visitor's speech. "'I see you know me, Bonbon,' said he. "'Ha, ha, ha! Eh, he, he, he! Ho, ho, ho! Hoo, hoo, hoo!' And the devil, dropping at once the sanctity of his demeanor, opened to its fullest extent a mouth from ear to ear so as to display a set of jagged and fang-like teeth and throwing back his head laughed long loudly wickedly and uproariously while the black dog crouching down upon his haunches joined lustily in the chorus and the tabby cat flying off at a tangent stood up on end and shrieked in the farthest corner of the apartment not so the philosopher. He was too much a man of the world, either to laugh like the dog, or by shrieks to betray the indecorous trepidation of the cat. It must be confessed, he felt a little astonishment to see the white letters which formed the words Rituel Catholique on the book in his guest's pocket, momently changing both their color and their import and in a few seconds in place of the original title the words registre de condamned blazed forth in characters of red this startling circumstance when bonbon replied to his visitor's remark imparted to his manner an air of embarrassment which probably might not otherwise have been observed why, sir, said the philosopher, why, sir, to speak sincerely, I, I imagine I have some faint, some very faint idea of the remarkable honor. Oh, ah, yes, very well, interrupted his majesty. Say no more. I see how it is. And hereupon, taking off his green spectacles, he wiped the glasses carefully with the sleeve of his coat and deposited them in his pocket. If Bonbon had been astonished by the incident of the book, his amazement was now much increased by the spectacle which here presented itself to view. In raising his eyes with a strong feeling of curiosity to ascertain the color of his guests, he found them by no means black as he had anticipated, nor gray as might have been imagined, nor yet hazel nor blue, nor indeed yellow, nor red, nor purple, nor white, nor green, nor any other color in the heavens above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters upon the earth. In short, Pierre Bonbon not only saw plainly that His Majesty had no eyes whatsoever, but could discover no indications of their having existed at any previous period, for the space where eyes should naturally have been was— I am constrained to say, simply a dead level of flesh. It was not in the nature of the metaphysician to forbear making some inquiry into the sources of so strange a phenomenon, and the reply of his majesty was at once prompt, dignified, and satisfactory. Eyes. My dear Bonbon, eyes, did you say? Oh, I, I perceive. The ridiculous prints, eh, which are in circulation, have given you a false idea of my personal appearance. Eyes, true. Eyes, Pierre Bonbon, are very well in their proper place. That you would say is in the head, right? The head of a worm? To you, likewise, these optics are indispensable. Yet I will convince you that my vision is more penetrating than your own. There is a cat I can see in the corner. A pretty cat. Look at her. Observe her well. Now, Bonbon, do you behold the thoughts, the thoughts, I say, the ideas, the reflections, which are being engendered in her pericranium? There it is, now, you do not. She is thinking we admire the length of her tail, and the profundity of her mind, 
she has just conceived that i am the most distinguished of ecclesiastics that you are the most superficial of metaphysicians thus you see i am not altogether blind but to one of my profession the eyes you speak of would be merely an encumbrance liable at any time to be put out by a toasting iron or a pitchfork to you i allow these optical affairs are indispensable endeavor bonbon to use them well my vision is the soul hereupon the guest helped himself to the wine upon the table and pouring out a bumper for bonbon requested him to drink it without scruple and make himself perfectly at home a clever book of yours pierre resumed his majesty tapping our friend knowingly upon the shoulder as the latter put down his glass after a thorough compliance with his visitor's injunction a clever book that of yours upon my honour it's a work after my own heart your arrangement of the matter i think however might be improved and many of your notions remind me of aristotle that philosopher was one of my most intimate acquaintances i liked him as much for his terrible ill temper as for his happy knack at making a blunder there is only one solid truth in all that he has written and for that i gave him the hint out of pure compassion for his absurdity i suppose pierre bonbon you very well know to what divine moral truth i am alluding cannot say that i indeed why it was i who told aristotle that by sneezing men expelled superfluous ideas through the proboscis which is undoubtedly the case said the metaphysician while he poured out for himself another bumper of mousseau and offered his snuff-box to the fingers of his visitor there was plato too continued his majesty modestly declining the snuff-box and the compliment it implied there was plato too for whom i at one time felt all the affection of a friend you knew plato bonbon ah no i beg a thousand pardons he met me at athens one day in the parthenon and told me he was distressed for an idea i bade him write down that o nu estran alu he said he would do so and went home while i stepped over to the pyramids but my conscience smote me for having uttered a truth even to aid a friend and hastened back to athens i arrived behind the philosopher's chair as he was inditing the alu giving the lambda a flip with my finger i turned it upside down so the sentence now read o nu esten august that is you perceive the fundamental doctrines in his metaphysics were you ever to rome asked the restaurateur as he finished his second bottle of mousseau and drew from the closet a larger supply of chambotin but once monsieur bonbon but once there was a time said the devil as if reciting some passage from a book there was a time when occurred an anarchy of five years during which the republic bereft of all its officers had no magistracy besides the tribunes of the people and these were not legally vested with any degree of executive power at that time monsieur bonbon at that time only was i in rome and i have no earthly acquaintance consequently with any of its philosophy note two il écrivain sur la philosophie cicero lucretius seneca mais c'est à la philosophie grecque condorcet what do you think of what do you think of <laughs> epicurus what do i think of whom said the devil in astonishment you cannot surely mean to find any fault with epicurus what do i think of epicurus do you mean me sir i am epicurus i am the same philosopher who wrote each of the three hundred treatises commemorated by diogenes laertes that's a lie said the metaphysician for the wine had gotten a little into his head very well sir very well sir very well indeed sir said his majesty apparently much flattered that's a lie repeated the restaurateur dogmatically that's a, big, a lie well well have it your own way said the devil pacifically and bonbon having beaten his majesty at argument thought it his duty to conclude a second bottle of chambertin as i was saying resumed the visitor as i was observing a little while ago there are some very outre notions in that book of yours monsieur bonbon 
"'What, for instance, do you mean by all that humbug about the soul? "'Pray, sir, what is the soul?' "'The <coughs> soul,' replied the metaphysician, referring to his manuscripts, "'is undoubtedly no, sir. "'Indubitably no, sir. "'Indisputably no, sir. "'Evidently no, sir. "'Incontrovertibly no, sir. <coughs> "'No, sir.' and beyond all question is a no sir the soul is no such thing here the philosopher looking daggers took occasion to make an end upon the spot of his third bottle of chambertin then pray sir what what is it that is neither here nor there monsieur bonbon replied his majesty musingly i have tasted uh, that is to say I have known some very bad souls, and some, too, pretty good ones. Here he smacked his lips, and, having unconsciously let fall his hand upon the volume in his pocket, was seized with a violent fit of sneezing. He continued, There was the soul of Cratinus, passable, Aristophanes, racy, Plato, exquisite, not your Plato, but Plato the comic poet, your Plato would have turned the stomach of Cerberus. Fah! Then let me see. There were Navius, and Andronicus, and Plautus, and Ternetius. Then there was Lucilius, and Castulus, and Nasso, and Quintus Flaccus. Oh, Quinty, as I called him, when he sung A Seculaire for my amusement, while I toasted him, in pure good humor, on a fork. But they want flavor, these Romans. One fat Greek is worth a dozen of them. Besides, we'll keep, which cannot be said of a queerite. Let us taste your sauterne. Bonbon had by this time made up his mind to kneel Ademari, and endeavored to hand down the bottle in question. He was, however, conscious of a strange sound in the room, like the wagging of a tail. Of this, although extremely indecent in his majesty, the philosopher took no notice, simply kicking the dog and requesting him to be quiet. The visitor continued. I found that Horace tasted very much like Aristotle. You know, I am fond of variety. Ternetius I could not have told from Menander. Nasso, to my astonishment, was Nysander in disguise. Virgilius had a strong twang of Theocritus. Marshall put me much in mind of Archilochus and titus livius was positively polybius and none other <coughs> here replied bonbon and his majesty proceeded but if i have a penchant monsieur bonbon if i have a penchant it is for a philosopher yet let me tell you sir it is not every div i mean it is not every gentleman who knows how to choose a philosopher long ones are not good and the best, if not carefully shelled, are apt to be a little rancid on account of the gall. Shelled? I mean, taken out of the carcass. What do you think of a <coughs> physician? Don't mention them. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Here his majesty retched violently. I never tasted but one. That rascal Hippocrates smelt of asaphodia. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Caught me a wretched cold washing him in the sticks, and after all he gave me the cholera morbus. The wretch, ejaculated Bonbon, the absorption of a pill-box, and the philosopher dropped a tear. After all, continued the visitor, after all, if a, diff if a gentleman wishes to live, he must have more talents than one or two, and with us a fat face is an evidence of diplomacy. How so? Why, we are sometimes exceedingly pushed for provisions. You must know that in a climate so sultry as mine it is frequently impossible to keep a spirit alive for more than two or three hours. And after death, unless picked immediately, and a pickled spirit is not good, they will smell, you understand, eh? Putrefaction is always to be apprehended when the souls are consigned to us in the usual way. Pick up! Pick up! Good God! How do you manage? Here the iron lamp commenced swinging with redoubled vigor, and the devil half started from his seat. However, with a slight sigh, he recovered his composure, merely saying to our hero in a low tone, 
"'I tell you what, Pierre Bonbon, we must have no more swearing.' The host swallowed another bumper, by the way of denoting thorough comprehension and acquiescence, and the visitor continued. "'Why, there are several ways of managing. The most of us starve. Some put up with the pickle. For my part, I purchase my spirits vivente corpore, in which case I find the keep very well. But the body! The body! The body! The body! Well, what of the body?' Oh, ah, I perceive. Why, sir, the body is not at all affected by the transaction. I have made innumerable purchases of the kind in my day, and the parties never experienced any inconvenience. There were Cain, and Nimrod, and Nero, and Caligula, and Dionysus, and Pisistratus, and, and a thousand others, who never knew what it was to have a soul during the latter part of their lives, Yet, sir, these men adorned society. Why possession of his faculties, mental and corporeal? Who writes a keener epigram? Who reasons more wittily? Who— But stay, I have his agreement in my pocket-book. Thus saying, he produced a red leather wallet, and took from it a number of papers. Upon some of these, Bonbon caught a glimpse of the letters, Machi, Maza, Robespe, with the words Caligula, George, Elizabeth, His Majesty selected a narrow slip of parchment, and from it read aloud the following words. In consideration of certain mental endowments, which it is unnecessary to specify, and in further consideration of one thousand louis d'or, I, being aged one year and one month, do hereby make over to the bearer of this agreement all my right title and appurtenance in the shadow called my soul signed a note four kier arroway here his majesty repeated a name which i did not feel justified in indicating more unequivocally a clever fellow that resumed he but like you monsieur bonbon he was mistaken about the soul the soul a shadow truly the soul a shadow ha 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 only think of a fricasseed shadow only think of a fricasseed shadow exclaimed our hero whose faculties were becoming much illuminated by the profundity of his majesty's discourse only think of a fricasseed shadow now damn humph if i would have been such a nincompoop my soul, Mr. Hup! Your soul, Monsieur Bonbon? Yes, sir. Hiccup! My soul is. What, sir? No shadow, damn? Did you mean to say? Yes, sir. My soul is. Hup! Humph! Yes, sir. Did you not intend to assert? My soul is. Hiccup! Peculiarly qualified for a. Hiccup! Ah! Uh, what, sir? Stew! Ha! Souffle? Eh! Fricassee, indeed. Ragout and fricandeau, and see here, my good fellow, I let you have it. A bargain. Here the philosopher slapped his majesty upon the back. Couldn't think of any such thing, said the latter calmly, at the same time rising from his seat. The metaphysician stared. I'm supplied at present, said his majesty. Eh, said the philosopher. Have no funds on hand. What? Besides, very unhandsome in me, sir, to take advantage of Hiccup! your present disgusting and ungentlemanly situation. Here the visitor bowed and withdrew, in what manner could not be precisely ascertained, but in a well concerted effort to discharge a bottle at the villain, the slender chain was severed that depended from the ceiling and the metaphysician prostrated by the downfall of the lamp. End of section 9 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com Section 10 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Phil Schempf. Some Words with a Mummy by Edgar Allan Poe. The symposium of the preceding evening had been a little too much for my nerves. I had a wretched headache and was desperately drowsy. Instead of going out, therefore, to spend the evening as I had proposed, it occurred to me that I could not do a wiser thing than just eat a mouthful of supper and go immediately to bed. A light supper, of course. I am exceedingly fond of Welsh rabbit. More than a pound at once, however, may not at all times be advisable. Still, there can be no material objection to two. And, really, between two and three there is merely a single unit of difference. I ventured, perhaps, upon four. My wife will have a five, but clearly she has confounded two very distinct affairs. The abstract number five, I am willing to admit, but concretely it has reference to bottles of brown stout, without which, in the way of condiment, Welsh rabbit is to be eschewed. Having thus concluded a frugal meal and donned my nightcap, with a serene hope of enjoying it till noon the next day, I placed my head upon the pillow, and, through the aid of a capital conscience, fell into a profound slumber forthwith. But when were the hopes of humanity fulfilled? I could not have completed my third snore, when there came a furious ringing at the street door bell, and then an impatient thumping at the knocker, which awakened me at once. In a minute afterward, and while I was still rubbing my eyes, my wife thrust in my face a note from my old friend Dr. Poniner. It ran thus. Come to me by all means, my dear good friend, as soon as you receive this. Come and help us rejoice. At last, by long persevering diplomacy, I have gained the assent of the directors of the City Museum to my examination of the mummy. You know the one I mean. I have permission to unswathe it and open it, if desirable. A few friends only will be present, you of course. The mummy is now at my house, and we shall begin to enroll it at eleven tonight. Yours ever, Poniner. By the time I had reached the Poniner, it struck me that I was as wide awake as a man need be. I leapt out of bed in an ecstasy, overthrowing all in my way, dressed myself with a rapidity truly marvellous, and set off at the top of my speed for the doctors. There I found a very eager company assembled. They had been awaiting me with much impatience. The mummy was extended upon the dining table, and the moment I entered its examination was commenced. It was one of a pair brought several years previously by Captain Arthur Sabertash, a cousin of Poniner's from a tomb near El Aethius in the Libyan mountains, a considerable distance above Thebes on the Nile. The grottoes at this point, although less magnificent than the Theban sepulchres, are of higher interest, on account of affording more numerous illustrations of the private life of the Egyptians. The chamber from which our specimen was taken was said to be very rich in such illustrations the walls being completely covered with fresco paintings and bas-reliefs, while statues, vases, and mosaic work of rich patterns indicated the vast wealth of the deceased. The treasure had been deposited in the museum precisely in the same condition in which Captain Sabertash had found it. That is to say, the coffin had not been disturbed. For eight years it had thus stood, subject only externally to public inspection. We had now, therefore, the complete mummy at our disposal, and, to those who are aware of how very rarely the unransacked antique reaches our shores, it will be evident at once that we had great reason to congratulate ourselves upon our good fortune. Approaching the table, I saw on it a large box, or case, nearly seven feet long, and perhaps three feet wide, by two feet and a half deep. It was oblong, not coffin-shaped. The material was at first supposed to be the wood of the sycamore, platanus, but upon cutting into it we found it to be pasteboard, or, more properly, papier-mâché, composed of papyrus. It was thickly ornamented with paintings representing funeral scenes and other mournful subjects, interspersed among which, in every variety of position, were certain series of hieroglyphical characters, intended, no doubt, for the name of the departed. By good luck, Mr. Glidden formed one of our party. 
and he had no difficulty in translating the letters which were simply phonetic and represented the word alamastakio we had some difficulty in getting this case open without injury but having at length accomplished the task we came to a second coffin-shaped and very considerably less in size than the exterior one but resembling it precisely in every other respect the interval between the two was filled with resin which had in some degree defaced the colors of the interior box upon opening this latter which we did quite easily we arrived at a third case also coffin-shaped and varying from the second one in no particular except in that of its material which was cedar and still emitted the peculiar and highly aromatic odor of that wood between the second and third case there was no interval the one fitting accurately within the other removing the third case we discovered and took out the body itself we had expected to find it as usual enveloped in frequent rolls or bandages of linen but in place of these we found a sort of sheath made of papyrus and coated with a layer of plaster thickly gilt and painted the paintings represented subjects connected with the various supposed duties of the soul and its presentation to different divinities with numerous identical human figures intended very probably as portraits of the persons embalmed extending from head to foot was a columnar or perpendicular inscription in phonetic hieroglyphics giving again his name and titles and the names and titles of his relations around the neck thus ensheathed was a collar of cylindrical glass beads diverse in color and so arranged as to form images of deities of the scarabareus etc with the winged globe around the small of the waist was a similar collar or belt stripping off the papyrus we found the flesh in excellent preservation with no perceptible odor the color was reddish the skin was hard smooth and glossy the teeth and hair were in good condition the eyes it seemed had been removed and glass ones substituted which were very beautiful and wonderfully lifelike with the exception of somewhat too determined a stare the fingers and the nails were brilliantly gilded mr glidden was of the opinion from the redness of the epidermis that the embalmment had been effected altogether by asphaltum but on scraping the surface with a steel instrument and throwing into the fire some of the powder thus obtained the flavor of camphor and other sweet scented gums became apparent we searched the corpse very carefully for the usual openings through which the entrails are extracted but to our surprise we could discover none no member of the party was at that period aware that entire or unopened mummies are not infrequently met the brain it was customary to withdraw through the nose the intestines through an incision in the side the body was then shaved washed and salted then laid aside for several weeks when the operation of embalming properly so called began as no trace of an opening could be found dr poniner was preparing his instruments for dissection when i observed that it was past two o'clock hereupon it was agreed to postpone the internal examination until the next evening and we were about to separate for the present when some one suggested an experiment or two with the voltaic pile the application of electricity to a mummy three or four thousand years old at least was an idea if not very sage still sufficiently original that we all caught it at once about one-tenth in earnest and nine-tenths in jest we arranged a battery in the doctor's study and conveyed thither the egyptian it was only after much trouble that we succeeded in laying bare some portions of the temporal muscle which appeared of less stony rigidity than other parts of the frame but which as we had anticipated of course gave no indication of galvanic susceptibility when brought in contact with the wire this the first trial indeed seemed decisive and with a hearty laugh at our own absurdity we were bidding each other good night when my eyes happening to fall upon those of the mummy were there immediately riveted in amazement my brief glance in fact had sufficed to assure me that the orbs which we had all supposed to be glass and which were originally noticeable for a certain wild stare were now so far covered by the lids that only a small portion of the tunica albuginea remained visible with a shout 
I called attention to the fact, and it became immediately obvious to all. I cannot say that I was alarmed at the phenomena, because alarmed is, in my case, not exactly the word. It is possible, however, that, but for the brown stout, I might have been a little nervous. As for the rest of the company, they really made no attempt at concealing the downright fright which possessed them. Dr. Poniner was a man to be pitied. Mr. Glidden, by some peculiar process, rendered himself invisible. Mr. Silk Buckingham, I fancy, will scarcely be so bold as to deny that he made his way upon all fours under the table. After the first shock of astonishment, however, we resolved as a matter of course upon further experiment forthwith. Our operations were now directed against the great toe of the right foot. We made an incision over the outside of the exterior os sesamoidium polices pedis, and thus got at the root of the abductor muscle. Readjusting the battery, we now applied the fluid to the bisected nerves, when, with a moment of exceeding lifelikeness, the mummy first drew up its right knee so as to bring it nearly in contact with the abdomen, and then, straightening the limb with inconceivable force, bestowed a kick upon Dr. Poniner, which had the effect of discharging that gentleman, like an arrow from a catapult, through a window into the street below. We rushed out en masse to bring in the mangled remains of the victim, but had the happiness to meet him upon the staircase, coming up in an unaccountable hurry, brimful of the most ardent philosophy, and more than ever impressed with the necessity of prosecuting our experiment with vigor and with zeal. It was by his advice, accordingly, that we made, upon the spot, a profound incision into the tip of the subject's nose, while the doctor himself, laying violent hands upon it, pulled it into vehement contact with the wire. Morally and physically, figuratively and literally, was the effect electric. In the first place, the corpse opened its eyes and winked very rapidly for several minutes, as does Mr. Barnes in the pantomime. In the second place, it sneezed. In the third, it sat upon end. In the fourth, it shook its fist in Dr. Poniner's face. In the fifth, turning to Messrs. Glidden and Buckingham, it addressed them in very capital Egyptian thus. I must say, gentlemen, that I am as much surprised as I am mortified at your behavior. Of Dr. Poniner, nothing better was to be expected. He is a poor little fat fool who knows no better. I pity and forgive him. But you, Mr. Glidden, and you, Silk, who have traveled and resided in Egypt until one might imagine you to the manner born, you, I say, who have been so much among us that you speak Egyptian fully as well, I think, as you write your mother tongue. You, who I have always been led to regard as the firm friend of the mummies, I really did anticipate more gentlemanly conduct from you. What am I to think of your standing quietly by and seeing me thus unhandsomely used? What am I to suppose by your permitting Tom, Dick, and Harry to strip me of my coffins, and my clothes, in this wretchedly cold climate? In what light, to come to the point, am I to regard your aiding and abetting that miserable little villain, Dr. Poniner, in pulling me by the nose? It will be taken for granted, no doubt, that upon hearing this speech, under the circumstances, we all either made for the door, or fell into violent hysterics, or went off in a general swoon. One of these three things was, I say, to be expected, Indeed, each and all of these lines of conduct might have been very plausibly pursued, and upon my word I am at a loss to know how or why it was that we pursued neither the one nor the other. But perhaps the true reason is to be sought in the spirit of the age, which proceeds by the rule of contraries altogether, and is now usually admitted as the solution of everything in the way of paradox and impossibility. Or, Perhaps, after all, it was only the mummy's exceedingly natural and matter-of-course air that divested his words of the terrible. However this may be, the facts are clear, and no member of our party betrayed any very particular trepidation, or seemed to consider that anything had gone very especially wrong. 
for my part i was convinced it was all right and merely stepped aside out of the range of the mummy's fist dr poniner thrust his hands into his breeches pockets looked hard at the mummy and grew excessively red in the face mr glidden stroked his whiskers and drew up the collar of his shirt mr buckingham hung down his head and put his right thumb into the left corner of his mouth the egyptian regarded him with a severe countenance for some minutes and at length with a sneer said why don't you speak mr buckingham did you hear what i asked you or not do take your thumb out of your mouth mr buckingham hereupon gave a slight start took his right thumb out of the left corner of his mouth and by way of indemnification inserted his left thumb in the right corner of the aperture above mentioned not being able to get an answer from mr b the figure turned peevishly to mr glidden and in a peremptory tone demanded in general terms what we all meant mr glidden replied at great length in phonetics and but for the deficiency of american printing offices in hieroglyphic type it would afford me much pleasure to record here in the original the whole of his very excellent speech i may as well take this occasion to remark that all the subsequent conversation in which the mummy took part was carried on in primitive egyptian through the medium so far as concerned myself and other untravelled members of the company through the medium i say of messrs glidden and buckingham as interpreters these gentlemen spoke the mother tongue of the mummy with inimitable fluency and grace but i could not help observing that owing no doubt to the introduction of images entirely modern and of course entirely novel to the stranger that the two travellers were reduced occasionally to the employment of sensible forms for the purpose of conveying a particular meaning mr glidden at one period for example could not make the egyptian comprehend the term politics until he sketched upon the wall with a bit of charcoal a little carbuncle-nosed gentleman out at the elbows standing upon a stump with his left leg drawn back right arm thrown forward with his fist shut the eyes rolled up toward heaven and the mouth open at an angle of ninety degrees just in the same way mr buckingham failed to convey the absolute modern idea of wig until at dr poniner's suggestion he grew very pale in the face and consented to take off his own it will be readily understood that mr glidden's discourse turned chiefly upon the vast benefits accruing to science from the unrolling and disemboweling of mummies apologizing upon this score for any disturbance that might have been occasioned him in particular the individual mummy called alamastachio and concluding with a mere hint for it could scarcely be considered more that as these little manners were now explained it might be well to proceed with the investigation intended here dr poniner made ready his instruments in regard to the latter suggestion of the orator it appears that alla mustachio had certain scruples of conscience the nature of which i did not distinctly learn but he expressed himself satisfied with the apologies tendered and getting down from the table shook hands with the company all round when this ceremony was at an end we immediately busied ourselves in repairing the damages which our subject had sustained from the scalpel we sewed up the wound in his temple bandaged his foot and applied a square inch of black plaster to the tip of his nose it was now observed that the count this was the title it seems of alamastachio had a slight fit of shivering no doubt from the cold the doctor immediately repaired to his wardrobe and soon returned with a black dress coat made in jennings best manner a pair of sky-blue plaid pantaloons with straps a pink gingham chemise a flapped vest of brocade a white sack overcoat a walking cane with a hook a hat with no brim patent leather boots straw-colored kid gloves an eyeglass a pair of whiskers and a waterfall cravat owing to the disparity of size between the count and the doctor the proportion being as two to one there was some little difficulty in adjusting these habiliments upon the person of the egyptian but when all was arranged he might have been said to be dressed mr glidden therefore gave him his arm and led him to a comfortable chair by the fire 
while the doctor rang the bell upon the spot and ordered a supply of cigars and wine the conversation soon grew animated much curiosity was of course expressed in regard to the somewhat remarkable fact of all of Mustachio's still remaining alive i should have thought observed mr buckingham that it is high time you were dead why replied the count very much astonished i am little more than seven hundred years old my father lived a thousand and was by no means in his dotage when he died here ensued a brisk series of questions and computations by means of which it became evident that the antiquity of the mummy had been grossly misjudged it had been five thousand and fifty years and some months since he had been consigned to the catacombs at elaetheus but my remark resumed mr buckingham had no reference to your age at the period of interment i am willing to grant in fact that you are still a young man and my allusion was to the immensity of time during which by your own showing you must have been done up in asphaltum in what said the count in asphaltum persisted mr b ah yes i have some faint notion of what you mean it might be made to answer no doubt but in my time we employed scarcely anything else than the bichloride of mercury but what we are especially at a loss to understand said dr Poninger, is how it happens that having been dead and buried in egypt five thousand years ago you are here to-day all alive and looking so delightfully well had i been as you say dead replied the count it is more than probable that dead i should still be for i perceive you are yet in the infancy of calvinism and cannot accomplish with it what was a common thing among us in the old days but the fact is i fell into catalepsy and it was considered by my best friends that i was either dead or should be they accordingly embalmed me at once i presume you are aware of the chief principle of the embalming process why not altogether why i perceive a deplorable condition of ignorance well i cannot enter into details just now but it is necessary to explain that to embalm properly speaking in egypt was to arrest indefinitely all the animal functions subjected to the process i use the word animal in its widest sense as including the physical not more than the moral and vital being i repeat that the leading principle of embalmment consisted with us in the immediately arresting and holding in perpetual abeyance all the animal functions subjected to the process to be brief in whatever condition the individual was at the period of embalmment in that condition he remained now as it is my good fortune to be of the blood of the scarabarius i was embalmed alive as you see me at present the blood of the scarabarius exclaimed dr poninger yes the scarabarius was the insignium or the arms of a very distinguished and very rare patrician family to be of the blood of the scarabarius is merely to be one of that family of which the scarabarius is the insignium i speak figuratively but what has this to do with you being alive why it is the general custom in egypt to deprive a corpse before embalmment of its bowels and brains the race of the scarabarii alone did not coincide with the custom had i not been a scarabarius therefore i should have been without bowels and brains and without either it is inconvenient to live i perceive that said mr buckingham and i presume that all the entire mummies that come to hand are of the race of the scarabarii beyond doubt i thought said mr glidden very meekly that the scarabarius was one of the egyptian gods one of the egyptian what exclaimed the mummy starting to its feet gods repeated the traveller mr glidden i really am astonished to hear you talk in this style said the count resuming his chair no nation upon the face of the earth has ever acknowledged more than one god the scarabarius 
the ibis etc were to us as similar creatures have been with others the symbols or media through which we offered worship to the creator too august to be more directly approached there was here a pause at length the colloquy was renewed by dr ponnoner it is not improbable then from what you have explained said he that among the catacombs near the nile there may exist other mummies of the scarabarius tribe in a condition of vitality there can be no question of it replied the count all the scarabarii embalmed accidentally while alive are alive now even some of those purposely so embalmed may have been overlooked by their executors and still remain in the tomb will you be kind enough to explain i said what you mean by purposely so embalmed with great pleasure answered the mummy after surveying me leisurely through his eyeglass for it was the first time i had ventured to address him a direct question with great pleasure he said the usual duration of a man's life in my time was about eight hundred years few men died unless by most extraordinary accident before the age of six hundred few lived longer than a decade of centuries but eight were considered the natural term after the discovery of the embalming principle as i have already described it to you it occurred to our philosophers that a laudable curiosity might be gratified and at the same time the interest of science much advanced by living this natural term in installments in the case of history indeed experience demonstrated that something of this kind was indispensable an historian for example having attained the age of five hundred would write a book with great labor and then get himself carefully embalmed leaving instructions to his executors pro tem that they should cause him to be revivified after the lapse of a certain period say five or six hundred years resuming existence at the expiration of this time he would invariably find his great work converted into a species of haphazard notebook that is to say into a kind of literary arena for the conflicting guesses riddles and personal squabbles of whole herds of exasperated commentators these guesses etc which passed under the name of annotations or emendations were found so completely to have enveloped distorted and overwhelmed the text that the author had to go about with a lantern to discover his own book when discovered it was never worth the trouble of the search after rewriting it throughout it was regarded as the bounden duty of the historian to set himself to work immediately in correcting from his own private knowledge and experience the traditions of the day concerning the epoch at which he had originally lived now this process of rescription and personal rectification pursued by various individual sages from time to time had the effect of preventing our history from degenerating into absolute fable i beg your pardon said dr ponnoner at this point laying his hand gently upon the arm of the egyptian i beg your pardon sir but may i presume to interrupt you for one moment by all means sir replied the count drawing up i merely wish to ask you a question said the doctor you mentioned the historian's personal correction of the traditions respecting his own epoch pray sir upon an average what proportion of these cabala were usually found to be right the cabala as you properly term them sir were generally discovered to be precisely on a par with the facts recorded in the unrewritten histories themselves that is to say not one individual iota of either was ever known under any circumstances to not be totally and radically wrong but since it is quite clear resumed the doctor that at least five thousand years have elapsed since your entombment i take it for granted that your histories at that period if not your traditions were sufficiently explicit on that one topic of universal interest the creation which took place as i presume you are aware only about ten centuries before sir said the count alamastachio the doctor repeated his remarks but it was only after much additional explanation that the foreigner could be made to comprehend them the latter at length said hesitatingly the ideas you have suggested are to me i confess utterly novel 
during my time i never knew any one to entertain so singular a fancy as that the universe or this world if you would have it so ever had a beginning at all i remember once and only once hearing something remotely hinted by a man of many speculations concerning the origin of the human race and by this individual the very word adam or red earth which you make use of was employed he employed it however in a generical sense with reference to the spontaneous germination from rank soil just as a thousand of lower genera of creatures are germinated the spontaneous germination i say of five vast hordes of men simultaneously upspringing in five distinct and nearly equal divisions of the globe here in general the company shrugged their shoulders and one or two of us touched our foreheads with a very significant air mr silk buckingham first glancing slightly at the occiput and then at the sensiput of alamastachio spoke as follows the long duration of human life in your time together with the occasional practice of passing it as you have explained in installments must have had indeed a strong tendency to the general development and conglomeration of knowledge i presume therefore that we are to attribute the marked inferiority of the old egyptians in all particulars of science when compared with the moderns and more especially with the yankees altogether to the superior solidity of the egyptian skull i confess again replied the count with much suavity that i am somewhat at a loss to comprehend you pray to what particulars of science do you allude here our whole party joining voices detailed at great length the assumptions of phrenology and the marvels of animal magnetism having heard us to an end the count proceeded to relate a few anecdotes which rendered it evident that the prototypes of gaul and spurzheim had flourished and faded in egypt so long ago as to have been nearly forgotten and that the manoeuvres of mesmer were really very contemptible tricks when put in collation with the positive miracles of the theban savants who created lice and a great many other similar things i here asked the count if his people were able to calculate eclipses he smiled rather contemptuously and said they were this put me a little out but i began to make other inquiries in regard to his astronomical knowledge when a member of the company who had never as yet opened his mouth whispered in my ear that for information on this head i had better consult ptolemy whoever ptolemy is as well as one plutarch de fasci lunae i then questioned the mummy about burning glasses and lenses and in general about the manufacture of glass but i had not made an end to my queries before the silent member again touched me quietly on the elbow and begged me for god's sake to take a peep at diodorus siculus as for the count he merely asked me in the way of reply if we moderns possessed any such microscopes as would enable us to cut cameos in the style of the egyptians while i was thinking how i should answer this question little dr poniner committed himself in a very extraordinary way look at our architecture he exclaimed greatly to the indignation of both the travellers who pinched him black and blue to no purpose look he cried with enthusiasm at the bowling green fountain in new york or if this be too vast a contemplation regard for a moment the capitol at washington d c and the good little medical man went on to detail very minutely the proportions of the fabric to which he referred he explained that the portico alone was adorned with no less than four and twenty columns five feet in diameter and ten feet apart the count said that he regretted not being able to remember just at that moment the precise dimensions of any one of the principal buildings of the city of asnac whose foundations were laid in the night of time but the ruins of which were still standing at the epoch of his entombment in a vast plain of sand to the westward of thebes he recollected however talking of the porticos that one affixed to an inferior palace of a kind of suburb called karnak consisted of a hundred and forty-four columns thirty-seven feet in circumference and twenty-five feet apart the approach to this portico from the nile was through an avenue two miles long composed of sphinxes statues and obelisks twenty sixty 
and a hundred feet in height the palace itself as well as he could remember was in one direction two miles long and it might have been altogether about seven in circuit its walls were richly painted all over within and without with hieroglyphics he would not pretend to assert that even fifty or sixty of the doctor's capitals might have been built within these walls but he was by no means sure that the two or three hundred of them might not have been squeezed in with some trouble the palace at karnak was an insignificant little building after all he the count however could not conscientiously refuse to admit the ingenuity magnificence and superiority of the fountain at the bowling green as described by the doctor nothing like it he was forced to allow had ever been seen in egypt or elsewhere i here asked the count what he had to say to our railroads nothing he replied in particular they were rather slight rather ill-conceived and clumsily put together they could not be compared of course with the vast level direct iron grooved causeways upon which the egyptians conveyed entire temples and solid obelisks of a hundred and fifty feet in altitude i spoke of our gigantic mechanical forces he agreed that we knew something in that way but inquired how i should have gone to work in getting up the imposts on the lintels of even the little palace at karnak this question i concluded not to hear and demanded if he had any idea of artesian wells but he simply raised his eyebrows while mr glidden winked at me very hard and said in a low tone that one had been recently discovered by the engineers employed to bore for water in the great oasis i then mentioned our steel but the foreigner elevated his nose and asked me if our steel could have executed the sharp carved work seen on the obelisks and which had been wrought altogether by edge tools of copper this disconcerted us so greatly that we thought it advisable to vary the attack to metaphysics we sent for a copy of a book called the dial and read out a chapter or two about something that is not very clear which the bostonians call the great movement of progress the count merely said that the great movements were awfully common things in his day and as for progress it was at one time quite a nuisance but it never progressed we then spoke of the great beauty and importance of democracy and were at much trouble in impressing the count with a due sense of the advantages we enjoyed in living where there was suffrage ad libitum and no king he listened with marked interest and in fact seemed not a little amused when we had done he said that a great while ago there had occurred something of a very similar sort thirteen egyptian provinces determined all at once to be free and to set a magnificent example to the rest of mankind they assembled their wise men and concocted the most ingenious constitution it was possible to conceive for a while they managed remarkably well only their habit of bragging was prodigious the thing ended however in the consolidation of the thirteen states with some fifteen or twenty others in the most odious and insupportable despotism that was ever heard of upon the face of the earth i asked what was the name of the usurping tyrant as well as the count could recollect it was mob not knowing what to say to this i raised my voice and deplored the egyptian ignorance of steam the count looked at me with much astonishment but made no answer the silent gentleman however gave me a violent nudge in the ribs with his elbows told me i had sufficiently exposed myself for once and demanded if i was really such a fool as not to know that the modern steam engine is derived from the invention of hero through solomon de caus we were now in imminent danger of being discomfited but as good luck would have it dr ponner having rallied returned to our rescue and inquired if the people of egypt would seriously pretend to rival the moderns in the all-important particular of dress the count at this glanced downward to the straps of his pantaloons and then taking hold of the end of one of his coat-tails held it up close to his eyes for some minutes letting it fall at last his mouth extended itself very gradually from ear to ear but i do not remember that he said anything in the way of reply hereupon we recovered our spirits and the doctor approaching the mummy with great dignity desired it to say candidly upon its honour as a gentleman 
if the egyptians had comprehended at any period the manufacture of either poniner's lozenges or brandreth's pills we looked with profound anxiety for an answer but in vain it was not forthcoming the egyptian blushed and hung down his head never was triumph more consummate never was defeat borne with so ill a grace indeed i could not endure the spectacle of the poor mummy's mortification i reached my hat bowed to him stiffly and took leave upon getting home i found it past four o'clock and went immediately to bed it is now ten a m i have been up since seven penning these memoranda for the benefit of my family and of mankind the former i shall behold no more my wife is a shrew the truth is i am heartily sick of this life and of the nineteenth century in general i am convinced that everything is going wrong besides i am anxious to know who will be president in twenty forty five as soon therefore as i shave and swallow a cup of coffee i shall just step over to poniner's and get embalmed for a couple of hundred years End of section 10. Section 11 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Poetic Principle by Edgar Allan Poe. In speaking of the poetic principle, I have no design to be either thorough or profound. While discussing, very much at random, the essentiality of what we call poetry, my principal purpose will be to cite for consideration some few of those minor English or American poems which best suit my own taste, or which, upon my own fancy, have left the most definite impression. By minor poems I mean, of course, poems of little length. And here, in the beginning, permit me to say a few words in regard to a somewhat peculiar principle which, whether rightfully or wrongfully, has always had its influence in my own critical estimate of the poem. I hold that a long poem does not exist. I maintain that phrase, a long poem, is simply a flat contradiction. In terms. I need scarcely observe that a poem deserves its title only inasmuch as it excites by elevating the soul. The value of the poem is in the ratio of this elevating excitement. But all excitements are, through a cycle necessity, transient. That degree of excitement which would entitle a poem to be so called at all cannot be sustained throughout a composition of any great length. After the lapse of half an hour at the very utmost, it flags, fails, a revulsion ensues, and then the poem is, in effect, and in fact, no longer such. There are, no doubt, many who have found difficulty in reconciling the critical dictum that the paradise loss is to be devoutly admired throughout, with the absolute impossibility of maintaining for it, during perusal, the amount of enthusiasm which that critical dictum would demand. This great work, in fact, is to be regarded as poetical only when, losing sight of that vital requisite in all works of art, unity, we view it merely as a series of minor poems. If to preserve its unity, its totality of effect or impression, we read it, as would be necessary, at a single sitting, the result is but a constant alternation of excitement and depression. After a passage of what we feel to be true poetry, there follows inevitably a passage of platitude which no critical prejudgment can force us to admire. But if upon completing the work we read it again, omitting the first book, that is to say, commencing with the second, we shall be surprised at now finding that admirable which we before condemned, that damnable which we had previously so much admired. It follows from all this that the ultimate aggregate or absolute effect of even the best epic under the sun is nullity, and this is precisely the fact. In regard to the Iliad, we have, if not positive proof, at least very good reason for believing it intended 
as a series of lyrics but granting the epic intention i can say only that the work is based on an imperfect sense of art the modern epic is of the supposititious ancient model but an inconsiderate and blindfold imitation but the day of these artistic anomalies is over if at any time any very long poem were popular in reality which i doubt it is at least clear that no very long poem will ever be popular again that the extent of a poetical work is ceteris paribus the measure of its merit seems undoubtedly when we thus state it a proposition sufficiently absurd yet we are indebted for it to the quarterly reviews surely there can be nothing in mere size abstractly considered there can be nothing in mere bulk so far as volume is concerned which has so continuously elicited admiration from these saturnine pamphlets a mountain to be sure by the mere sentiment of physical magnitude which it conveys does impress us with a sense of the sublime but no man is impressed after this fashion by the material grandeur of even the columbiad even the quarterlies have not instructed us to be so impressed by it as yet they have not insisted on our estimating lamartine by the cubic foot or pollock by the pound but what else are we to infer from their continuing prating about sustained effort if by sustained effort any little gentleman has accomplished an epic let us frankly commend him for the effort if this is indeed a thing commendable but let us forbear praising the epic on the effort's account it is to be hoped that common sense in the time to come will prefer deciding upon a work of art rather by the impression it makes by the effect it produces than by the time it took to impress the effect or the amount of sustained effort which had been found necessary in effecting the impression the fact is that perseverance is one thing and genius quite another nor can all the quarterlies in christendom confound them by and by this proposition with many which i have just been urging will be received as self-evident in the meantime by being generally condemned as falsities they will not be essentially damaged as truths on the other hand it is clear that a poem may be improperly brief undue brevity degenerates into mere epigrammatism a very short poem while now and then producing a brilliant or vivid never produces a profound or enduring effect there must be the steady pressing down of the stamp upon the wax beranger has wrought innumerable things pungent and spirit-stirring but in general they have been too imponderous to stamp themselves deeply into the public attention and thus as so many feathers of fancy have been blown aloft only to be whistled down in the wind a remarkable instance of the effect of undue brevity in depressing poem in keeping it out of the popular view is afforded by the following exquisite little serenade i arise from the dream of thee in the first sweet sleep of night when the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright i arise from dreams of thee and a spirit in my feet has led me who knows how to thy chamber window sweet the wandering airs they faint on the dark the silent stream the champak odors fail like sweet thoughts in a dream the nightingale's complaint it dies upon the heart as i must die on thine o beloved as thou art o lift me from the grass i die i faint i fail let thy love in kisses rain on my lips and eyelids pale my cheek is cold and white alas my heart beats loud and fast o press it close to thine again where it will break at last very few perhaps are familiar with these lines yet no less a poet than shelley is their author their warm yet delicate and ethereal imagination will be appreciated by all and by none so thoroughly as by him who has himself arisen from sweet dreams of one beloved to bathe in the aromatic air of a southern midsummer night one of the finest poems by willis the very best in my opinion which he has ever written has no doubt through this same defect of undue brevity been kept back from its proper position not less in the critical than in the popular view 
the shadows lay along broadway twas near the twilight tide as slowly there a lady fair was walking in her pride alone walked she but viewlessly walked spirits at her side peace charmed the street beneath her feet and honor charmed the air and all astir looked kind on her and called her good as fair for all god ever gave to her she kept with cherry care she kept with care her beauties rare from lovers warm and true for heart was cold to all but gold and the rich came not to woo but honoured well her charms to sell if priests the selling do now walking there was one more fair a slight girl lily pale and she had unseen company to make the spirit quail twixt want and scorn she walked forlorn and nothing could avail no mercy now can clear her brow for this world's peace to pray for as love's wild prayer dissolved in air her woman's heart gave way but the sin forgiven by christ in heaven by man is cursed alway in this composition we find it difficult to recognize the willis who has written so many mere verses of society the lines are not only richly ideal but full of energy while they breathe an earnestness and evident sincerity of sentiment for which we look in vain throughout all the other works of this author while the epic mania while the idea that to merit in poetry prolixity is indispensable has for some years been gradually dying out of the public mind by mere dint of its own absurdity we find it succeeded by a heresy too palpably false to be long tolerated but one which in the brief period it has already endured may be said to have accomplished more in the corruption of our poetical literature than all its other enemies combine i allude to the heresy of the didactic it has been assumed tacitly and avowedly directly and indirectly that the ultimate object of all poetry is truth every poem it is said should inculcate a moral and by this moral is the poetical merit of the work to be adjudged we americans especially have patronized this happy idea and we bostonians very especially have developed it in full we have taken it into our heads that to write a poem simply for the poem's sake and to acknowledge such to have been our design would be to confess ourselves radically wanting in the true poetic dignity and force but the simple fact is that we would but permit ourselves to look into our own souls we should immediately there discover that under the sun there neither exists nor can exist any work more thoroughly dignified more supremely noble than this very poem this poem per se this poem which is a poem and nothing more this poem written solely for the poem's sake with as deep a reverence for the true as ever inspired the bosom of man i would nevertheless limit in some measure its modes of inculcation i would limit to enforce them i would not enfeeble them by dissipation the demands of truth are severe she has no sympathy with the myrtles all that which is so indispensable in song is precisely all that which she has nothing whatever to do but it is but making her a flaunting paradox to wreathe her in gems and flowers in enforcing a truth we need severity rather than efflorescence of language we must be simple precise terse we must be cool calm unimpassioned in a word we must be in that mood which as nearly as possible is the exact converse of the poetical he must be blind indeed who does not perceive the radical and chasmal difference between the truthful and the poetical modes of inculcation he must be theory mad beyond redemption who in spite of these differences shall still persist in attempting to reconcile the obstinate oils and waters of poetry and truth dividing the world of mind into its three most immediately obvious distinctions we have the pure intellect taste and the moral sense i place taste in the middle because it is just this position which in the mind it occupies 
it holds intimate relations with either extreme but from a moral sense is separated by so faint a difference that aristotle has not hesitated to place some of its operations among the virtues themselves nevertheless we find the offices of the trio marked with a sufficient distinction just as the intellect concerns itself with truth so taste informs us of the beautiful while the moral sense is regardful of duty of this latter while conscience teaches the obligation and reason the expediency taste contents herself with displaying the charms waging war upon vice solely on the ground of her deformity her disproportion her animosity to the fitting to the appropriate to the harmonious in a word to beauty an immortal instinct deep within the spirit of man is thus plainly a sense of the beautiful this it is which administers to his delight in the manifold forms and sounds and odors and sentiments amid which he exists and just as the lily is repeated in the lake or the eyes of the amaryllis in the mirror so is the mere oral or written repetition of these forms and sounds and colors and odors and sentiments a duplicate source of the light but this mere repetition is not poetry he who shall simply sing with however glowing enthusiasm or with however vivid a truth of description of the sights and sounds and odors and colors and sentiments which greet him in common with all mankind he i say has yet failed to prove his divine title there is still something in the distance which he has been unable to attain we have still a thirst unquenchable to allay which he has not shown us the crystal springs this thirst belongs to the immortality of man it is at once a consequence and an indication of his perennial existence it is the desire of the moth for the star it is no mere appreciation of the beauty before us but a wild effort to reach the beauty above inspired by an ecstatic prescience to the glories beyond the grave we struggle by multiform combinations among the things and thoughts of time to attain a portion of that loveliness whose very elements perhaps appertain to eternity alone and thus when by poetry or when by music the most entrancing of the poetic moods we find ourselves melted into tears we weep then not as the abate gravina supposes through excess of pleasure but through a certain petulant impatient sorrow at our inability to grasp now wholly here on earth at once and forever those divine and rapturous joys which through the poem or through the music we attain to but brief and indeterminate glimpses the struggle to apprehend the supernal loveliness this struggle on the part of souls fittingly constituted has given to the world all that which it the world has ever been enabled at once to understand and to feel as poetic the poetic sentiment of course may develop itself in various modes in painting in sculpture in architecture in the dance very especially in music and very peculiarly with a wide field in the composition of the landscape garden our present theme however has regard only to its manifestation in words and here let me speak briefly on the topic of rhythm contenting myself with the certainty that music in its various modes of meter rhythm and rhyme is of so vast a moment in poetry as never to be wisely rejected is so vitally important an adjunct that he is simply silly who declines its assistance i will now pause to maintain its absolute essentiality it is in music perhaps that the soul most nearly attains the great end for which when inspired by the poetic sentiment it struggles the creation of supernal beauty it may be indeed that here this sublime end is now and then attained in fact we are often made to feel with a shivering delight that from an earthly harp are stricken notes which cannot have been unfamiliar to the angels and thus there can be little doubt that in the union of poetry with music in its popular sense we shall find the widest field for the poetic development 
the old bards and minnen singers had advantages which we do not possess and thomas moore singing his own songs was in the most legitimate manner perfecting them as poems to recapitulate then i would define in brief the poetry of words as the rhythmical creation of beauty its sole arbiter is taste with the intellect or with the conscience it has only collateral relations unless incidentally it has no concern whatever with duty or with truth a few words however in explanation that pleasure which is at once the most pure the most elevating and the most intense is derived i maintain from the contemplation of the beautiful in the contemplation of beauty we alone find it possible to attain that pleasurable elevation or excitement of the soul which we recognize as the poetic sentiment and which is so easily distinguished from truth which is the satisfaction of the reason or from passion which is the excitement of the heart i make beauty therefore using the word as inclusive of the sublime i make beauty the province of the poem simply because it is an obvious rule of art that effects should be made to spring directly as possible from their causes no one as yet having been weak enough to deny that peculiar elevation in question is at least most readily obtainable in the poem it by no means follows however that the incitements of passion or the precepts of duty or even the lessons of truth may not be introduced into a poem and with advantage for they may subserve incidentally in various ways the general purposes of the work but the true artist will always contrive to tone them down in proper subjection to that beauty which is the atmosphere and the real essence of the poem i cannot better introduce the few poems which i shall present for your consideration than by the citation of the poem to longfellow's waif the day is done and the darkness falls from the wings of night as a feather is wafted downward from an eagle in his flight i see the lights of the village gleam through the rain and the mist and a feeling of sadness comes o'er me that my soul cannot resist a feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain and resembles sorrow only as the mist resembles the rain come read to me some poem some simple heartfelt lay that shall soothe this restless feeling and banish the thoughts of day not from the grand old masters not from the bards sublime whose distant footsteps echo through the corridors of time for like strains of martial music their mighty thought suggests life's endless toil and endeavor and to-night i long for rest read from some humbler poet whose songs gush from his heart as showers from the clouds of summer or tears from the eyelids start who through long days of labor and nights devoid of ease still heard in his soul the music of wonderful melodies such songs have power to quiet the restless pulse of care and come like the benediction that follows after prayer then read from some treasured volume a poem of thy choice and lend to the rhyme of the poet the beauty of thy voice and the night shall be filled with music and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like arabs and as silently steal away with no great range of imagination these lines have been justly admired for their delicacy of expression some of the images are very effective nothing can be better than the bard sublime whose distant footsteps echo down the corridors of time the idea of the last quatrain is also very effective the poem on the whole however is chiefly to be admired for the graceful insouciance of its metre so well in accordance with the character of the sentiments and especially for the ease of the general manner this ease or naturalness in literary style has long been the fashion to regard as ease in appearance alone as a point of really difficult attainment 
but not so. A natural manner is difficult only to him who should never meddle with it, to the unnatural. It is but the result of writing with the understanding or with the instinct that the tone in composition should always be that which the mass of mankind would adopt and most perpetually vary, of course, with the occasion. The author who, after the fashion of the North American Review, should be upon all occasions merely quiet, must necessarily upon many occasions be simply silly or stupid, and has no more right to be considered easy or natural than a cockney exquisite or than the sleeping beauty in the waxworks. Among the minor poems of Bryant, none has so much impressed me as one which he entitles June. I quote only a portion of it. There through the long, long summer hours the golden light should lie, and thick young herbs and groups of flowers stand in their beauty by. The oriole should build and tell his love tale closely beside my cell. The idle butterfly should rest him there, and there be heard the housewife bee and humming bird. And what if cheerful shouts at noon come from the village scent, or songs of maids beneath the moon with fairy laughter blent? And what if in the evening light betrothed lovers walk in sight of my low monument? I would the lovely scene around might know no sadder sight or sound. I know, I know I should not see the season's glorious show, nor would its brightness shine for me, nor its wild music flow. But if around my place of sleep the friends I love should come to weep, they might not haste to go. Soft airs and song and the light and bloom should keep them lingering by my tomb. These to their softened hearts should bear the thoughts of what has been, and speak of one who cannot share the gladness of the scene, whose part in all the pomp that fills the circuit of the summer hills is that his grave is green, and deeply would their hearts rejoice to hear again his living voice. The rhythmical flow here is even voluptuous. Nothing could be more melodious. The poem has always affected me in a remarkable manner. The intense melancholy which seems to well up perforce to the surface of all the poet's cheerful sayings about his grave. We find thrillingness to the soul while there is the truest poetic elevation in the thrill. The impression left is one of a pleasurable sadness. And if in the remaining compositions which I shall introduce to you there be more or less of a similar tone always apparent, let me remind you that, how or why we know not, this certain taint of sadness is inseparably connected with all the higher manifestations of true beauty. It is, nevertheless, a feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain and resembles sorrow only, as the mist resembles the rain. The taint of which I speak is clearly perceptible even in a poem so full of brilliancy and spirit as The Health of Edward Coate Pinckney. I fill this cup to one made up of loveliness alone, a woman of her gentle sex, the seeming paragon, to whom the better elements and kindly stars have given a form so fair that, like the air, tis less of earth than of heaven. Her every tone is music's own, like those of morning birds, and something more than melody dwells ever in her words. The coinage of her heart are they, and from her lips each flows, as one may see the burden be, forth issue from the rose. Affections are as thoughts to her, the measure of her hours. Her feelings have the flagrancy the freshness of young flowers, and lovely passions changing off so fill her, she appears the image of themselves by turns, the idol of past years. Of her bright face on glance will trace a picture on the brain, and of her voice in echoing hearts a sound must long remain. But memory such as mine of her so very much endears when death is nigh, 
my latest sigh will not be life's but hers i filled this cup to one made up of loveliness alone a woman of her gentle sex the seeming paragon her health and would on earth there stood some more of such a frame that life might be all poetry and weariness a name it was the misfortune of mr pinckney to have been born too far south had he been a new englander it is probable that he would have been ranked as the first of american lyricists by that magnanimous cabal which has so long controlled the destinies of american letters in conducting the thing called the north american review the poem just cited is especially beautiful but the poetic elevation which it induces we must refer chiefly to our sympathy in the poet's enthusiasm we pardon his hyperboles for the evident earnestness with which they are uttered it was by no means my design however to expatiate upon the merits of what i should read you these will necessarily speak for themselves boccalini in his advertisements from parnassus tells us that zoilus once presented apollo a very caustic criticism upon a very admirable book whereupon the god asked him for the beauties of the work he replied that he only busied himself about the errors on hearing this apollo handing him a sack of unwinnowed wheat bade him pick out all the chaff for his reward now this fable answers very well as a hit at the critics but i am by no means sure that the god was in the right i am by no means certain that the true limits of the critical duty are not grossly misunderstood excellence in a poem especially may be considered in the light of an axiom which need only be properly put to become self-evident it is not excellence if it require to be demonstrated as such and thus to point out too particularly the merits of a work of art is to admit that they are not merits altogether among the melodies of thomas moore is one whose distinguished character as a poem proper seems to have been singularly left out of view i allude to his lines beginning come rest in this bosom the intense energy of their expression is not surpassed by anything in byron there are two of the lines in which a sentiment is conveyed that embodies the all in all of the divine passion of love a sentiment which perhaps has found its echo in more and in more passionate human hearts than in any other single sentiment ever embodied in words come rest in this bosom my own stricken dear though the herd have fled from thee thy home is still here here still in the smile that no cloud can o'ercast and a heart and a hand all thy own to the last oh what was love made for if tis not the same through joy and through torment through glory and shame i know not i ask not if guilt's in the heart i but know that i love thee whatever thou art thou hast called me thy angel in moments of bliss and thy angel i'll be mid the horrors of this through the furnace unshrinking thy steps to pursue and shield thee and save thee or perish there too it has been the fashion of late to deny moore imagination while granting him fancy a distinction originating with coleridge than whom no man more fully comprehended the great powers of moore the fact is that the fancy of this poet is so far predominates over all his other faculties and over the fancy of all other men as to have induced very naturally the idea that he is fanciful only but never was there a greater mistake never was a grosser wrong done to the fame of a true poet in the compass of the english language i can call to mind no poem more profoundly more weirdly imaginative in the best sense than the lines commencing i would i were by that dim lake which are the composition of thomas moore i regret that i am unable to remember them one of the noblest and speaking of fancy one of the most singularly fanciful of modern poets was thomas hood his fair inez 
had always for me an inexpressible charm. O oh, saw ye not fair Ines? She's gone into the west to dazzle when the sun is down, and rob the world of rest. She took our daylight with her, the smiles that we love best, with morning blushes on her cheek and pearls upon her breast. O oh, turn again, fair Ines, before the fall of night, for fear the moon should shine alone and stars unrivaled bright, and blessed will the lover be that walks beneath their light, and breathes the love against thy cheek I dare not even write. Would I had been, fair Ines, that gallant cavalier who rode so gaily by thy side and whispered thee so near. Were there no bonny dames at home, or no true lovers here, that he should cross the seas to win the dearest of the dear? I saw thee, lovely Ines, descend along the shore with bands of noble gentlemen and banners waved before, and gentle youth and maidens gay and snowy plumes they wore. It would have been a beauteous dream if it had been no more. Alas, alas, fair Ines, she went away with song, with music waiting on her steps and shooting of the throng. But some were sad and felt no mirth, but only music's wrong in sounds that sang farewell, farewell to her you've loved so long. Farewell, farewell, fair Ines. That vessel never bore so fair a lady on its deck, nor danced so light before. Alas, for pleasure on the sea and sorrow on the shore. The smile that blessed one lover's heart has broken many more. The Haunted House by the same author is one of the truest poems ever written. One of the truest, one of the most unexceptionable, one of the most thoroughly artistic, both in its theme and in its execution. It is, moreover, powerfully ideal, imaginative. I regret that its length renders it unsuitable for the purposes of this lecture. In place of it, permit me to offer the universally appreciated Bridge of Sighs. One more unfortunate, weary of breath, rashly importunate, gone to her death. Take her up tenderly, lift her with care, fashioned so slenderly, young and so fair. Look at her garments clinging like cerements, whilst the wave constantly drips from her clothing. Take her up instantly, loving but not loathing. Touch her not scornfully. Think of her mournfully, gently, and humanly, not in the stains of her. All that remains of her now is pure womanly. Make no deep scrutiny into her mutiny, rash and undutiful, past all dishonor, death has left on her only the beautiful. Where the lamps quiver so far in the river, with many a light from window and casement, from garret to basement she stood with amazement, houseless by night. The bleak wind of March made her tremble and shiver, but not the dark arch or the black flowing river, Mad from life's history, glad to death's mystery, swift to be hurled anywhere, anywhere out of the world. In she plunged boldly, no matter how coldly the rough river ran over the brink of it. Picture it, think of it, dissolute man. Live in it, drink of it, then if you can. Still for all slips of hers, one of Eve's family. Wipe those poor lips of hers, oozing so clamily, loop up her tresses, escaped from the comb, her fair auburn tresses, whilst wonderment guesses where was her home. Who was her father? Who was her mother? Had she a sister? Had she a brother? Or was there a dearer one still, a nearer one yet than all the other? Alas for the rarity of Christian charity under the sun, Oh, it was pitiful, near the whole city full, home she had come. Sisterly, brotherly, fatherly, motherly, feeling had changed. Love, by harsh evidence, thrown from its eminence. Even God's providence seemed estranged. Take her up tenderly, lift her with care. Fashioned so slenderly, young and so fair. Ere her limbs frigidly stiffen too rigidly. Decently, kindly, smooth and compose them and her eyes closed them, staring so blindly. Dreadfully staring through muddy impurity as when the 
daring last look of despairing fixed on futurity perishing gloomily spurred by contumely cold in humanity burning insanity into her rest cross her hands humbly as if praying dumbly over her breast owing her weakness her evil behavior and leaving with meekness her sins to her savior the vigor of this poem is no less remarkable than its pathos the versification although carrying the fanciful to the very verge of the fantastic is nevertheless admirably adapted to the wild insanity which is the thesis of the poem among the minor poems of lord byron is one which has never received from the critics the praise which it undoubtedly deserves though the day of my destiny is over and the star of my fate hath declined thy soft heart refused to discover the faults which so many could find though my soul with my grief was acquainted it shrunk not to share it with me and the love which my spirit hath painted it never hath found but in thee then when nature around me is smiling the last smile which answers to mine i do not believe it beguiling because it reminds me of thine and when winds are at war with the ocean as the breasts i believed in with me if their billows excite an emotion it is that they bear me from thee though the rock of my last hope is shivered and its fragments are sunk in the wave though i feel that my soul is delivered to pain it shall not be its slave there is many a pang to pursue me they may crush but they shall not contemn they may torture but they shall not subdue me tis of thee that i think not of them though human thou didst not deceive me though woman thou didst not forsake though love thou forbearest to grieve me though slandered thou never couldst shake though trusted thou didst not disclaim me though parted it was not to fly though watchful twas not to defame me nor mute that the world might be lie yet i blame not the world nor despise it nor the war of the many with one if my soul was not fitted to prize it twas folly not sooner to shun and if dearly that error hath cost me and more than i once could foresee i have found that whatever is lost me i could not deprive me of thee from the wreck of the past which hath perished thus much i at least may recall it hath taught me that which i most cherished deserved to be dearest of all in the desert a fountain is springing in the wide waste there still is a tree and a bird in the solitude singing which speaks to my spirit of thee although the rhythm here is one of the most difficult and the versification could scarcely be improved no nobler theme ever engaged the pen of a poet it is a soul elevating idea that no man can consider himself entitled to complain of fate while in his adversity he still retains the unwavering love of a woman from alfred lord tennyson although in perfect sincerity i regard him as the noblest poet that ever lived i have left myself time to cite only a very brief specimen i call him and think him the noblest of poets not because of the impressions he produces are at all times the most profound not because the poetical excitement which he induces is at all times the most intense but because it is at all times the most ethereal in other words the most elevating and most pure no poet is so little of the earth earthy what i am about to read is from his last long poem the princess tears idle tears i know not what they mean tears from the depth of some divine despair rise in the heart and gather to the eyes in looking on the happy autumn fields and thinking of the days that are no more fresh as the first beam glittering on a sail 
that brings our friends up from the underworld sad as the last which reddens over me that sinks with all we love below the verge so sad so fresh the days that are no more ah sad and strange as in the dark summer dawns the earliest pipe of half-wakened birds the dying ears when unto dying eyes the casement slowly grows a glimmering square so sad so strange the days that are no more dear as remembered kisses after death and sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned on lips that are for others deep as love deep as first love and wild with all regret o death in life the days that are no more thus although in a very cursory and imperfect manner i have endeavoured to convey to you my conception of the poetic principle it has been my purpose to suggest that while this principle itself is strictly and simply the human aspiration for supernal beauty the manifestation of the principle is always found in an elevating excitement of the soul quite independent of that passion which is the intoxication of the heart or that truth which is the satisfaction of the reason for in regard to passion alas its tendency is to degrade rather than to elevate the soul love on the contrary love the true divine eros the uranian as distinguished from the dionan and venus is unquestionably the purest and truest of all poetical themes and in regard to truth if to be sure through the attainment of a truth we are led to perceive harmony where none was apparent before we experience at once the true poetical effect but this effect is referable to the harmony alone and not in the least degree to the truth which merely served to render the harmony manifest we shall reach however more immediately a distinct conception of what the true poetry is by mere reference to a few of the simple elements which induce in the poet himself the poetical effect he recognizes the ambrosia which nourishes his soul in the bright orbs that shine in the heaven in the volutes of the flower in the clustering of low shrubberies in the waving of the grain fields in the slanting of tall eastern trees in the blue distance of mountains in the grouping of clouds in the twinkling of half-hidden brooks in the gleaming of silver rivers in the repose of sequestered lakes in the star mirroring depths of lonely wells he perceives it in the songs of birds in the harp of bullace in the sighing of the night wind in the repining voice of the forest in the surf that complains to the shore in the fresh breath of the woods in the scent of the violet in the voluptuous perfume of the hyacinth in the suggestive odor that comes to him at eventide from far distant undiscovered islands over dim oceans illimitable and unexplored he owns it in all noble thoughts in all unworldly motives in all holy impulses in all chivalrous generous and self-sacrificing deeds he feels it in the beauty of a woman in the grace of her step in the luster of her eye in the melody of her voice in her soft laughter in her sigh in the harmony of the rustling of her robes he deeply feels in her winning endearments in her burning enthusiasms in her gentle charities in her meek and devotional endurances but above all ah far above all he kneels to it he worships it in the faith in the purity in the strength in the altogether divine majesty of her love let me conclude by the recitation of yet another brief poem one very different in character from any that i have before quoted it is by motherwell and is called the song of the cavalier 
with our modern and altogether rational ideas of the absurdity and impiety of warfare we are not precisely in that frame of mind best adapted to sympathize with the sentiments and thus to appreciate the real excellence of the poem to do this fully we must identify ourselves in fancy with the soul of the old cavalier then mount then mount brave gallants all and don your helms amain death's couriers fame and honor call no shrewish tear shall fill your eye when the sword hilts in your hand heart whole will part and no whit sigh for the fairest of the land let piping swain and craven white thus weep the pulling cry our business is like men to fight end of section eleven Section 12 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Cartwright. Old English Poetry by Edgar Allan Poe. A commentary on The Book of Gems edited by s c hall it should not be doubted that at least one-third of the affection with which we regard the elder poets of great britain should be attributed to what is in itself a thing apart from poetry we mean to the simple love of the antique and that again a third of even the proper poetic sentiment inspired by their writings should be ascribed to a fact which while it has strict connection with poetry in the abstract and with the old british poems themselves should not be looked upon as a merit appertaining to the authors of the poems almost every devout admirer of the old bards if demanded his opinion of their productions would mention vaguely yet with perfect sincerity a sense of dreamy wild indefinite and he would perhaps say indefinable delight on being required to point out the source of this so shadowy pleasure he would be apt to speak of the quaint in phraseology and in general handling this quaintness is in fact a very powerful adjunct to ideality but in the case in question it arises independently of the author's will and is altogether apart from his intention words and their rhythm have varied verses which affect us to-day with a vivid delight and which delight in many instances may be traced to the one source quaintness must have worn in the days of their construction a very commonplace air this is of course no argument against the poems now we mean it only as against the poet's view there is a growing desire to overrate them the old english muse was frank guileless sincere and although very learned still learned without art no general error evinces a more thorough confusion of ideas than the error of supposing dun and cowley metaphysical in the sense wherein wordsworth and coleridge are so with the two former ethics were the end with the two latter the means the poet of the creation wished by highly artificial verse to inculcate what he supposed to be moral truth the poet of the ancient mariner to infuse the poetic sentiment through channels suggested by analysis the one finished by complete failure what he commenced in the grossest misconception the other by a path which could not possibly lead him astray arrived at a triumph which is not the less glorious because hidden from the profane eyes of the multitude but in this view even the metaphysical verse of cowley is but evidence of the simplicity and single-heartedness of the man and he was in this but a type of his school for we may as well designate in this way the entire class of writers whose poems are bound up in the volume before us 
and throughout all of whom there runs a very perceptible general character. They used little art in composition. Their writing sprang immediately from the soul, and partook intensely of that soul's nature. Nor is it difficult to perceive the tendency of this abandon, to elevate immeasurably all the energies of mind, but, again, so to mingle the greatest possible fire, force, delicacy, and all good things, with the lowest possible bathos, baldness, and imbecility, as to render it not a matter of doubt that the average results of mind in such a school will be found inferior to those results in one, ceteris paribus, more artificial. We cannot bring ourselves to believe that the selections of the Book of Gems are such as will impart to a poetical reader the clearest possible idea of the beauty of the school. But if the intention had been merely to show the school's character, the attempt might have been considered successful in the highest degree. There are long passages now before us of the most despicable trash, with no merit whatever beyond that of their antiquity. The criticisms of the editor do not particularly please us. His enthusiasm is too general and too vivid not to be false. His opinion, for example, of Sir Henry Wotton's Verses on the Queen of Bohemia, that there are few finer things in our language, is untenable and absurd. In such lines we can perceive not one of those higher attributes of poesy which belong to her in all circumstances and throughout all time. Here everything is art, nakedly or but awkwardly concealed. No prepossession for the mere antique, and in this case we can imagine no other prepossession, should induce us to dignify with the sacred name of poetry a series such as this, of elaborate and threadbare compliments, stitched apparently together without fancy, without plausibility, and without even an attempt at adaptation. Speaking of poesy, the author says, By the murmur of a spring, or the least boughs rustling, by a daisy whose leaves spread, shut when Titan goes to bed, or a shady bush or tree, she could more infuse in me than all nature's beauties can, in some other wiser man. By her help I also now make this churlish place allow, something that may sweeten gladness in the very gall of sadness. The dull loneness, the black shade, that these hanging vaults have made, the strange music of the waves beating on these hollow caves, this black den which rocks in boss, overgrown with eldest moss the rude portals that give light more to terror than delight, this my chamber of neglect, walled about with disrespect, from all these and this dull air, a fit object for despair. She hath taught me, by her might, to draw comfort and delight. But these lines, however good, do not bear with them much of the general character of the English antique. Something more of this will be found in Corbett's Farewell to the Fairies. We copy a portion of Marvell's Maiden Lamenting for Her Fawn, which we prefer, not only as a specimen of the elder poets, but in itself as a beautiful poem, abounding in pathos, exquisitely delicate imagination, and truthfulness to anything of its species. It is a wondrous thing how fleet t'was on those little silver feet, with what a pretty skipping grace it oft would challenge me the race, and when t had left me far away, t'would stay and run again and stay, for it was nimbler much than hinds, and trod as if on the four winds. I have a garden of my own, but so with roses overgrown, and lilies that you would it guess to be a little wilderness. And all the springtime of the year it only loved to be there, among the beds of lilies I have sought it oft, 
where it should lie, yet could not, till itself would rise, find it, although before mine eyes. For in the flaxen lily's shade it like a bank of lilies laid, upon the roses it would feed, until its lips even seemed to bleed. And then to me t'would boldly trip, and print those roses on my lip. But all its chief delight was still with roses thus itself to fill, and its pure virgin limbs to fold in whitest sheets of lilies cold. Had it lived long, it would have been lilies without, roses within. How truthful an air of lamentations hangs here on every syllable. It pervades all. It comes over the sweet melody of the words, over the gentleness and grace which we fancy in the little maiden herself, even over the half-playful, half-petulant air with which she lingers on the beauties and good qualities of her favourite, like the cool shadow of a summer cloud over a bed of lilies and violets, and all sweet flowers. The whole is redolent with poetry of a very lofty order. Every line is an idea conveying either the beauty and playfulness of the fawn, or the artlessness of the maiden, or her love, or her admiration, or her grief, or the fragrance and warmth and appropriateness of the little nest-like bed of lilies and roses which the fawn devoured as it lay upon them, and could scarcely be distinguished from them by the once happy little damsel who went to seek her pet with an arch and rosy smile on her face. Consider the great variety of truthful and delicate thought in the few lines we have quoted, the wonder of the little maiden at the fleetness of her favourite, the little silver feet, the fawn challenging his mistress to a race with a pretty skipping grace running on before, and then, with head turned back, awaiting her approach only to fly from it again. Can we not distinctly perceive all these things? How exceedingly vigorous, too, is the line, and trod as if on the four winds, a vigour apparent only when we keep in mind the artless character of the speaker and the four feet of the favourite, one for each wind. Then consider the garden of my own, so overgrown, entangled with roses and lilies, as to be a little wilderness, the fawn loving to be there, and there only, the maiden seeking it where it should lie, and not being able to distinguish it from the flowers until itself would rise, the lying among the lilies, like a bank of lilies, the loving to fill itself with roses, and its pure virgin limbs to fold in whitest sheets of lilies cold. And these things being its chief delights, and then the preeminent beauty and naturalness of the concluding lines, whose very hyperbole only renders them more true to nature when we consider the innocence, the artlessness, the enthusiasm, the passionate girl, and more passionate admiration of the bereaved child. Had it lived long, it would have been lilies without, roses within. End of section 12 Section 13 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Newfeld. Preface Edgar Allan Poe. These trifles are collected and republished chiefly with a view to their redemption from the many improvements to which they have been subjected while going at random the rounds of the press. I am naturally anxious that what I have written should circulate as I wrote it, if it circulate at all. In defence of my own taste, nevertheless, it is incumbent upon me to say that I think nothing in this volume of much value to the public, or very creditable to myself. 
events not to be controlled have prevented me from making at any time any serious effort in what under happier circumstances would have been the field of my choice with me poetry has been not a purpose but a passion and the passions should be held in reverence they must not they cannot at will be excited with an eye to the paltry compensations or the more paltry commendations of mankind edgar allan poe 1845 and of section 13section fourteen of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by bob newfeld the raven by edgar allan poe once upon a midnight dreary while i pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore while i nodded nearly napping suddenly there came a tapping as of some one gently rapping rapping at my chamber door tis some visitor i muttered tapping at my chamber door only this and nothing more ah distinctly i remember it was in the bleak december and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor eagerly i wished the morrow vainly i had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow sorrow for the lost lenore for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name lenore nameless here for evermore and the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before so that now to still the beating of my heart i stood repeating tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door this it is and nothing more presently my soul grew stronger hesitating then no longer sir said i or madam truly your forgiveness i implore but the fact is i was napping and so gently you came rapping so faintly you came tapping tapping at my chamber door that i scarce was sure i heard you here i opened wide the door darkness there and nothing more deep into that darkness peering long i stood there wondering fearing doubting dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before but the silence was unbroken and the darkness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word lenore this i whispered and an echo murmured back the word lenore merely this and nothing more back into the chamber turning all my soul within me burning soon i heard again a tapping somewhat louder than before surely said i surely that is something at my window lattice let me see then what thereat is and this mystery explore let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore tis the wind and nothing more open here i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore not the least obeisance made he not an instant stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched upon a bust of pallas just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven 
thou i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore but the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour nothing farther then he uttered not a feather then he fluttered till i scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before then the bird said nevermore startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken doubtless said i what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never never more but the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then upon the velvet sinking i betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore this i sat engaged in guessing but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core this and more i sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall oppress ah nevermore then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from thy memories of lenore quaff oh quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost lenore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted on this home by horror haunted tell me truly i implore is there is there balm in gilead tell me tell me i implore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us by that god we both adore tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name lenore clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name lenore quoth the raven nevermore be that word our sign of parting bird or fiend i shrieked upstarting get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken leave my loneliness unbroken quit the bust above the door take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door 
quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never more end of section fourteen Section 15 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe hear the sledges with the bells silver bells what a world of merriment their melody foretells how they tinkle 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 in the icy air of night while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight keeping time 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinnabulation that so musically wells from the bells 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 from the jingling and the tingling of the bells hear the mellow wedding bells golden bells what a world of happiness their harmony foretells through the balmy air of night how they ring out their delight from the molten golden notes and all in tune what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon oh from out the sounding cells what a gush of euphony voluminously wells how it swells how it dwells on the future how it tells of the rapture that impels to the swinging and the ringing of the bells 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 of the bells 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells hear the loud alarum bells brazen bells what tale of terror now their turbulency tells in the startled ear of night how they scream out their affright too much horrified to speak they can only shriek shriek out of tune in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire leaping higher 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 with a desperate desire and a resolute endeavour now now to sit or never by the side of the pale-faced moon oh the bells 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair how they clang and clash and roar what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air yet the ear it fully knows by the twanging and the clanging how the danger ebbs and flows yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling how the danger sinks or swells by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells of the bells of the bells 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 and the clamour and the clangour of the bells hear the tolling of the bells iron bells what a world of solemn thought their monody compels in the silence of the night how we shiver with affright at the melancholy meaning of their tone for every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan and the people ah the people they that dwell up in the steeple all alone and who tolling 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 in that muffled monotone feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone they are neither man nor woman they are neither brute nor human they are ghouls 
and their king it is who tolls and he rolls 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 a paean from the bells and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells and he dances and he yells keeping time 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the paean of the bells of the bells keeping time 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells of the bells 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 to the sobbing of the bells keeping time 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 as he knells 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 in a happy runic rhyme to the rolling of the bells to the tolling of the bells of the bells 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells end of section fifteen Section 16 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulalum by Edgar Allan Poe. The skies, they were ashen and sober. The leaves, they were crisped and sere. The leaves, they were withering and sere. It was night in the lonesome October of my most immemorial year. It was hard by the dim lake of Auber, in the misty mid-region of Weir. It was down by the dank tarn of Auber, in the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. Here once through an alley titanic of Cyprus I roamed with my soul, of Cyprus with Psyche my soul. These were days when my heart was volcanic, as the scoriac rivers that roll, as the lavas that restlessly roll their sulphurous currents down Yarnak, and the ultimate climbs of the pole, that groan as they roll down Mount Yarnak, in the realms of the boreal pole. Our talk had been serious and sober, but our thoughts they were palsied and seer, our memories were treacherous and seer, for we knew not the month was October, and we marked not the night of the year. Ah, night of all nights in the year. We noted not the dim lake of Auber, though once we had journeyed down here. Remembered not the dank tarn of Auber, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. And now, as the night was senescent, and star-dials pointed to morn, as the sun-dials hinted of morn at the end of our path a liquescent and nebulous lustre was born out of which a miraculous crescent arose with a duplicate horn astartes bediamond crescent distinct with its duplicate horn and i said she is warmer than dian she rolls through an ether of sighs she revels in a region of sighs she has seen that the tears are not dry on these cheeks, where the worm never dies, and has come past the stars of the lion to point us the path to the skies, to the lithian peace of the skies, come up in despite of the lion to shine on us with her bright eyes, come up through the lair of the lion with love in her luminous eyes. But Psyche, uplifting her finger said sadly this star i mistrust her pallor i strangely mistrust o oh, hasten o oh, let us not linger o oh, fly let us fly for we must in terror she spoke letting sink her wings till they trailed in the dust in agony sobbed letting sink her plumes till they trailed in the dust till they sorrowfully trailed in the dust I replied, This is nothing but dreaming. Let us on by this tremulous light. Let us bathe in this crystalline light. Its sibyllic splendor is beaming with hope and in beauty tonight. See, 
it flickers up the sky through the night. Ah, we safely may trust to its gleaming, and be sure it will lead us aright. We safely may trust to a gleaming that cannot but guide us aright, since it flickers up to heaven through the night. Thus I pacified Psyche and kissed her, and tempted her out of her gloom, and conquered her scruples and gloom, and we passed to the end of a vista, but were stopped by the door of a tomb, by the door of a legended tomb. And I said, What is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legended tomb? She replied, Ulalum, Ulalum, tis the vault of thy lost Ulalum. Then my heart, it grew ashen and sober, as the leaves that were crisped and sere, as the leaves that were withering and sere, and I cried, it was surely October, on this very night of last year, that I journeyed, I journeyed down here, that I brought a dread burden down here, on this night of all nights in the year, ah, what demon has tempted me here? Well, I know now, this dim lake of Orbe, this misty mid-region of Weir, well, I know now, this dank tarn of Orbe, this ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. End of section 16 Recorded by Joseph Finkberg Section 17 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition of Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. To Helen by Edgar Allan Poe. I saw thee once, once only, years ago. I must not say how many, but not many. It was a July midnight, and from out a full orbed moon, that like thine own soul soaring, sought a precipitate pathway up through the heaven. There fell a silvery, silken veil of light, with quietude and sultriness and slumber, upon the upturned phases of a thousand roses, that grew in an enchanted garden, where no wind dared to stir, unless on tiptoe, fell on the upturned faces of these roses that gave out in return for the love light their odorous souls in an ecstatic death, fell on the upturned faces of these roses that smiled and died in this parterre, enchanted by thee and by the poetry of thy presence. Clad in white upon a violet bank, I saw thee half reclining, while the moon fell on the upturned faces of the roses, and on thine own upturned, alas, in sorrow. Was it not fate that on this July midnight, was it not fate whose name is also sorrow, that bade me pause before that garden gate to breathe the incense of those slumbering roses, no footstep stirred, the hated world and slept, save only thee and me. O oh, heaven, O oh, God! How my heart beats in coupling these two words, save only thee and me. I paused, I looked, and in an instant all things disappeared. Ah, bear in mind, this garden was enchanted. The pearly luster of the moon went out, the mossy banks and the meandering paths, the happy flowers and the repining trees were seen no more, the very roses' odors died in the arms of the adoring airs. All, all expired save thee, save less than thou, save only the divine light in thine eyes, save but the soul in thine uplifted eyes, I saw but them, they were the world to me. 
i saw but them saw only them for hours saw only them until the moon went down what wild heart history seemed to be in written upon those crystalline celestial spheres how dark a woe yet how sublime a hope how silently serene a sea of pride how daring an ambition yet how deep how fathomless a capacity for love but now at length dear diane sank from sight into a western couch of thunder-cloud and thou a ghost amid the entombing trees didst glide away only thine eyes remained they would not go they never yet have gone lighting my lonely pathway home at night they have not left me as my hopes have since they follow me they lead me through the years they are my ministers yet i their slave their office is to illumine and enkindle my duty to be saved by their bright light and purified in their electric fire and sanctified in their elysian fire they fill my soul with beauty which is hope and are far up in heaven the stars i kneel to in the sad silent watches of my night while even in the meridian glare of day i see them still two sweetly scintillant venuses unextinguished by the sun end of section seventeen section eighteen of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by bob Neufeld. annabel lee by edgar allan poe it was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden lived whom you may know by the name of annabel lee and this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me i was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea but we loved with a love that was more than love i and my annabel lee with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me and this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea a wind blew out of a cloud by night chilling my annabel lee so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea the angels not half so happy in heaven went envying her and me yes that was the reason as all men know in this kingdom by the sea that the wind came out of the cloud chilling and killing my annabel lee but our love it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we of many far wiser than we and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful annabel lee for the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful annabel lee and the stars never rise but i see the bright eyes of the beautiful annabel lee and so all the night-tide i lie down by the side of my darling my darling my life and my bride in her sepulchre there by the sea in her tomb by the side of the sea End of section 18. Section 19 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen Napples. A Valentine by Edgar Allan Poe. For her this rhyme is penned, whose luminous eyes shall find her own sweet name that nestling lies upon the page enwrapped from every reader search narrowly the lines they hold a treasure divine a talisman an amulet that must be worn at heart search well the measure the words the syllables do not forget the trivialest point or you may lose your labor and yet there is in this no gordian knot which one might not undo with a sabre if one could merely comprehend the plot in written upon the leaf where now are peering eyes scintillating soul there lie perdue three eloquent words oft uttered in the hearing of poets by poets as the name is a poet's too its letters although naturally lying like the knight pinto mentes ferdinando still form a synonym for truth cease trying you will not read the riddle though you do the best you can do End of section 19section 20 of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathleen napples an enigma by edgar allan poe seldom we find says solomon don dunce half an idea in the profoundest sonnet through all the flimsy things we see at once as easily as through a naples bonnet trash of all trash how can a lady don it yet heavier far than your petrarchan stuff owl downy nonsense that the faintest puff twirls into trunk paper the while you con it and veritably sol is right enough the general tucker manities are errant bubbles ephemeral and so transparent but this is now you may depend upon it stable opaque immortal all by dint of the dear names that lie concealed within it end of section twenty Section 21 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To My Mother by Edgar Allan Poe Because I feel that, in the heavens above, the angels whispering to one another can find among their burning terms of love none so devotional as that of mother therefore by that dear name i long have called you you who are more than mother unto me and fill my heart of hearts where death installed you in setting my virginia spirit free my mother my own mother who died early was but the mother of myself but you are mother to the one i loved so dearly and thus are dearer than the mother i knew by that infinity with which my wife was dearer to my soul than its soul life note the above was addressed to the poet's mother-in-law mrs clem end of section twenty one Section 22 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. For Annie by Edgar Allan Poe. Thank heaven the crisis, the danger is past. And the lingering illness is over at last, And the fever called living 
is conquered at last. Sadly, I know I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move as I lie at full length, but no matter. I feel I am better at length. And I rest so composedly now in my bed that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning and groaning, the sighing and the sobbing are quieted now. With that horrible throbbing at heart, ah, oh, that horrible, horrible throbbing. The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain, with the fever called living that burned in my brain. And, oh, of all tortures, that torture, the worst, has abated, the terrible torture of thirst for the naphthaline river of passion accursed. I have drank of a water that quenches all thirst, of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring but a very few feet underground, from a cavern not very far down underground. And, ah, let it never be foolishly said that my room it is gloomy and narrow my bed, for man never slept in a different bed, and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses, its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying, it fancies a holier odor about it of pansies, a rosemary odor commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily, bathing in many a dream of the truth, and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast, deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast. When the light was extinguished, she covered me warm, and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of angels to shield me from harm. And I lie so composedly now in my bed, knowing her love, that you fancy me dead, and I rest so contentedly now in my bed, with her love at my breast, that you fancy me dead, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie. It glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. End of section 22. Section 23 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Van Stapel. 2F by Edgar Allan Poe. Beloved, amid the earnest woes that crowd around my earthly path, drear path, alas, where grows not even one lonely rose, my soul at least a solace hath in dreams of thee, and therein knows an Eden of bland repose. And thus thy memory is to me like some enchanted far-off isle in some tumultuous sea, some ocean throbbing far and free with storms, but where meanwhile serenest skies continually just over that one bright island smile. End of section 23 Section 24 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Brett Hirsch To Francis S. Osgood by Edgar Allan Poe Thou wouldst be loved? Then let thy heart from its present pathway part not. Being everything which now thou art, be nothing which thou art not. So with the world thy gentle ways, thy grace, 
thy more than beauty shall be an endless theme of praise and love a simple duty end of section 24《Section 25 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5.》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Salivar. — El Dorado by Edgar Allan Poe. — Gaily bedight a gallant knight, in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this night so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow fell, as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, he said, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied if you seek for El Dorado. End of section 25 Section 26 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eulalie by Edgar Allan Poe I dwelt alone in a world of moan, and my soul was a stagnant tide, till the fair and gentle Eulalie became my blushing bride, till the yellow-haired young Eulalie became my smiling bride. Ah, less, less bright the stars of the night than the eyes of the radiant girl, and never a flake that the vapor can make with the moon tints of purple and pearl can vie with the modest Eulalie's most unregarded curl can compare with the bright-eyed Eulalie's most humble and careless curl. Now doubt, now pain, come never again, for her soul gives me sigh for sigh, and all day long shines bright and strong a start within the sky, while ever to her dear Eulalie upturns her matron eye, while ever to her young Eulalie upturns her violet eye. End of section 26. Recording by Richie Franklin. Salt Lake City, Utah. Section 27 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Zalzivar. A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe. Take this kiss upon the brow, and, in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong, who deem that my days have been a dream, yet if hope has flown away, in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? End of section 27 Section 28 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Titus E. Garnett. To Marie Louise Show. Part 1 by Edgar Allan Poe. Of all who hail thy presence as the morning, Of all to whom thy absence is the night, The blotting utterly from out high heaven the sacred sun, Of all who, weeping, bless thee hourly for hope, for life, ah, Above all for the resurrection of deep-buried faith, In truth, 
in virtue, in humanity, of all who on despair's unhallowed bed lying down to die have suddenly arisen at thy soft murmured words, let there be light, at the soft murmured words that were fulfilled in the seraphic glancing of thine eyes, of all who owe thee most, whose gratitude nearest resembles worship, O oh, remember the truth the most fervently devoted and think that these weak lines are written by him by him who as he pens them thrills to think his spirit is communing with an angels end of section twenty eight recording by titus e garnett section twenty nine of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Titus E. Garnett To Marie Louise Show Part 2 by Edgar Allan Poe Not long ago, the writer of these lines in the mad pride of intellectuality maintained the power of words, denied that ever a thought arose within the human brain beyond the utterance of the human tongue. And now, as if in mockery of that boast, two words, two foreign softest syllables, Italian tones made only to be murmured by angels dreaming in the moonlit dew that hang like chains of pearls on Hermon Hill have stirred from out of the abyss of his heart unthought like thoughts that in the souls of thoughts richer far wider far diviner visions that even the seraph harper israfel who has the sweetest voice of all god's creatures could hope to utter and i my spells are broken the pen falls powerless from my shivering hand with thy dear name as text though bitten by thee I cannot write, I cannot speak or think, at last I cannot feel, for tis not feeling, the standing motionless upon the golden threshold of the wide open gate of dreams, gazing in trance adown the gorgeous vistas, and thrilling as I see upon the right, upon the left, and all the way along amid purple vapors far away to where the prospects terminate the only end of section 29 recording by titus e garnett section 30 of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition of volume 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The City in the Sea by Edgar Allan Poe Lo, death has reared himself a throne in a strange city lying alone far down within the dim west, where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. Their shrines and palaces and towers, time-eaten towers that tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours. Around, by lifting winds forgot, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on the long night-time of that town. But light from out the lurid sea streams up the turrets silently, Gleams up the pinnacles far and free, Up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, Up shadowy, long-forgotten bowers Of sculptured ivy and stone flowers, Up many and many a marvellous shrine, Whose wreathed friezes intertwine the vile, the violet, and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky the melancholy waters lie. 
so blend the turrets and shadows there that all seems pendulous in air while from a proud tower in the town death looks gigantically down there open fanes and gaping graves yawn level with the luminous waves but not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed for no ripples curl alas along that wilderness of glass no swellings tell that winds may be upon some far-off happier sea no heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene but lo a stir is in the air the wave there is a movement there as if the towers had thrown aside in slightly sinking the dull tide as if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmy heaven the waves have now a redder glow the hours are breathing faint and low and when amid no earthly moans down down that town shall settle hints hell rising from a thousand thrones shall do it reverence end of section thirty section thirty one of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Hirsch The Sleeper by Edgar Allan Poe At midnight in the month of June I stand beneath the mystic moon. An opiate vapor, dewy, dim, Exhales from outer golden rim, And, softly dripping, drop by drop, Upon the quiet mountain top steals drowsily and musically into the universal valley the rosemary nods upon the grave the lily lolls upon the wave wrapping the fog about its breast the ruin moulders into rest looking like late see the lake a conscious slumber seems to take and would not for the world awake all beauty sleeps and lo where lies her easement open to the skies, Irene, with her destinies. O oh, lady bright, can it be right, This window open to the night, The wanton airs from the treetop, Laughingly through the lattice drop, The bodiless airs a wizard rout, Flit through thy chamber in and out, And wave the curtain canopy so fitfully, So fearfully, above the closed and fringed lid neath which thy slumbering soul lies hid that o'er the floor and down the wall like ghosts the shadows rise and fall o lady dear hast thou no fear why and what art thou dreaming here surely thou art come her far off seas a wonder to these garden trees strange is thy pallor strange thy dress Strange above all thy length of tress, And this all solemn silentness. The lady sleeps, O oh, may her sleep, Which is enduring, so be deep. Heaven have her in its sacred keep, This chamber changed for one more holy, This bed for one more melancholy. I pray to God that she may lie Forever with unopened eye, While the dim-sheeted ghosts go by, my love, she sleeps, O oh, may her sleep, As it is lasting, so be deep. Soft may the worms about her creep, Far in the forest dim and old, For her may some tall vault unfold, Some vault that oft hath flung its black And winged panels fluttering back, Triumphant o'er the crested palls Of her grand family funerals, Some sepulchre remote alone, Against whose portal she hath thrown 
in childhood many an idle stone some tomb from out whose sounding door she ne'er shall force an echo more thrilling to think poor child of sin it was the dead who groaned within end of section thirty one Section 32 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bridal Ballad by Edgar Allan Poe. The ring is on my hand, and the wreath is on my brow satins and jewels grand are all at my command and i am happy now and my lord he loves me well but when first he breathed his vow i felt my bosom swell for the words rang as a knell and the voice seemed his who fell in the battle down the dell and who is happy now but he spoke to reassure me and he kissed my pallid brow while a reverie came o'er me and to the churchyard bore me and i sighed to him before me thinking him dead delore me oh i am happy now and thus the words were spoken and this the plighted vow and though my faith be broken and though my heart be broken behold the golden token that proves me happy now would god i could awaken for I dream I know not how, and my soul is sorely shaken, lest an evil step be taken, lest the dead who is forsaken may not be happy now. End of section 32 Section 33 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Lenore by Edgar Allan Poe Ah, broken is the golden bowl, the spirit flown forever. Let the bell toll, a saintly soul floats on the Stygian river. And Guy de Ver, hast thou no tear, weep now or never more. See, on yon drear and rigid bier, low lies thy love, Lenore. Come, let the burial rite be read, the funeral song be sung, an anthem for the queenliest dead that ever died so young a dirge for her the doubly dead in that she died so young wretches ye loved her for her wealth and hated her for her pride and when she fell in the feeble health ye blessed her that she died how shall the ritual then be read the requiem how be sung by you by yours the evil eye by yours the slanderous tongue that did to death the innocent that died and died so young peccavimus but rave not thus and let a sabbath song go up to god so solemnly the dead may feel so wrong the sweet lenore hath gone before with hope that flew beside leaving thee wild for the dear child that should have been thy bride for her the fair and debonair that now so lowly lies the life upon her yellow hair but not within her eyes the life still there upon her hair the death upon her eyes avant to-night my heart is light no dirge will i upraise but waft the angel on her flight with a paean of old days let no bell toll lest her sweet soul amid its hallowed mirth should catch the note as it doth float up from the damned earth 
to friends above from fiends below the indignant ghost is riven from hell unto a higher state far up within the heaven from grief and groan to a golden throne beside the king of heaven End of section thirty three Section thirty four of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Zaldivar. To One in Paradise by Edgar Allan Poe. Thou hast all that to me, love, for which my soul did pine, a green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine, all wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Ah, dream too bright to last, ah, starry hope that didst arise, but to be overcast. A voice from out the future cries, On, on, but o'er the past, dim gulf my spirit hovering lies, mute, motionless, aghast for alas alas with me the light of life is o'er no more no more no more such language holds the solemn sea to sands upon the shore shall bloom the thunder-blasted tree or the stricken eagle soar all my days are trances and all my nightly dreams are where thy dark eye glances and where thy footstep gleams in what ethereal dances by what eternal streams End of section thirty four Section 35 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Hirsch. The Colosseum by Edgar Allan Poe. Type of the Antique Rome. Rich reliquary of lofty contemplation left to time by buried centuries of pomp and power. At length, at length, after so many days of weary pilgrimage and burning thirst, thirst for the springs of lore that in thee lie, I kneel, an altered and an humble man, amid thy shadows, and so drink within my very soul thy grandeur, gloom, and glory. Vastness and age, and memories of eld, silence and desolation, and dim night. I feel ye now, I feel ye in your strength, O spells more sure than e'er Juden king taught in the gardens of Gethsemane, O charms more potent than the rapt Chaldee, ever drew down from out the quiet stars. Here, where a hero fell, a column falls. Here, where the mimic eagle glared in gold, a midnight vigil holds the swarthy bat. Here, where the dames of Rome their gilded hair wave to the wind, now wave the reed and thistle. Here, where on golden throne the monarch lolled, glides spectre-like unto his marble home, lit by the wan light, wan light of the horned moon, the swift and silent lizard of the stones. But stay, these walls, these ivy-clad arcades, these mouldering plinths, these sad and blackened shafts, these vague and tablatures, this crumbling frieze, these shattered cornices, this wreck, this ruin, these stones, alas, these grey stones, are they all, all of the fame and the colossal left by the corrosive hours to fade in me? Not all, the echoes answer me, not all. Prophetic sounds and loud arise forever from us, and from all ruin unto the wise as melody from Memnon to the sun. We rule the hearts of mightiest men. We rule with a despotic sway all giant minds. We are not impotent, we pallid stones. Not all our power is gone, not all our fame. Not all the magic of our high renown, not all the wonder that encircles us. Not all the mysteries that in us lie, not all the memories that hang upon and cling around about us as a garment clothing us in a robe of more than glory. End of section 35 
Section thirty six of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Hirsch. The Haunted Palace by Edgar Allan Poe. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In a monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, the winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically, to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where, sitting, Porphyrogene, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things, in robes of sorrow, assail the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never sorrow shall dawn upon him desolate, and round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim-remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now, within that valley, Through the red litten windows see vast forms That move fantastically to a discordant melody, While, lie a ghastly rapid river, Through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever, And laugh, but smile no more. End of section 36《Section 37 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Conqueror Worm by Edgar Allan Poe. Lo, tis a gala night within the lonesome latter years. An angel throng be winged be dight in veils and drowned in tears sit in a theatre to see a play of hopes and fears while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres mimes in the form of god on high mutter and mumble low and hither and thither fly mere puppets they who come and go at the bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro flapping from out their condor wings invisible woe that motley drama oh be sure it shall not be forgot with its phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not though a circle that ever returneth in to the self-same spot and much of madness and more of sin and horror the soul of the plot but see amid the mimic rout a crawling shape intrude a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude it writhes it writhes with mortal pangs the mimes become its food an angel sob at vermin fangs in human gore imbued out out are the lights out all and over each quivering form the curtain a funeral pall comes down with the rush of a storm and the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm the play is the tragedy man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. 1838. End of section 37. Section 38 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Raven edition. Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Brett Hirsch. Silence by Edgar Allan Poe. There are some qualities, some incorporate things, that have a double life, which thus is made a type of that twin entity which springs from matter and light. Evanced in solid and shade, there is a twofold silence, sea and shore, body and soul. One dwells in lonely places, newly with grass o'ergrown, some solemn graces, some human memories and tearful lore. Render him terrorless, his names no more. He is the corporate silence, dread him not. No power hath he of evil in himself, But should some urgent fate, untimely lot, Bring thee to meet his shadow, nameless elf, That haunteth the lone regions where hath trod no foot of man, Commend thyself to God. End of section 38《Section 39 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dreamland by Edgar Allan Poe. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, were an idolin named Night on a black throne reigns upright i have reached these lands but newly from an ultimate dim thule from a wild weird clime that lieth sublime out of space out of time bottomless vales and boundless floods and chasms and caves and titian woods with forms that no man can discover for the dews that drip all over mountains toppling evermore into seas without a shore seas that restlessly aspire surging unto skies of fire lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters lone and dead their still waters still and chilly with the snows of the lolling lily but the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters lone and dead their sad waters sad and chilly with the snows of the lolling lily by the mountains near the river murmuring lowly murmuring ever by the gray woods by the swamp where the toad and the newt encamp by the dismal tarns and pools where dwell the ghouls by each spot the most unholy in each nook most melancholy there the traveller meets aghast sheeted memories of the past shrouded forms that start and sigh as they pass the wanderer by white-robed forms of friends long given in agony to earth and heaven for the heart whose woes are legion tis a peaceful soothing region for the spirit that walks in shadow tis oh tis an el dorado but the traveller travelling through it may not dare not openly view it never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed so wills its king who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid and thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it but through darkened glasses by a route obscure and lonely haunted by ill angels only were an idolin named night on a black throne reigns upright i have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim thule 1844 end of section 39 recording by richie franklin salt lake city utah Section 40 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hymns by Edgar Allan Poe At morn, at noon, a twilight dim. Maria, thou hast heard my hymn. In joy and woe, in good and ill mother of god be with me still when the hours flew brightly by and not a cloud obscured the sky my soul lest it should truant be thy grace did guide to thine and thee now when storms of fate o'ercast darkly my present and my past let my future radiant shine with sweet hopes 
of thee and thine. End of section 40. Section 41 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. To Zante by Edgar Allan Poe. Fair Isle, that from the fairest of all flowers, thy gentlest of all gentle names dost take, how many memories of what radiant hours at sight of thee and thine at once awake, how many scenes of what departed bliss, how many thoughts of what entombed hopes, how many visions of a maiden that is no more, no more upon thy verdant slopes, no more, alas, that magical sad sound transforming all, thy charm shall please no more, thy memory no more, a cursed ground, henceforth I hold thy flowery enameled shore, O hyacinthine isle, O purple zante, Isoa de Or, Fior de Levante. eighteen thirty seven. End of section forty one. Section 42 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scenes from Politian, an unpublished drama by Edgar Allan Poe. Dramatis Personae. Narrator, read by Ellen Preckel. Alessandra, read by Amanda Friday. Castiglione, read by Phil Schempf. Di Broglio, read by Algy Pug. La Lage, read by Pam Castile. Yacinta, read by Abai. Monk, read by Larry Wilson. Baldazar, read by Tricia G. Politian, read by Alan Rose. Voice, sung by Francis Brown. Benito, read by Larry Wilson. Scene one rome a hall in a palace alessandra and castiglione thou art sad castiglione sad not i oh i am the happiest happiest man in rome a few days more thou knowest my alessandra will make thee mine oh i am very happy methinks thou hast a singular way of showing thy happiness what ails thee cousin of mine why didst thou sigh so deeply did i sigh i was not conscious of it it is a fashion, a silly, a most silly fashion I have when I am very happy. Did I sigh? Sighing. Thou didst. Thou art not well. Thou hast indulged too much of late, and I am vexed to see it. Late hours and wine, Castiglione, these will ruin thee. Thou art already altered. Thy looks are haggard. Nothing so wears away the constitution as late hours and wine. Castiglione, musing nothing fair cousin nothing not even deep sorrow wears it away like evil hours and wine i will amend do it i would have thee drop thy riotous company too fellows low-born ill suit the like with old de broglio's heir and alessandra's husband i will drop them thou wilt thou must attend thou also more to thy dress and equipage they are over plain for thy lofty rank and fashion much depends upon appearances i'll see to it then see to it pay more attention sir to a becoming carriage much thou wantest in dignity much much oh much i want in proper dignity alessandra haughtily thou mockest me sir castiglione abstractedly sweet gentle lalage heard i aright i speak to him he speaks of Lalage, Sir Count. Places her hand on his shoulder. What art thou dreaming? He's not well. What ails thee, sir? Castiglione, startling. Cousin, fair cousin. Madame, I crave thy pardon. Indeed, I am not well. Your hand from off my shoulder, if you please. This air is most oppressive. Madame the Duke. 
Enter de Broglio. My son, I've news for thee. Hey, what's the matter? Observing Alessandra. Eat the pouts. Kiss her, Castiglione. Kiss her, you dog, and make it up, I say, this minute. I've news for you both. Politian is expected hourly in Rome. Politian, Earl of Leicester. We'll have him at the wedding. Tis his first visit to the imperial city. What? Politiana Britain, Earl of Leicester? The same, my love. We'll have him at the wedding. A man quite young in years, but grey in fame. I have not seen him, but rumour speaks of him as a prodigy, pre-eminent in arts and arms, and wealth, and high descent. We'll have him at the wedding. I have heard much of this Politian. Gay, volatile, and giddy, is he not? And little given to thinking. Far from it, love. No branch, they say, of all philosophy, so deep, abstruse, he has not mastered it. Learned as few are learned. Tis very strange. I have known men have seen Politian, and sought his company. They speak of him as of one who entered madly into life, drinking the cup of pleasure to the dregs. Ridiculous! No, I have seen Politian, and know him well. Nor learned, nor mirthful he. He is a dreamer, and a man shut out from common passions. Children, we disagree. Let us go forth and taste the fragrant air of the garden. Did I dream, or did I hear Politian was a melancholy man? Exeunt. Scene 2. Rome. A lady's apartment with a window open and looking into a garden. Lalage in deep mourning, reading at a table on which lie some books and a hand mirror. In the background, Asinta, a servant maid, leans carelessly upon a chair. Asinta, is it thou? Asinta, pertly. Yes, ma'am, I am here. I did not know, Asinta, you were in waiting. Sit down, let not my presence trouble you. Sit down, for I am humble, most humble. Asinta, aside. "'Tis time.' Jacinta seats herself in a side-long manner upon the chair, resting her elbows upon the back, and regarding her mistress with a contemptuous look. Lalage continues to read. "'It, in another climate, so he said, bore a bright golden flower, but not in this soil.' Pauses, turns over some leaves, and resumes. "'No lingering winters there, nor snow, nor shower, but ocean ever to refresh mankind, breathes the shrill spirit of the western wind. O oh, beautiful, most beautiful, how like to what my fevered soul doth dream of heaven, O oh, happy land! Pauses. She died, the maiden died, a still more happy maiden who couldst die, Asinta. Asinta returns no answer, and Lalage presently resumes. Again a similar tale, told of a beauteous dame beyond the sea. Thus speaketh one Ferdinand in the words of the play. She died full young. One Bosola answers him. I think not so. Her infelicity seemed to have years too many. Ah, luckless lady, Asinta. Still no answer. Here's a far sterner story, but like, oh, very like in its despair of that Egyptian queen, winning so easily a thousand hearts, losing at length her own. She died, thus ended the history, and her maids, lean over and weep, two gentle maids, with gentle names, Iros and Charmion, Rainbow and Dove, Asinta. Asinta, pettishly. Madam, what is it? Wilt thou, my good Asenta, be so kind as go down in the library and bring me the holy evangelist? Pshaw! Exit. If there be balm for the wounded spirit in Gilead, it is there. Do in the night-time of my bitter trouble. Will there be found dew sweeter far than that which hangs like chains of pearl on Hermon Hill? Re-enter Jacinta and throws a volume on the table. There, ma'am's the book. Indeed, she is very troublesome. Aside. Lalage, astonished. What didst thou say, Asenta? 
have i done aught to grieve thee or to vex thee i am sorry for thou hast served me long and ever been trustworthy and respectful resumes her reading i can't believe she has any more jewels no no she gave me all aside what didst thou say asenta now i bethink me thou hast not spoken lately of thy wedding how fares good ugo and when is it to be can i do aught is there no farther aid thou needest asenta is there no farther aid oh that's meant for me aside i'm sure madam you need not be always throwing those jewels in my teeth jewels asenta now indeed asenta i thought not of the jewels oh perhaps not but then i might have sworn it after all there's hugo who says the ring is only paste for he's sure the count castiglione never would have given a real diamond to such as you and at the best i'm certain madam you cannot have use for jewels now but i might have sworn it exit lalage bursts into tears and leans her head upon the table after a short pause raises it poor lalage and is it come to this thy servant maid but courage tis but a viper whom thou hast cherished to sting thee to the soul taking up the mirror ha ah, here at least is a friend too much a friend in earlier days a friend will not deceive thee fair mirror and true now tell me for thou canst a tale a pretty tale and heed thou not though it be rife with woe it answers me it speaks of sunken eyes and wasted cheeks and beauty long deceased remembers me of joy departed hope the seraph hope inurned and entombed now in a tone low sad and solemn but most audible whispers of early grave untimely yawning for ruined maid fair mirror and true thou liest not thou hast no end to gain no heart to break castilion lied who said he loved thou true he false 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 while she speaks a monk enters her apartment and approaches unobserved refuge thou hast sweet daughter in heaven think of eternal things give up thy soul to penitence and pray lalage arising hurriedly i cannot pray my soul is at war with god the frightful sounds of merriment below disturb my senses go i cannot pray the sweet airs from the garden worry me thy presence grieves me go thy priestly raiment fills me with dread thy ebony crucifix with horror and awe think of thy precious soul think of my early days think of my father and mother in heaven think of our quiet home and the rivulet that ran before the door think of my little sisters think of them and think of me think of my trusting love and confidence his vows my ruin think think of my unspeakable misery be gone yet stay yet stay what was it thou saidst of prayer and penitence didst thou not speak of faith and vows before the throne i did tis well there is a vow where fitting should be made a sacred vow imperative and urgent a solemn vow daughter this zeal is well father this zeal is anything but well hast thou a crucifix fit for this thing a crucifix whereon to register this sacred vow he hands her his own not that oh no 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 shuddering not that not that i tell thee holy man thy raiments and thy ebony cross affright me stand back i have a crucifix myself i have a crucifix methinks twere fitting the deed the vow the symbol of the deed and the deed's register should tally father draws a cross-handled dagger and raises it on high behold the cross wherewith a vow like mine is written in heaven thy words are madness daughter and speak a purpose unholy 
thy lips are livid thine eyes are wild tempt not the wrath divine pause ere too late oh be not be not rash swear not the oath oh swear it not tis sworn scene three an apartment in a palace politian and balthazar arouse thee now politian thou must not nay indeed indeed shalt not give away unto these humours be thyself shake off the idle fancies that beset thee and live for now thou diest not so balthazar surely i live politian it doth grieve me to see thee thus balthazar it doth grieve me to give thee cause for grief my honoured friend command me sir what wouldst thou have me do at thy behest i will shake off that nature which from my forefathers i did inherit which with my mother's milk i did imbibe and be no more pollution but some other command me sir to the field then to the field to the senate or the field alas alas there is an imp would follow me even there there is an imp hath followed me even there there is what voice was that i heard it not i heard not any voice except thine own and the echo of thine own then i but dreamed give not thy soul to dreams the camp the court befit thee fame awaits thee glory calls and her the trumpet tongued thou wilt not hear in hearkening to imaginary sounds and phantom voices it is a phantom voice didst thou not hear it then i heard it not thou heardst it not baldazar speak no more to me pollution of thy camps and courts oh i am sick 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 even unto death of the hollow and high-sounding vanities of the populous earth bear with me yet a while we have been boys together schoolfellows and now our friends yet shall not be so long for in the eternal city thou shalt do me a kind and gentle office and a power a power august benignant and supreme shall then absolve thee of all further duties unto thy friend thou speakest a fearful riddle i will not understand yet now as fate approaches and the hours are breathing low the sands of time are changed to golden grains and dazzle me baldassar alas alas i cannot die having within my heart so keen a relish for the beautiful as hath been kindled within it methinks the air is balmier now than it was wont to be rich melodies are floating in the winds a rarer loveliness bedecks the earth and with a holier lustre the quiet moon sitteth in heaven hist hist thou canst not say thou hearest not now balthazar indeed i hear not not hear it listen now listen the faintest sound and yet the sweetest that ear ever heard a lady's voice and sorrow in the tone baldassar it oppresses me like a spell again again how solemnly it falls into my heart of hearts that eloquent voice surely i never heard yet it were well had i but heard it with its thrilling tones in earlier days i myself hear it now be still the voice if i mistake not greatly proceeds from yonder lattice which you may see very plainly through the window it belongs does it not unto this palace of the duke the singer is undoubtedly beneath the roof of his excellency and perhaps is even that alessandra of whom he spoke as the betrothed of castiglione his son and heir be still it comes again voice very faintly and is thy heart so strong as for to leave me thus who can love thee so long wealth and woe among and is thy heart so strong as for to leave me thus say nay say nay the song is english and i oft have heard it in merry england 
never so plaintively. Hist, hist, it comes again. Voice more loudly. Is it so strong as for to leave me thus? Who hath loved thee so long in wealth and woe abound? And is thy heart so strong as for to leave me thus? Say nay, say nay. Tis hushed, and all is still. All is not still. Let us go down. Go down, Balthazar, go. The hour is growing late, the duke awaits us. Thy presence is expected in the hall below. What ails thee, Earl Politian? Voice distinctly. Who hath loved thee so long in wealth and woe abound? And is thy heart so strong? Say nay, say nay. Let us descend, tis time. Politian, give these fancies to the wind. Remember, pray, your bearing lately savoured much of rudeness unto the duke. Arouse thee, and remember— Remember? I do. Lead on, I do remember. Going. Let us descend. Believe me, I would give, freely would give, the broad lands of my earldom to look upon the face hidden by yon lattice, to gaze upon that veiled face and hear once more that silent tongue. Let me beg you, sir, descend with me. The duke may be offended. Let us go down, I pray you. Voice loudly. Say nay, say nay. Politian aside. Tis strange, tis very strange. Methought the voice chimed in with my desires, and bade me stay. Approaching the window. Sweet voice, I heed thee, and will surely stay. Now be this fancy, by heaven, or be it fate, still I will not descend. Baldazar, make apology unto the duke for me. I go not down to-night. Your lordship's pleasure shall be attended to. Good night, Politian. Good night, my friend. Good night. Scene 4 the gardens of a palace moonlight lalage and politian and dost thou speak of love to be politian dost thou speak of love to lalage ah woe ah woe is me this mockery is most cruel most cruel indeed weep not o oh, sob not thus thy bitter tears will madden me o oh, mourn not lalage be comforted i know I know it all, and still I speak of love. Look at me, brightest and beautiful Lalage, turn here thine eyes. Thou askest me if I could speak of love, knowing what I know, and seeing what I have seen. Thou askest me that, and thus I answer thee, thus on my bended knee I answer thee. Kneeling. Sweet Lalage, I love thee, love thee, love thee. Through good and ill, through weal and woe, I love thee. Not mother with her firstborn on her knee thrills with intenser love than I for thee. Not on God's altar in any time or clime burned there a holier fire than burneth now within my spirit for thee. And do I love? Arising. Even for thy woes I love thee, even for thy woes, thy beauty and thy woes. Alas, proud earl, thou dost forget thyself remembering me how in thy father's halls among the maidens pure and reproachless of thy princely line could the dishonoured lalage abide thy wife and with a tainted memory my seared and blighted name how would it tally with the ancestral honours of thy house and with thy glory speak not to me of glory i hate i loathe the name i do abhor the unsatisfactory and ideal thing Art thou not Lalage and I Politian? Do I not love? Art thou not beautiful? What need we more? Ha! Ah, glory! Now speak not of it. By all I hold most sacred and most solemn, by all my wishes now, my fears hereafter, by all I scorn on earth and hope in heaven, 
there is no deed i would more glory in than in thy cause to scoff at this same glory and trample it under foot what matters it what matters it my fairest and my best that we go down unhonored and forgotten into the dust so we descend together descend together and then and then perchance why dost thou pause politian and then perchance arise together alage and roam the starry and quiet dwellings of the blessed and still why dost thou pause politian and still together together now earl of leicester thou lovest me and in my heart of hearts i feel thou lovest me truly oh lalage throwing himself upon his knee and lovest thou me hist hush within the gloom of yonder trees methought a figure passed a spectral figure solemn and slow and noiseless like the grim shadow conscience solemn and noiseless walks across and returns i was mistaken twas but a giant bow stirred by the autumn wind politian my lalage my love why art thou moved why dost thou turn so pale not conscience self far less a shadow which thou likeness to it should shake the firm spirit thus but the night wind is chilly and these melancholy boughs throw over all things a gloom politian thou speakest to me of love knowest thou the land with which all tongues are busy a land new found miraculously found by one of genoa a thousand leagues within the golden west a fairy land of flowers and fruit and sunshine and crystal lakes and overarching forest and mountains around whose towering summits the winds of heaven untrammelled flow which air to breathe is happiness now and will be freedom hereafter in days that are to come oh wilt thou wilt thou fly to that paradise my lalage wilt thou fly thither with me there care shall be forgotten and sorrow shall be no more and eros be all and life shall then be mine for i will live for thee and in thine eyes and thou shalt be no more a mourner but the radiant joys shall wait upon thee and the angel hope attend thee for ever and i will kneel to thee and worship thee and call thee my beloved my own my beautiful my love my wife my all oh wilt thou wilt thou lalage fly thither with me a deed is to be done castiglione lives and he shall die exit lalage after a pause and he shall die alas castiglione die who spoke the words where am i what was it he said politian thou art not gone thou art not gone politian i feel thou art not gone yet dare not look lest i behold thee not thou couldst not go with those words upon thy lips oh speak to me and let me hear thy voice one word one word to say thou art not gone one little sentence to say how thou dost scorn how thou dost hate my womanly weakness ha <laughs> ha thou art not gone oh speak to me i knew thou wouldst not go i knew thou wouldst not go couldst not durst not go villain thou art not gone thou mockest me and thus i clutch thee thus he is gone he is gone 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 where am i tis well tis very well so that the blade be keen the blow be sure tis well tis very well alas alas scene five the suburbs politian alone this weakness grows upon me i am faint and much i fear me ill it will not do to die ere i have lived stay stay thy hand o azrael yet awhile prince of the powers of darkness and the tomb o pity me o pity me let me not perish now in the budding of my paradisal hope give me to live yet yet a little while tis i who pray for life i who so late demanded but to die what saith the count 
Enter Baldazar. That knowing no cause of quarrel or of feud between the Earl Politian and himself, he doth decline your cartel. What didst thou say? What answer was it who brought me good Baldazar? With what excessive fragrance the zephyr comes laden from yonder bowers? A fairer day, or one more worthy Italy, methinks no mortal eyes have seen. What said the Count? That he, Castiglione, not being aware of any feud existing, or any cause of quarrel between your lordship and himself, cannot accept the challenge. It is most true. All this is very true. When saw you, sir, when saw you now Baldazar in the frigid, ungenial Britain which we left so lately, a heaven so calm as this, so utterly free from the evil taint of clouds? And he did say? No more, my lord, than I have told you, sir. The Count Castiglione will not fight, having no cause for quarrel. Now this is true, all very true. Thou art my friend, Baldazar, and I have not forgotten it. Thou do me a piece of service. Wilt thou go back and say unto this man that I, the Earl of Leicester, hold him a villain? Thus much, I prithee, say unto the Count, it is exceeding just he should have cause for quarrel. My lord, my friend! Politian aside. Tis he. He comes himself. Aloud. Thou reasonest well. I know what thou wouldst say. Not send the message. Well, I will think of it. I will not send it. Now, prithee, leave me. Hither doth come a person with whom affairs have a most private nature I would adjust. I go. Tomorrow we meet, do we not, at the Vatican. At the Vatican. Exit Balthazar. Enter Castiglione. The Earl of Leicester here. I am the Earl of Leicester, and thou seest, dost thou not, that I am here. My lord, some strange, some singular mistake, misunderstanding hath without a doubt arisen. Thou hast been urged thereby, in the heat of anger, to address some words most unaccountable in writing to me, Castiglione, the bearer being Baldazar, Duke of Surrey. I am aware of nothing which might warrant thee in this thing, having given thee no offence. Ha! Am I right? Twas a mistake, undoubtedly. We all do err at times. Draw, villain, and prate no more. Ha! Draw? And villain? Have at thee then at once, proud earl. Draws. Politian, drawing. Thus to the expiatory tomb, untimely sepulchre, I do devote thee in the name of lalage castiglione letting fall his sword and recoiling to the extremity of the stage of lalage hold off thy sacred hand avaunt i say avaunt i will not fight thee indeed i dare not thou wilt not fight with me didst say sir count shall i be baffled thus now this is well didst say thou darest not ah i dare not dare not Hold off thy hand. With that beloved name so fresh upon thy lips, I will not fight thee. I cannot, dare not. Now by my halidome I do believe thee. Coward, I do believe thee. Ha! Coward, this may not be. Clutches his sword and staggers toward Politian, but his purpose is changed before reaching him, and he falls upon his knee at the feet of the earl. Alas, my lord, it is, it is most true in such a cause i am the veriest coward oh pity me politian greatly softened alas i do indeed i pity thee and lalage scoundrel arise and die it needeth not be thus thus oh let me die thus on my bended knee it were most fitting that in this deep humiliation i perish for in the fight I will not raise a hand against thee, Earl of Leicester. Strike thou home. Bearing his bosom. Here is no let or hindrance to thy weapon. Strike home. I will not fight thee. Now, death and hell, am I not, am I not sorely, grievously tempted to take thee at thy word? But mark me, sir, think not to ply me thus. Do thou prepare for public insult in the streets, before the eyes of the citizens i'll follow thee like an avenging spirit i'll follow thee even unto death 
before those whom thou lovest, before all Rome, I'll taunt thee, villain, I'll taunt thee, dost hear? With cowardice, thou wilt not fight me, thou liest, thou shalt. Exit. Now this indeed is just, most righteous and most just, avenging heaven. Note. Such portions of Politian as are known to the public first saw the light of publicity in the Southern Literary Messenger for December 1835 and January 1836, being styled Scenes from Politian, an Unpublished Drama. These scenes were included, unaltered, in the 1845 collection of Poems by Poe. The larger portion of the original draft subsequently became the property of the present editor, but it is not considered just to the poet's memory to publish it. The work is a hasty and unrevised production of its author's earlier days of literary labor, and beyond the scenes already known, scarcely calculated to enhance his reputation. As a specimen, however, of the parts unpublished, the following fragment from the first scene of Act Two may be offered. The Duke, it should be premised, is uncle to Alessandra, and father of Castiglione, her betrothed. Why do you laugh? Indeed, I hardly know myself stay was it not on yesterday we were speaking of the earl of the earl politian yes it was yesterday alessandra you and i and you must remember we were walking in the garden perfectly i do remember it what of it what then oh nothing nothing at all nothing at all it is most singular that you should laugh at nothing at all most singular singular look you castiglione be so kind as tell me sir at once what did you mean what are you talking of was it not so we differed in opinion touching him him whom why sir the earl politian the earl of leicester yes is it he you mean we differed indeed if now i recollect the words you used were that the earl you knew was neither learned nor mirthful ha <laughs> now did i that did you sir and well i knew at the time you were wrong it being not the character of the earl whom all the world allows to be a most hilarious man be not my son too positive again tis singular most singular I could not think it possible so little time could so much alter one. To say the truth, about an hour ago, as I was walking with the Count San Ozo, all arm in arm we met this very man, the Earl, he with his friend Baldassar, having just arrived in Rome. Ha! <laughs> he is altered. Such an account he gave me of his journey. T'would have made you die with laughter, such tales he told of his caprices and his merry freaks along the road such oddity such humour such wit such whim such flashes of wild merriment set off too in such full relief by the grave demeanour of his friend who to speak the truth was gravity itself did i not tell you you did and yet tis strange but true as strange how much i was mistaken i always thought the earl a gloomy man so so you see be not too positive. Whom have we here? It cannot be the Earl. The Earl? Oh, no. Tis not the Earl, but yet it is, and leading upon his friend Baldassar. Am welcome, sir. Enter Politian and Baldassar. My lord, a second welcome let me give you to Rome. His Grace, the Duke of Broglio. Father, this is the Earl Politian, Earl of Leicester in Great Britain. Politian bows haughtily. That is friend Baldassar, Duke of Surrey. The Earl has letters, so please you for your grace. Ha, ha! Most welcome to Rome, and to our palace, Earl Politian. And you, most noble Duke, I am glad to see you. I knew your father well, my lord Politian. Castiglione, call your cousin hither, and let me make the noble Earl acquainted with your betrothed. You come, sir, at a time most seasonable. The wedding— Touching those letters, sir, your son made mention of. Your son, is he not? Touching those letters, sir, I wot not of them. If such there be, my friend Baldassar here— Baldassar, ah! My friend Baldassar here will hand them to your grace. 
I would retire. Retire? So soon? What ho, Benito, Rupert, his lordship's chambers. Show his lordship to them. His lordship is unwell. Enter Benito. This way, my lord. Exit, followed by Politian. Retire? Unwell. So please you, sir, I fear me, tis as you say, his lordship is unwell. The damp air of the evening, the fatigue of a long journey, the— Indeed I had better follow his lordship, he must be unwell. I will return anon. Return anon? Now this is very strange. Castiglione, this way, my son, I wish to speak with thee. You surely were mistaken in what you said of the earl, mirthful indeed. Which of us said Politian was a melancholy man? Exeunt. End of section 42. Section 43 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Daly Letter to Mr. B. by Edgar Allan Poe West Point, 1831 Dear B., believing only a portion of my former volume to be worthy a second edition, that small portion I thought it as well to include in the present book as to republish by itself. I have therefore herein combined Al-Araf and Tamerlane with other poems hitherto unprinted. Nor have I hesitated to insert from the minor poems, now omitted, whole lines and even passages, to the end that being placed in a fair light and the trash shaken from them in which they are embedded, they may have some chance of being seen by posterity. It has been said that a good critique on a poem may be written by one who is no poet himself. This, according to your idea in mine of poetry, I feel to be false. The less poetical the critic, the less just the critique, and the converse. On this account, and because there are but few bees in the world, I would be as much ashamed of the world's good opinion as proud of your own. Another than yourself might here observe, Shakespeare is in possession of the world's good opinion, and yet Shakespeare is the greatest of poets. It appears then that the world judge correctly. Why should you be ashamed of their favorable judgment? The difficulty lies in the interpretation of the word judgment or opinion. The opinion is the world's, truly, but it may be called theirs as a man would call a book his, having bought it. He did not write the book, but it is his. They did not originate the opinion, but it is theirs. A fool, for example, thinks Shakespeare a great poet. Yet the fool has never read Shakespeare. But the fool's neighbor, who is a step higher on the Andes of the mind, whose head, that is to say, his more exalted thought, is too far above the fool to be seen or understood, but whose feet, by which I mean his everyday actions, are sufficiently near to be discerned, and by means of which that superiority is ascertained, which but for them would never have been discovered. This neighbor asserts that Shakespeare is a great poet. The fool believes him, and it is henceforward his opinion. This neighbor's own opinion has, in like manner, been adopted from one above him, and so ascendingly to a few gifted individuals who kneel around the summit, beholding, face to face, the master spirit who stands upon the pinnacle. You are aware of the great barrier in the path of an American writer. He is read, if at all, in preference to the combined and established wit of the world. I say established, for it is with literature as with law or empire. An established name is an estate in tenure, or a throne in possession. Besides, one might suppose that books, like their authors, improve by travel. Their having crossed the sea is, with us, so great a distinction. Our antiquaries abandon time for distance. Our very fops glance from the binding to the bottom of the title page, where the mystic characters which spell London, Paris, or Genoa are precisely so many letters of recommendation. I mentioned just now a vulgar error as regards criticism. I think the notion that no poet can form a correct estimate of his own writings is another. I remarked before that in proportion to the poetical talent would be the justice of a critique upon poetry. Therefore a bad poet would, I grant, make a false critique, and his self-love would infallibly bias his little judgment in his favor. But a poet, who is indeed a poet, 
could not, I think, fail of making a just critique. Whatever should be deducted on the score of self-love might be replaced on account of his intimate acquaintance with the subject. In short, we have more instances of false criticism than of just where one's own writings are the test, simply because we have more bad poets than good. There are, of course, many objections to what I say. Milton is a great example of the contrary. But his opinion with respect to the paradise regained is by no means fairly ascertained. By what trivial circumstances men are often led to assert what they do not really believe? Perhaps an inadvertent word has descended to posterity. But, in fact, the paradise regained is little, if at all, inferior to the paradise lost, and is only supposed so to be because men do not like epics, whatever they may say to the contrary, in reading those of Milton in their natural order, are too much wearied with the first to derive any pleasure from the second. I dare say Milton preferred Comus to either. If so, justly. As I am speaking of poetry, it will not be amiss to touch slightly upon the most singular heresy in its modern history, the heresy of what is called, very foolishly, the Lake School. Some years ago I might have been induced, by an occasion like the present, to attempt a formal refutation of their doctrine. At present it would be a work of supererogation. The wise must bow to the wisdom of such men as Coleridge and Southey, but, being wise, have laughed at poetical theories so prosaically exemplified. Aristotle, with singular assurance, has declared poetry the most philosophical of all writings. But it required a Wordsworth to pronounce it the most metaphysical. He seems to think that the end of poetry is, or should be, instruction. Yet it is a truism that the end of our existence is happiness. If so, the end of every separate part of our existence, everything connected with our existence, should be still happiness. Therefore, the end of instruction should be happiness and happiness is another name for pleasure. Therefore, the end of instruction should be pleasure. Yet we see the above-mentioned opinion implies precisely the reverse. To proceed, ceteris paribus, he who pleases is of more importance to his fellow men than he who instructs, since utility is happiness, and pleasure is the end already obtained, which instruction is merely the means of obtaining. I see no reason then, why our metaphysical poets should plume themselves so much on the utility of their works, unless indeed they refer to instruction with eternity in view, in which case sincere respect for their piety would not allow me to express my contempt for their judgment, contempt which it would be difficult to conceal, since their writings are professedly to be understood by the few, and it is the many who stand in need of salvation. In such case I should no doubt be tempted to think of the devil in Melmer, who labors indefatigably through three octavo volumes to accomplish the destruction of one or two souls, while any common devil would have demolished one or two thousand. Against the subtleties which would make poetry a study, not a passion, it becomes the metaphysician to reason, but the poet to protest. Yet Wordsworth and Coleridge are men in years, the one imbued in contemplation from his childhood, the other a giant in intellect and learning. The diffidence, then, with which I venture to dispute their authority would be overwhelming did I not feel, from the bottom of my heart, that learning has little to do with the imagination, intellect with the passions, or age with poetry. Trifles like straws upon the surface flow. He who would search for pearls must dive below. Are lines which have not done much mischief. As regards the greater truths, men oftener err by seeking them at the bottom than at the top. Truth lies in the huge abysses where wisdom is sought, not in the palpable palaces where she is found. The ancients were not always right in hiding, the goddess in a well. Witness the light which Bacon has thrown upon philosophy. Witness the principles of our divine faith, the moral mechanism by which the simplicity of a child may overbalance the wisdom of a man. We see an instance of Coleridge's liability to err in his Biographia Literaria, professedly his literary life and opinions. But in fact, a treatise de omnes scibile et quibidum alis, he goes wrong by reason of his very profundity and of his error we have a natural type in the contemplation of a star. He who regards it directly and intensely sees, it is true, the star, but it is the star without a ray, while he who surveys it less inquisitively is conscious of all for which the star is useful to us below, its brilliancy and its beauty. As to Wordsworth, I have no faith in him. That he had in youth the feelings of a poet I believe, for there are glimpses of extreme delicacy in his writings. And delicacy is the poet's own kingdom, his El Dorado. 
but they have the appearance of a better day recollected, and glimpses at best are little evidence of present poetic fire. We know that a few straggling flowers spring up daily in the crevices of the glacier. He was to blame in wearing away his youth in contemplation with the end of poetizing in his manhood. With the increase of his judgment, the light which should make it apparent has faded away. His judgment, consequently, is too correct. This may not be understood, but the old Goths of Germany would have understood it, who used to debate matters of importance to their state twice, once when drunk and once when sober. Sober that they might not be deficient in formality, drunk lest they should be destitute of vigor. The long wordy discussions by which he tries to reason us into admiration of his poetry speak very little in his favor. They are full of such assertions as this. I have opened one of his volumes at random. Of genius, the only proof is the act of doing well what is worthy to be done, and what was never done before. Indeed, then it follows that in doing what is unworthy to be done, or what has been done before, no genius can be evinced. Yet the picking of pockets is an unworthy act. Pockets have been picked time immemorial, and Barrington, the pickpocket and point of genius, would have thought hard of a comparison with William Wordsworth, the poet. Again, in estimating the merit of certain poems, whether they be Ossians or Macphersons, can surely be of little consequence. Yet, in order to prove their worthlessness, Mr. W. has expended many pages in the controversy. Tantaine animis? Can great minds descend to such absurdity? But worse still, that he may bear down every argument in favor of these poems. He triumphantly drags forward a passage, and his abomination with which he expects the reader to sympathize. It is the beginning of the epic poem Tamora. The blue waves of Olin roll in light. The green hills are covered with day. Trees shake their dusty heads in the breeze. And this is gorgeous, yet simple imagery, where all is alive and panting with immortality. This, William Wordsworth, the author of Peter Bell, has selected for his contempt. We shall see what better he, in his own person, has to offer. Imprimus. And now she's at the pony's tail. And now she's at the pony's head on that side now, and now on this, and almost stifled with her bliss. A few sad tears does Betty shed. She pats the pony, where or when, she knows not. Happy Betty Foy, oh Johnny, never mind the doctor. Secondly, the dew was falling fast. The stars began to blink. I heard a voice. It said, drink, pretty creature, drink. And looking o'er the hedge, before me I espied a snow-white mountain lamb with a maiden at its side. No other sheep was near, the lamb was all alone, and by a slender cord was tethered to a stone. Now, we have no doubt this is all true. We will believe it, indeed we will, Mr. W. Is it sympathy for the sheep you wish to excite? I love a sheep from the bottom of my heart. But there are occasions, dear B, there are occasions when even Wordsworth is reasonable. Even Stomble, it is said, shall have an end, and the most unlucky blunders must come to a conclusion. Here is an extract from his preface. Those who have been accustomed to the phraseology of modem writers, if they persist in reading this book to a conclusion, impossible, will, no doubt, have to struggle with feelings of awkwardness. <laughs> they will look round for poetry, <laughs> and will be induced to inquire by what species of courtesy these attempts have been permitted to assume that title. <laughs> Yet let not Mr. W. despair. He has given immortality to a wagon, and the bee Sophocles has transmitted to eternity a sore toe, and dignified a tragedy with a chorus of turkeys. Of Coleridge I cannot speak but with reverence, his towering intellect, his gigantic power. To use an author quoted by himself, te trouve souvent que la plupart de ces de entraison dans une bonne partie de quelles avancent, mais non pas en quelles n'entend. To employ his own language, he has imprisoned his own conceptions by the barrier he has erected against those of others. It is lamentable to think that such a mind should be buried in metaphysics, and like the Nicontus, waste its perfume upon the night alone. In reading that man's poetry, I tremble like one who stands upon a volcano, conscious from the very darkness bursting from the crater of the fire and the light that are weltering below. What is poetry? Poetry! That Proteus-like idea! with as many appellations as the nine-titled Corsaira. Give me, I demanded of a scholar some time ago, give me a definition of poetry. Très volonté. And he proceeded to his library, brought me a Dr. Johnson, and overwhelmed me with a definition. Shade of the immortal Shakespeare, 
i imagine to myself the scowl of your spiritual eye upon the profanity of that scurrilous ursa major think of poetry dear b think of poetry and then think of dr samuel johnson think of all that is airy and fairy-like and then of all that is hideous and unwieldy think of his huge bulk the elephant and then and then think of the tempest the midsummer night's dream prospero oberon and titania a poem in my opinion is opposed to a work of science by having for its immediate object pleasure not truth to romance by having for its object an indefinite instead of a definite pleasure being a poem only so far as this object is attained romance presenting perceptible images with definite poetry with indefinite sensations to which end music is an essential since the comprehension of sweet sound is our most indefinite conception music when combined with a pleasurable idea is poetry music without the idea is simply music the idea without the music is prose from its very definitiveness what was meant by the invective against him who had no music in his soul to sum up this long rigmarole i have dear b what you no doubt perceive for the metaphysical poets as poets the most sovereign contempt that they have followers proves nothing no indian prince has to his palace more followers than a thief to the gallows end of section forty three section forty four of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Hirsch Sonnet to Science by Edgar Allan Poe Science, true daughter of old time thou art, who alterest all things with thy peering eyes, why prayest thou thus upon the poet's heart? Fulcher, whose wings are dull realities, how should he love thee, or how deem thee wise? Who wouldst not leave him in his wandering to seek for treasure in the jewelled skies, albeit he soared with an undaunted wing? Hast thou not dragged Diana from her car, and driven the Hamadryad from the wood to seek a shelter in some happier star? Hast thou not torn the Naiad from her flood, the elfin from the green grass, and from me the summer dream beneath the tamarind tree? End of section forty four. Section 45 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Al Araf by Edgar Allan Poe. Part 1. Oh, nothing earthly save the ray thrown back from flowers of beauty's eye as from those gardens where the day springs from the gems of Cherkassy. Oh, nothing earthly save the thrill of melody in woodland rill or music of the passion hearted, joy's voice so peacefully departed that, like the murmur in the shell, its echo dwelleth and will dwell with nothing of the dross of ours yet all the beauty all the flowers that list our love and deck our bowers adorn yon world afar afar the wandering star twas a sweet time for nisarche for there her world lay lolling on the golden air near four bright suns a temporary rest a garden spot in desert of the blest away away mid seas of rays that roll empyrean splendour o'er the unchained soul the soul that scarce the billows are so dense can struggle to its destined eminence to distant spheres from time to time she rode and late to ours the favoured one of god but now the ruler of an anchored realm she throws aside the sceptre leaves the helm and amid incense and high spiritual hymns laves in quadruple light her angel limbs now happiest 
loveliest in yon lovely earth when sprang the idea of beauty into birth falling in wreaths through many a startled star like woman's hair mid pearls until afar it lit on hills archaean and there dwelt she looked into infinity and knelt rich clouds for canopies about her curled fit emblems of the model of her world seen but in beauty not impeding sight of other beauty glittering through the night a wreath that twined each starry form around and all the opaled air in colour bound all hurriedly she knelt upon a bed of flowers of lilies such as rear the head on the fair capo doicato and sprang so eagerly around about to hang upon the flying footsteps of deep pride of her who loved a mortal and so died the cephalica budding with young bees upreared its purple stem around her knees and a gemmy flower of trebizond misnamed inmate of highest stars where erst it shamed all other loveliness its honeyed dew the fabled nectar that the heathen knew deliriously sweet was dropped from heaven and fell on gardens of the unforgiven in trebizond and on a sunny flower so like its own above that to this hour it still remaineth torturing the bee with madness and unwonted reverie in heaven and all its environs the leaf and blossom of the fairy plant in grief disconsolate linger grief that hangs her head repenting follies that full long have fled heaving her white breast to the balmy air like guilty beauty chastened and more fair nitanthus too as sacred as the light she fears to perfume perfuming the night and clytia pondering between many a sun while pettish tears are down her petals run and that aspiring flower that sprang on earth and died ere scarce exalted into birth bursting its odorous heart in spirit to wing its way to heaven from garden of a king and valor's nerian lotus thither flown from struggling with the waters of the rhone and thy most lovely purple perfume zante i sole d'oro fior di levante and the nalumbo bud that floats for ever with indian cupid down the holy river fair flowers and fairy to whose care is given to bear the goddess song in odours up to heaven spirit that dwellest where in the deep sky the terrible and fair in beauty vie beyond the line of blue the boundary of the star which turneth at the view of thy barrier and thy bar of the barrier overgone by the comets who are cast from their pride and from their throne to be drudges till the last to be carriers of fire the red fire of their heart with speed that may not tire and with pain that shall not part who livest that we know in eternity we feel but the shadow of whose brow what spirit shall reveal though the beings whom thy nasachi thy messenger hath known have dreamed for thy infinity a model of their own thy will is done o god the star hath ridden high through many a tempest but she rode beneath thy burning eye and here in thought to thee in thought that can alone ascend thy empire and so be a partner of thy throne by winged fantasy my embassy is given till secrecy shall knowledge be in the environs of heaven she ceased and buried then her burning cheek abashed amid the lilies there to seek a shelter from the fervour of his eye for the stars trembled at the deity she stirred not breathed not for a voice was there how solemnly pervading the calm air a sound of silence on the startled ear which dreamy poets name the music of the sphere ours is a world of words quiet we call silence which is the merest word of all here nature speaks and even ideal things flap shadowy sounds from visionary wings 
but ah not so when thus in realms on high the eternal voice of god is passing by and the red winds are withering in the sky what though in worlds which sightless cycles run linked to a little system and one sun where all my love is folly and the crowd still think my terrors but the thunder cloud the storm the earthquake and the ocean wrath ah will they cross me in my angrier path what though in worlds which own a single sun the sands of time grow dimmer as they run yet thine is my resplendency so given to bear my secrets through the upper heaven leave tenantless thy crystal home and fly with all thy train athwart the moony sky apart like fireflies in sicilian night and wing to other worlds another light divulge the secrets of thy embassy to the proud orbs that twinkle and so be to every heart a barrier and a ban lest the stars totter in the guilt of man up rose the maiden in a yellow night the single mooned eve on earth we plight our faith to one love and one moon adore the birthplace of young beauty had no more as sprang that yellow star from downy hours up rose the maiden from her shrine of flowers and bent o'er sheeny mountain and dim plain her way but left not yet her theresian reign el araf part two high on a mountain of enamelled head such as the drowsy shepherd on his bed of giant pasturage lying at his ease raising his heavy eyelid starts and sees with many a muttered hope to be forgiven what time the moon is quadrated in heaven of rosy head the towering far away into the sunlight ether caught the ray of sunken suns at eve while the moon danced with the fair stranger light upreared upon such height arose a pile of gorgeous columns on the unburdened air flashing from parian marble that twin smile far down upon the wave that sparkled there and nursled the young mountain in its lair of molten stars their pavement such as fall through the ebon air besilvering the pall of their own dissolution while they die adorning then the dwellings of the sky a dome by linked light from heaven let down sat gently upon these columns as a crown a window of one circular diamond there looked out above into the purple air and rays from god shot down that meteor chain and hallowed all the beauty twice again save when between the empyrean and that ring some eager spirit flapped his dusky wing but on the pillars seraph eyes have seen the dimness of this world that grayish green that nature loves the best for beauty's grave lurked in each cornice round each architrave and every sculptured cherub thereabout that from his marble dwelling ventured out seemed earthly in the shallow of his niche archaean statues in a world so rich friezes from tadmor and persepolis from Balbec and the stilly clear abyss of beautiful Gomorrah. Oh, the wave is now upon thee, but too late to save. Sound loves to revel near a summer night. Witness the murmur of the grey twilight that stole upon the ear in Iraco, of many a wild stargazer long ago, that stealeth ever on the ear of him who, musing, gazeth on the distance dim, and sees the darkness coming as a cloud. Is not its form, its voice, most palpable and loud? But what is this? It cometh, and it brings a music with it. Tis the rush of wings, a pause, and then a sweeping, falling strain, and the sache is in her halls again. From the wild energy of wanton haste her cheek was flushing and her lips apart and zone that clung around her gentle waist had burst beneath the heaving of her heart within the centre of that hall to breathe she paused and panted xanthi all beneath the fairy light that kissed her golden hair and longed to rest 
yet could but sparkle there young flowers were whispering in melody to happy flowers that night and tree to tree fountains were gushing music as they fell in many a starlit grove or moonlit dell yet silence came upon material things fair flowers bright waterfalls and angel wings and sound alone that from the spirit sprang bore burden to the charm the maiden sang neath bluebell or streamer or tufted wild spray that keeps from the dreamer the moonbeam away bright beings that ponder with half-closing eyes on the stars which your wonder hath drawn from the skies till they glance through the shade and come down to your brow like eyes of the maiden who calls on you now arise from your dreaming in violet bowers to duty beseeming these star-litten hours and shake from your tresses encumbered with dew the breath of those kisses that cumber them too oh how without you love could angels be blessed those kisses of true love that lulled ye to rest up shake from your wing each hindering thing the dew of the night it would weigh down your flight and true love caresses oh leave them apart they are light on the tresses but hang on the heart ligeia ligeia my beautiful one whose harshest idea will to melody run oh is that thy will on the breezes to toss or capriciously still like the lone albatross incumbent on night as she on the air to keep watch with delight on the harmony there ligeia whatever thy image may be no magic shall sever thy music from thee thou hast bound many eyes in a dreamy sleep but the strains still arise which thy vigilance keep the sound of the rain which leaps down to the flower and dances again in the rhythm of the shower the murmur that springs from the growing of grass are the music of things but are modelled alas away then my dearest oh hie thee away to springs that lie clearest beneath the moon ray to lone lake that smiles in his dream of deep rest at the many star isles that endure its breast where wild flowers creeping have mingled their shade on its margin is sleeping full many a maid some have left the cool glade and have slept with the bee arouse them my maiden on moorland and lea go breathe on their slumber all softly in ear the musical number they slumbered to hear for what can awaken an angel so soon whose sleep hath been taken beneath the cold moon as the spell which no slumber of witchery can test the rhythmical number which lulled him to rest spirits in wing and angels to the view a thousand seraphs burst the empyrean through young dreams still hovering on their drowsy flight seraphs in all but knowledge the keen light that fell refracted through thy bounds afar o death from eye of god upon that star sweet was that error sweeter still that death sweet was that error even with us the breath of science dims the mirror of our joy to them twere the simoon and would destroy for what to them availeth it to know that truth is falsehood or that bliss is woe sweet was their death with them to die was rife with the last ecstasy of satiate life beyond that death no immortality but sleep that pondereth and is not to be and there o oh, may my weary spirit dwell apart from heaven's eternity and yet how far from hell what guilty spirit in what shrubbery dim heard not the stirring summons of that hymn but too they fell for heaven no grace imparts to those who hear not for their beating hearts a maiden angel and her seraph lover oh where and ye may seek the wide skies over was love 
the blind, near sober duty known. Unguided love hath fallen, mid tears of perfect moan. He was a goodly spirit, he who fell, A wanderer by mossy mantled well, A gazer on the lights that shine above, A dreamer in the moonbeam by his love. What wonder? For each star is eye-like there, and looked so sweetly down on beauty's hair, and they, and every mossy spring were holy to his love-haunted heart and melancholy. The night had found, to him a night of woe, upon a mountain crag young Angelo. Beetling it bends athwart the solemn sky, and scowls on starry worlds that down beneath it lie. So sat he with his love, his dark eye bent with eagle gaze along the firmament, now turned it upon her, but ever then it trembled to one constant star again. Ianthe, dearest, see how dim that ray, her lovely tears to look so far away. She seemed not thus upon that autumn eve, I left her gorgeous halls, nor mourned to leave, that eve, that eve, I should remember well, that sun-ray dropped in Lemnos, with a spell on the arabesque carving of a gilded hall, wherein I sat, and on the draperied wall, and on my eyelids. Oh, the heavy light! How drowsily it weighed them into night! On flowers, before, and mist, and love they ran, with Persian Sadi in his Gulistan. But oh, that light! I slumbered, death the while stole o'er my senses in that lovely isle so softly that no single silken hair awoke that slept or knew that it was there. The last spot of earth's orb I trod upon was a proud temple called the Parthenon. More beauty clung around her columned wall than even thy glowing bosom beats withal. And when old time my wing did disenthrall, thence sprang I, as the eagle from his tower, and years I left behind me in an hour. What time upon her airy bounds I hung, when half the garden of her globe was flung, unrolling as a chart unto my view, tenantless cities of the desert too. Ianthe, beauty crowded on me then, and half I wished to be again of men my angelo and why of them to be a brighter dwelling place is here for thee and greener fields than in yon world above a woman's loveliness and passionate love but list ianthe when the air so soft failed as my pennoned spirit leapt aloft perhaps my brain grew dizzy but the world i left so late was into chaos hurled sprang from her station on the winds apart and rolled aflame the fiery heaven athwart methought my sweet one then i ceased to soar and fell not swiftly as i rose before but with a downward tremulous motion through light brazen rays this golden star unto nor long the measure of my falling hours for nearer of all stars was thine to ours Dread star, that came, amid a night of mirth, A red dedalion on the timid earth. We came, and to thy earth, but not to us Be given our lady's bidding to discuss. We came, my love, around, above, below, Gay firefly of the night, we come and go, Nor ask a reason, save the angel nod She grants to us, as granted by her God. But Angelo, than thine grey time unfurled, never his fairy wing or fairier world. Dim was its little disk, and angel eyes alone could see the phantom in the skies, when first Al Araf knew her course to be headlong thitherward o'er the starry sea. But when its glory swelled upon the sky, as glowing beauties bust beneath man's eye, we paused before the heritage of men, and thy star trembled as doth beauty then. Thus in discourse the lovers whiled away the night that waned and waned, 
and brought no day they fell for heaven to them no hope imparts who hear not for the beating of their hearts end of section 45section forty six of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil schempf tamerlane by edgar allan poe kind solace in a dying hour such father is not now my theme I will not madly deem that power of earth may shrive me of the sin unearthly pride hath reveled in i have no time to dote or dream you call it hope that fire of fire it is but agony of desire if i can hope o oh god i can its fount is holier more divine and i would not call thee fool old man but such is not a gift of thine know thou the secret of a spirit bowed from its wild pry into shame o yearning heart i did inherit thy withering portion with the fame the searing glory which hath shone amid the jewels of my throne halo of hell and with a pain not hell shall make me fear again o craving heart for the lost flowers and sunshine of my summer hours the undying voice of that dead time with its interminable chime rings in the spirit of a spell upon thy emptiness a knell i have not always been as now the fevered diadem on my brow i claimed and won usurpingly hath not the same fierce heirdom given rome to caesar this to me the heritage of a kingly mind and proud spirit which hath striven triumphantly with humankind on mountain soil i first drew life the mists of taglay have shed nightly their dews upon my head and i believe the winged strife and tumult of the headlong air have nestled in my very hair so late from heaven that dew it fell mid dreams of an unholy night upon me with the touch of hell while the red flashing of the light from clouds that hung like banners o'er appeared to my half-closed eye the pageantry of monarchy and the deep trumpet thunder's roar came hurriedly upon me telling of human battle where my voice my own voice silly child was swelling oh how my spirit would rejoice and leap within me at the cry the battle cry of victory the rain came down upon my head unsheltered and the heavy wind was giant-like so thou my mind it was but man i thought who shed laurels upon me and the rush the torrent of the chilly air gurgled within my ear the crush of empires with the captive's prayer the hum of suitors and the tone of flattery round the sovereign's throne my passions from that hapless hour usurped a tyranny which men have deemed since i have reached to power my innate nature be it so but father there lived one who then then in my boyhood when their fire burned with a still intenser glow for passion must with youth expire e'en then who knew this iron heart in woman's weakness had a part i have no words alas to tell the loveliness of loving well nor would i now attempt to trace the more than beauty of a face whose lineaments upon my mind are shadows on the unstable wind thus i remember having dwelt some page of early lore upon with loitering eye till i felt the letters with their meaning melt to fantasies with none oh she was worthy of all love love as in infancy was mine was such as angel minds above might envy her young heart the shrine on which my every hope and thought were incense then a goodly gift for they were childish and upright pure as her young example taught why did i leave it and adrift trust to the fire within for light 
we grew in age and love together roamed the forest and the wild my breast her shield in wintry weather and when the friendly sunshine smiled she would mark the opening skies i saw no heaven but in her eyes young love's first lesson is the heart for mid that sunshine and those smiles when from our little cares apart and laughing at her girlish wiles i'd throw me on her throbbing breast and pour my spirit out in tears there was no need to speak the rest no need to quiet any fears of her who asked no reason why but turned on me her quiet eye yet more than worthy of the love my spirit struggled with and strove when on the mountain peak alone ambition lent it a new tone i had no being but in thee the world and all it did contain in the earth the air the sea its joy its little lot of pain that was new pleasure the ideal dim vanities of dreams by night and dimmer nothings which were real shadows and a more shadowy light parted upon their misty wings and so confusedly became thine image and a name a name two separate yet most intimate things i was ambitious have you known the passion father you have not a cottager i marked a throne on half the world as all my own and murmured at such lowly lot but just like any other dream upon the vapour of the dew my own had passed did not the beam of beauty which did while it through the minute the hour the day oppress my mind with double loveliness we walked together on the crown of a high mountain which looked down afar from its proud natural towers of rock and forest on the hills the dwindled hills begirt with bowers and shouting with a thousand rills i spoke to her of power and pride but mystically in such guise that she might deem it not beside the moment's converse in her eyes i read perhaps too carelessly a mingled feeling with my own the flush on her bright cheek to me seemed to become a queenly throne too well that i should let it be light in the wilderness alone i wrapped myself in grandeur then and donned a visionary crown yet it was not that fantasy had thrown her mantle over me but that among the rabble men lion ambition is chained down and crouches to a keeper's hand not so in deserts where the grand the wild the terrible conspire with their own breath to fan his fire look round thee now on samarcand is not she queen of earth her pride above all cities in her hand their destinies in all besides of glory which the world hath known stands she not nobly and alone falling her various stepping-stone shall form the pedestal of a throne and who her sovereign timur he whom the astonished people saw striding o'er empires haughtily a diademed outlaw o human love thou spirit given on earth of all we hope in heaven which falsed into the soul like rain upon the siroc withered plain and failing in thy power to bless but leavest the heart a wilderness idea which bindest life around with music of so strange a sound and beauty so wild a birth farewell for i have won the earth when hope the eagle that towered could see no cliff beyond him in the sky his pinions were bent droopingly and homeward turned his softened eye twas sunset when the sun will part there comes a sullenness of heart to him who still would look upon the glory of the summer sun that soul will hate the evening mist so often lovely and will list to the sound of the coming darkness known to those whose spirits hearken as one who in a dream of night would fly but cannot from a danger nigh what though the moon the white moon shed all the splendour of her noon her smile is chilly and her beam in that time of dreariness will seem so like you gather in your breath a portrait taken after death and boyhood is a summer sun whose waning is the dreariest one for all we live to know is known 
and all we seek to keep hath flown let life then as the day flower fall with the noonday beauty which is all i reached my home my home no more for all had flown who made it so i passed out its mossy door and though my tread was soft and low a voice came from the threshold stone of one whom i had earlier known oh i defy thee hell to show on beds of fire that burn below a humbler heart a deeper woe father i firmly do believe i know for death who comes for me from regions of the blest afar where there is nothing to deceive hath left his iron gate ajar and rays of truth you cannot see are flashing through eternity i do believe that eblis hath a snare in every human path else how when in the holy grove i wandered of the idol love who daily scents his snowy wings with incense of burnt offerings from the most unpolluted things whose pleasant bowers are yet so riven above with trellised rays from heaven no moat may shun no tiniest fly the lightning of his eagle eye how was it that ambition crept unseen amid the revels there till growing bold he laughed and leapt in the tangles of love's very hair eighteen twenty nine end of section forty six section forty seven of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org. recording by antonio barroso to helen by edgar allan poe helen thy beauty is to me like those nicene barks of yore that gently o'er a perfume sea the weary way-worn wanderer bore to his own native shore on desperate seas long wont to roam thy hyacinth hair thy classic face thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was greece and the grandeur that was rome lo in yon brilliant window niche how statue-like i me thee stand the agate lamp within thy hand ah psyche from the regions which are holy land end of section forty seven section forty eight of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Antonio Barroso. The Valley of Unrest by Edgar Allan Poe. Once it smiled a silent dell where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto the wars, trusting to the mild eyed stars nightly from their azure towers to keep watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness nothing there is motionless nothing save the airs that brood over the magic solitude ah by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty hebrides ah by no wind those clouds are driven that rustle through the unquiet heaven uneasily from morn till even over the violets there that lie in myriad types of the human eye over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave they wave from out their fragrant tops eternal dews come down in drops they weep from off their delicate stems perennial tears descend in gems end of section forty eight section forty nine of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Antonio Barroso. Israfel by Edgar Allan Poe. And the angel Israfel, whose heart strings are a lute, and who has the sweetest voice of all God's creatures. Quran. In heaven a spirit doth dwell, whose heart strings are a lute. None sing so wildly well as the angel Israfel, and the giddy stars so legends tell, ceasing their hymns attend the spell of his voice, all mute. Tottering above, in her highest noon, the enamoured moon blushes with love, while to listen the red leaven, with the rapid pleiads even, which were seven, pauses in heaven, and they say, the starry choir and all the listening things, that Israfeli's fire is owing to that lyre by which he sits and sings, the trembling living wire of those unusual strings. But the skies that angel trod, where deep thoughts are a duty, where love's a grown-up god, where the hoary glances are imbued with all the beauty which we worship in a star. Therefore thou art not wrong, Israfeli, who despisest an unimpassioned song. To thee the laurels belong, best bard, because the wisest, merrily live and long. The ecstasies above with thy burning measures suit, thy grief, thy joy, thy hate, thy love, with the fervor of thy lute. Well may the stars be mute. Yes, heaven is thine, but this is a world of sweets and sours. Our flowers are merely flowers, and the shadow of thy perfect bliss is the sunshine of ours. If I could dwell where Israfel hath dwelt, and he where I, he might not sing so wildly well a mortal melody, while a bolder note than this might swell from my lyre within the sky. End of section 49《Section 50 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Daly. To Blank by Edgar Allan Poe. 1. The bowers whereat, in dreams, I see the wantonest singing birds are lips, and all thy melody of lip-begotten words. 2. Thine eyes, in heaven of heart enshrined, then desolately fall, O oh God, on my funeral mind like starlight on a pall. 3. Thy heart, thy heart, I wake and sigh, and sleep to dream till day of truth that gold can never buy, of the trifles that it may. End of section 50《Section 51 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5.》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Daly To Blank by Edgar Allan Poe I heed not that my earthly lot hath little of earth in it, that years of love have been forgot in the hatred of a minute. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I, but that you sorrow for my fate, who am a passer-by. End of section 51 Section 52 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short To the River Blank Fair river, in thy bright clear flow of crystal wandering water, thou art an emblem of the glow of beauty, the unhidden heart, the playful maziness of art in old Alberto's daughter. But when within thy wave she looks, which glistens then and trembles, 
why then the prettiness of brooks her worshipper resembles for in my heart as in thy stream her image deeply lies his heart which trembles at the beam of her soul searching eyes end of section fifty two Section 53 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Simsham. Song by Edgar Allan Poe i saw thee on thy bridal day when a burning blush came over thee the happiness around thee lay the world of love before thee and in thine eye a kindly light whatever it might be was all on earth my aching sight of loveliness could see that blush perhaps was made in shame as such it well may pass though its glow hath raised a fierce of flame in the breast of him alas who saw thee on that bridal day when that deep blush would come over thee the happiness around thee lay the world of love before thee end of section fifty three Section 54 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Saldivar. Spirits of the Dead by Edgar Allan Poe. Thy soul shall find itself alone mid dark thoughts of grey tombstone, not one of all the crowd to pry into thine hour of secrecy be silent in that solitude which is not loneliness for then the spirits of the dead who stood in life before thee are again in death around thee and their will shall then overshadow thee be still for night though clear shall frown and the stars shall look not down from their high thrones in the heaven with light like hope to mortals given but their red orbs without beam to thy weariness shall seem as a burning and a fever which could cling to thee for ever now our thoughts thou shalt not banish now our visions ne'er to vanish for thy spirit shall they pass no more like dewdrop from the grass the breeze the breath of god is still and the mist upon the hill shadowy shadowy yet unbroken is a symbol and a token how it hangs upon the trees a mystery of mysteries end of section fifty four section fifty five of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. A Dream by Edgar Allan Poe In visions of the dark night I have dreamed of joy departed, but a waking dream of life and light hath left me broken-hearted. Ah, what is not a dream by day to him whose eyes are cast on things around him with a ray? turned back upon the past that holy dream that holy dream while all the world were chiding hath cheered me as a lovely beam a lonely spirit guiding what through that light through storm and night so trembled from afar what could there be more purely bright in truth's day star eighteen twenty seven end of section fifty five Section 56 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Romance by Edgar Allan Poe. Romance, who loves to nod and sing with drowsy head and folded wing, among the green leaves as they shake far down within some shadowy lake, to me a painted paraquet hath been, a most familiar bird, taught me my alphabet to say, to lisp my very earliest word while in the wild wood I did lie, a child with a most knowing eye. Of late eternal condor years so oh, shake the very heaven on high with tumult as they thunder by i have no time for idle cares through gazing on the unquiet sky and when an hour with calmer wings its down upon thy spirit flings that little time with lyre and rhyme to while away forbidden things my heart would feel to be a crime unless it trembled with the strings. 1829 End of section 56section 57 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Fairyland by Edgar Allan Poe. Dim veils and shadowy floods, and cloudy looking woods, whose forms we can't discover for the tears that drip all over. Huge moons there wax and wane, again, 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 every moment of the night, forever changing places and they put out the starlight with the breath from their pale faces about twelve by the moon dial one more filmy than the rest a kind which upon trial they have found to be the best comes down still down and down with its center on the crown of a mountain's eminence while its wide circumference in easy drapery falls over hamlets over halls wherever they may be o'er the strange woods o'er the sea over the spirits on the wing over every drowsy thing and buries them up quite in a labyrinth of light and then how deep oh deep is the passion of their sleep in the morning they arise and their moony covering is soaring in the skies with the tempests as they toss like almost anything or a yellow albatross they use that moon no more for the same end as before the delicate attempt which i think extravagant its atomies however into a shower dissever of which those butterflies of earth who seek the skies and so come down again never contented things have brought a specimen upon their quivering wings 1831 end of section 57 Section 58 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lake Blank to Blank by Edgar Allan Poe. In spring of youth it was my lot to haunt of the wide earth a spot to which I could not love the less. So lovely was the loneliness of a wild lake, with black rock bound, and the tall pines that towered around. But when the night had thrown her pall upon that spot, as upon all, and the mystic wind went by murmuring in melody, then, aha, uh -huh, then I would awake to the terror of the lone lake. Yet that terror was not fright, but a tremulous delight, a feeling not the jeweled mine could teach or bribe me to define, nor love, although the love were thine. Death was in that poisonous wave, and in its gulf a fitting grave for him who thence could solace bring to his lonely imagining, whose solitary soul could make an Eden of that dim lake. 1827 End of section 58 Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah
Section 59 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Zaldivar. Evening Star by Edgar Allan Poe. Twas noontide of summer, and midtime of night, and stars in their orbits shone pale through the light of the brighter cold moon mid planets her slaves herself in the heavens her beam on the waves i gazed awhile on her cold smile too cold too cold for me there passed as a shroud a fleecy cloud and i turned away to thee proud evening star in thy glory afar and dearer thy beam shall be for joy to my heart is the proud part thou bearest in heaven at night, and more I admire thy distant fire than that colder, lowly light. End of section 59。section 60 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven edition, volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Happiest Day by Edgar Allan Poe. The happiest day, the happiest hour my seared and blighted heart hath known, the highest hope of pride and power I feel hath flown. Of power, said I, yes, such I ween, but they have vanished long, alas. The visions of my youth have been, but let them pass. And pride, what have I now with thee? Another brow may even inherit the venom thou hast poured on me. Be still, my spirit. The happiest day, the happiest hour mine eyes shall see, have ever seen, the brightest glance of pride and power i feel have been but were that hope of pride and power now offered with the pain even then i felt that brightest hour i would not live again for on its wing was dark alloy and as it fluttered fell an essence powerful to destroy a soul that knew it well eighteen twenty seven End of section 60. Section 61 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Imitation by Edgar Allan Poe. A dark, unfathomed tide of interminable pride. A mystery and a dream should my early life seem. I say that dream was fraught with a wild and waking thought of beings that have been, which my spirit hath not seen had I let them pass me by with a dreaming eye. Let none of earth inherit that vision on my spirit, whose thoughts I would control as a spell upon my soul. For that bright hope at last and that light time have passed, and my worldly rest hath gone with a sigh as it passed on. I care not though it perish, with a thought I then did cherish. 1827 End of section 61 Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah Section 62 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hymn to Aristogeiton and Harmodius by Edgar Allan Poe Translation from the Greek 1. Creathed in myrtle, my sword I'll conceal like those champions devoted and brave, when they plunged in the tyrant their steel, and to Athens deliverance gave. 2. Beloved heroes, your deathless souls roam in the joy-breathing isles of the blest, where the mighty of old have their home, where Achilles and Diomed rest. 3. In fresh myrtle my blade I'll entwine, like Harmodius the gallant and good, 
when he made at the tutelar shrine a libation of tyranny's blood. 4. Ye deliverers of Athens from shame, ye avengers of liberty's wrongs, endless ages shall cherish your fame, embalmed in their echoing songs. 1827. End of section 62. Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah. Section 63 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Dreams by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, that my young life were a lasting dream! my spirit not awakening till the beam of an eternity should bring the morrow yes though that long dream were of hopeless sorrow twere better than the dull reality of waking life to him whose heart shall be and hath been ever on the chilly earth a chaos of deep passion from his birth but should it be that dream eternally continuing as dreams have been to me in my young boyhood should it thus be given were folly still to hope for higher heaven for i have revelled when the sun was bright in the summer sky in dreamy fields of light and left unheedingly my very heart in climes of mine imagining apart from mine own home with beings that have been of mine own thought what more could i have seen twas once and only once and the wild hour from my remembrance shall not pass some power or spell had bound me twas the chilly wind came o'er me in the night and left behind its image on my spirit or the moon shone on my slumbers in her lofty noon too coldly or the stars howe'er it was that dream was as the night wind let it pass i have been happy though but in a dream i have been happy and i love the theme dreams in their vivid colouring of life as in that fleeting shadowy misty strife of semblance with reality which brings to the delirious eye more lovely things of paradise and love and all our own than young hope in its sunniest hour hath known end of section sixty three Section 64 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Daly. In Youth I Have Known One, by Edgar Allan Poe. How often we forget all time when lone, admiring nature's universal throne, her woods, her wilds, her mountains, the intense reply of hers to our intelligence. 1. In youth I have known one with whom the earth in secret communing held, is he with it, in daylight, and in beauty from his birth, whose fervid flickering torch of life was lit from the sun and stars, whence he had drawn forth a passionate light such for his spirit was fit, and yet that spirit knew, not in the hour of its own fervor, what had o'er at power. 2. Perhaps it may be that my mind is wrought to a fever by the moonbeam that hangs o'er, but I will half believe that wild light fraught with more of sovereignty than ancient lore hath ever told, or is it of a thought the unembodied essence, and no more that with a quickening spell doth o'er us pass as dew of the night-time, or the summer grass? 3. Doth o'er us pass when as the expanding eye to the loved object so the tear to the lid will start, which lately slept in apathy. And yet it need not be, that object hid from us in life, but common which doth lie each hour before us, but then only bid with a strange sound, as of a harp-string broken, to awake us. Tis a symbol and a token. 4. Of what an other world shall be, and given in beauty by our God, to those alone who otherwise would fall from life in heaven, drawn by their heart's passion, and that tone, that high tone of the spirit which hath striven, though not with faith, with godliness, whose throne with desperate energy it hath beaten down, 
wearing its own deep feeling as a crown. End of section 64. Section 65 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Daly. A Pian by Edgar Allan Poe. How shall the burial rite be read? The solemn song be sung? The requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young. Her friends are gazing on her and on her gaudy bier and weep, oh, to dishonor dead beauty with a tear. They loved her for her wealth and they hated her for her pride, but she grew in feeble health and they love her that she died. They tell me while they speak of her costly broidered pall that my voice is growing weak, that I should not sing at all or that my tone should be tuned to such solemn song so mournfully so mournfully that the dead may feel no wrong but she is gone above with young hope at her side and i am drunk with love of the dead who is my bride of the dead dead who lies all perfumed there with the death upon her eyes and the life upon her hair thus on the coffin loud and long i strike the murmur sent through the great chambers to my song shall be the accompaniment. Thou diedst in thy life's June, but thou didst not die too fair. Thou didst not die too soon, nor with too common air. For more than fiends on earth, thy life and love are riven to join the untainted mirth of more than thrones in heaven. Therefore to thee this night I will no requiem raise, but waft thee on thy flight with a paean of old days. End of section 65 Section 66 of Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Anastasia Salocha Alone by Edgar Allan Poe From childhood's hour I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone. And oh, I laughed, I laughed alone. Then in my childhood in the dawn of the most stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which bins me still. From the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rode in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form, when the rest of the heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. This poem is no longer considered doubtful as it was in 1903. Liberty has been taken to replace the book version with an earlier, perhaps more original, manuscript version. End of section 66。section 67 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe。Raven edition。volume 5。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by。blazely dragon。to isidore。By Edgar Allan Poe. Beneath the vine clad eaves, whose shadows fall before thy lowly cottage door, under the lilac's tremulous leaves, within thy snowy clasped hands, the purple flowers it bore. Last eve in dreams I saw thee stand 
like queenly nymphs from fairyland enchantress of the flowery wand most beauteous isidore and when i bade the dream upon thy spirit flee thy violet eyes to me upturned did overflowing seem with the deep untold delight of love's serenity thy classic brow like lilies white and pale as the imperial night upon her throne with stars bedight enthralled my soul to thee ah ever i behold thy dreamy passionate eyes blue as the languid skies hung with the sunset's fringe of gold now strangely clear thine image grows and olden memories are startled from their long repose like shadows on the silent snows when suddenly the night wind blows where quiet moonlight lies like music heard in dreams like strains of harps unknown of birds for ever flown audible as the voice of streams that murmur in some leafy dell i hear thy gentlest tone and silence cometh with her spell like that which on my tongue doth dwell when tremulous in dreams i tell my love to thee alone in every valley heard floating from tree to tree less beautiful to me the music of the radiant bird than artless accents such as thine whose echoes never flee ah how for thy sweet voice i pine for uttered in thy tones benign enchantress this rude name of mine doth seem a melody end of section sixty seven to isidore recording by blazely dragon section sixty eight of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume five this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Manchus. The Village Street by Edgar Allan Poe In these rapid, restless shadows once I walked at eventide, When a gentle, silent maiden walked in beauty at my side. She alone there walked beside me, all in beauty, like a bride. Pallidly the moon was shining on the dewy meadows nigh, On the silvery silent rivers, on the mountains far and high, On the ocean's starlit waters where the winds a weary die. Slowly, silently, we wandered from the open cottage door, Underneath the elm's long branches to the pavement bending o'er, Underneath the mossy willow and the dying sycamore. With the myriad stars in beauty all bedight, the heavens were seen radiant hopes were bright around me like the light of stars serene like the mellow midnight splendour of the night's irradiant queen audibly the elm leaves whispered peaceful pleasant melodies like the distant murmured music of unquiet lovely seas while the winds were hushed in slumber in the fragrant flowers and trees wondrous and unwanted beauty still adorning all did seem while I told my love in fables, neath the willows by the stream, Would the heart have kept unspoken love that was its rarest dream? Instantly away we wandered in the shadowy twilight tide, She the silent, scornful maiden walking calmly at my side, With a step serene and stately, all in beauty, all in pride. Vacantly, I walked beside her, on the earth mine eyes were cast. Swift and keen there came unto me, bitter memories of the past, On me, like the rain in autumn, on the dead leaves, cold and fast. Underneath the elms we parted, by the lowly cottage door. One brief word alone was uttered, never on our lips before, And away I walked, forlornly broken-hearted evermore. Slowly, silently I loitered, homeward in the night, alone. Sudden anguish bound my spirit that my youth had never known. Wild unrest like that which cometh when the night's first dream hath flown. Now to me the elm leaves whisper mad, discordant melodies, 
and keen melodies like shadows haunt the moaning willow trees, and the sycamores with laughter mock me in the nightly breeze. Sad and pale the autumn moonlight through the sighing foliage streams, and each morning midnight shadow, shadow of my sorrow seems. Strive, O heart, forget thine idol, and O soul, forget thy dreams. End of section 68。section 69 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven edition, volume 5。this is a librivox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forest Reverie by Edgar Allan Poe. Tis said that when the hands of men tamed this primeval wood, and hoary trees with groans of woe, like warriors by an unknown foe, were in their strength subdued, the virgin earth gave instant birth to springs that ne'er did flow that in the sun did rivulets run and all around rare flowers did blow the wild rose pale perfumed the gale and the queenly lily adown the dale whom the sun and the dew and the winds did woo with the gourd and the grape luxuriant grew so when in tears the love of years is wasted like the snow and the fine fibbles of its life by the rude wrong of instant strife are broken at a blow within the heart do springs upstart of which it doth now know and strange sweet dreams like silent streams that from new fountains overflow with the earlier tide of rivers glide deep in the heart whose hope has died quenching the fires its ashes hide its ashes whence will spring and grow sweet flowers ere long the rare and radiant flowers of song notes of the many verses from time to time ascribed to the pen of Edgar Poe, and not including among his known writings the lines entitled Alone, have the chief claim to our notice. Facsimile copies of this piece have been in possession of the present editor some time previous to its publication in Scribner's Magazine for September 1875, but as proofs of the authorship claimed for it were not forthcoming, he refrained from publishing it as requested. The desired proofs have not yet been adduced, and there is, at present, nothing but internal evidence to guide us. Alone is stated to have been written by Poe in the album of a Baltimore lady, Mrs. Balderstone, question mark, on March 17, 1829, and the facsimile given in Scribner's is alleged to be of his handwriting. If the calligraphy be Poe's, it is different in all essential respects from all the many specimens known to us and strongly resembles that of the writer of the heading and dating of the manuscript, both of which the contributor of the poem acknowledges to have been recently added. The lines, however, if not by Poe, are the most successful imitation of his early mannerisms yet made public, and, in the opinion of one well qualified to speak, are not unworthy of the whole of the percentage claimed for them. While Edgar Poe was editor of the Broadway Journal, some lines to Isidore appeared therein, and, like several of his known pieces, bore no signature. They were at once ascribed to Poe, and in order to satisfy questioners, an editorial paragraph subsequently appeared, saying that they were by A. Ide, Jr. Two previous poems had appeared in the Broadway Journal over the signature of A. M. Ide, and whoever wrote them was also the author of the lines to Isidore. In order, doubtless, to give a show of variety, Poe was then publishing some of his known works in his journal over nom de plume, and as no other writings whatever can be traced to any person bearing the name of A. M. Ide, it is not impossible that the poems now republished in this collection may be by the author of The Raven. Having been published without his usual elaborate revision, Poe may have wished to hide his hasty work under an assumed name. The three pieces are included in the present collection, so the reader can judge for himself what pretensions they possess to be by the author of The Raven. End of section 69. Recording by Richie Franklin, Salt Lake City, Utah. End of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5, by Edgar Allan Poe.